dat we... Okay, so uh, welcome again. Uh, 
very brave that you uh, were able to withstand the rain to come here for this first uh, talk, but uh, I can tell you it's definitely going to pay off. Um, so yeah, so uh, let's start uh, with the first part of today. It's a keynote speech by uh, Richard Bonkri. He's professor at the Royal Veterinarian College, uh, University of London. And uh, yeah, it's really cool because uh, yeah, Richard uh, blends uh, engineering and uh, biology. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, his talk will uh, give a lot of us uh, inspiration uh, to make even better flying systems. So Richard, uh, if you could do us the honor of starting your keynote speech. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for the invitation. It's a, a real pleasure to be here at my first IMAP. Um, there have been near misses where I've nearly come to IMAP in the past that hasn't quite worked out. But I think now maybe in the spirit of the competition, the near miss is how you should end IMAP <laughs> and then do it properly next time around. Um, so I put a very ambitious title up there. It covers a lot of ground, actuation, sensing, and control, oh, and aerodynamics as well. Um, but that does reflect what we work on. And I thought what might be useful, because I've had uh, so many really interesting conversations with so many different people on so many different topics, is to give a flavor of the tasting menu of a lot of the things that go on and have gone on in the past in my lab. Um, it's, a, it's a team game. And uh, here are the people who I think have contributed to the slides. Um, and they're, they're a terrific group of people who've been in the lab and uh, collaborators. And um, it says on the sign outside for X, expand your playground. And I'm always up for expanding my playground. And so if anybody would like to join my playground. Uh, uh, let, let's uh, talk about potential collaborations. I am, I am indeed from the Royal Veterinary College or RBC. Two campuses and a farm, in fact. Uh, the headquarters campus is in central London, which used to be a good place in 1791 for grazing horses and things like that. And now it looks very different. And so there's a second campus out here just to the north of London in the Green Belt. It's very convenient to get to, but it, it feels like two or three hours away in the countryside. Um, it happens to be the number one vet college in the world at the moment, according to the QS university rankings. So we like that one. So we'll go for that one. And uh, this is where I work, and it's one of the buildings. Now, I have to fall from up here to get up and do this. Uh, this is my lab right here. Um, and actually, since this picture was taken, um, there's, there's another one next to it as well. And within those labs, uh, it's set up largely for terrestrial locomotion. That's what it was like before I arrived there in 2013. Then we built a new lab, which is dedicated to flight. And in there, we fly insects, and we fly birds, and we fly drones. Uh, and I sometimes describe it as a sort of modest aircraft hangar. We call it the ba them the barns, but they've got big rolly doors. And aircraft hangar is a very reasonable term to use because we've built two aircraft in there. Here is one of them, built by Alan Wilson there, um, who uh, modified that aircraft to take LiDAR and very high resolution cinematic cameras to um, map and uh, plot the predator-prey interactions of large um, animals in Botswana. And Simon Wilson, who's here, is also involved in those projects. I'm sure he's happy to talk about those too. But today, uh, we're talking about animal flight. And you can think of it um, in similar ways in, uh, to uh, aircraft design and uh, how, what air the challenges that aircraft need to solve to rise to are pretty much the same as the challenges that insects and birds and bats have previously posed for them. Uh, and so, therefore, you can think of it as a control loop. But it's done in, at every stage of this in very different ways, and I'm going to highlight some of those differences. So if we start at the top, because um, it's a cycle, it doesn't really matter which way around you go, of course. But let's say you've got wings of a certain shape, and you activate those with muscles. Um, and when you do that, you get some wing stroke kinematics, and your wings might uh, change shape as well. They might deform during that. This generates aerodynamic forces. The aerodynamic forces propel you along a three-dimensional trajectory through space. Uh, that changes your sensing uh, because your uh, environment is changing and your state is changing. You need to process that information with a flight controller, uh, and then that will lead to um, wing muscle activation differences to correct from the prescribed and the actual trajectory, and round we go again. 
So it's a control loop that you'll be very familiar with. The birds may have inspired uh, Leonardo and Lilienthal and the Wright brothers, but the similarities soon um, run out. And one of the things I'm interested in at the moment is how biological e experiments, so the fundamental underpinning bioscience, could be done in order to really maximize and facilitate the transition of that into engineered systems. And there are some general principles that you go along with which will be familiar, so uh, lightweight structures, robust structures. Um, but for sensing, they take a slightly different approach where they measure as little as possible and they measure as infrequently as possible. And then I'll zoom in. So I'm going to start with my uh, series of vignettes um, by looking at gust alleviation uh, without any control at all um, in birds. And they do that by changing their shape. Here's a sort of problem statement. There's a gull in um, very wet and windy uh, southwest Wales. Um, so wet and windy like here, but big sea cliffs, not so much like here. And if you can, sitting at the front, you might be able to see that the rain sometimes comes down or, or comes across because it's blowing very hard. And this is a high risk game because a cliff dwelling species, cliff nesting species needs to return and take off from those cliffs all the time. And of course, mistakes are very costly, potentially uh, life threatening. So uh, it's a very good question to ask how they do that. And the way we approach that question is to bring birds into the lab, uh, not gulls, although um, here is a goshawk. And we do a number of experiments. There's a very um, visually pleasing one, uh, with, which is an aerodynamic study, which I'm very happy to talk to anybody about. And in that, we did uh, Lagrangian bubble tacking um, PTV experiments and found that the tails are generating a lot of lift, more than you might expect, actually, because of um, the viscosity effects which are coming into play. And so they're unstable longitudinally. Um, but you'll see a lot of the familiar features here. So you get big uh, wingtip vortex. Uh, on both sides, and you get the same off the tail. So the first one was a goshawk, and um, this is a tawny owl called Hector. This is a goshawk. Hector usually cheats as he goes through the light. Um, yeah. Okay. So what does the lab look like? Let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, here's one end of it. It's actually 22 meters long, so these things can get up to speed. Uh, they start flapping, then they go into a gliding, sort of these stable, steady gliding phase, and then finally they flare and perch if it's the, um, if it's the owl daintily on the glove, and if it's the goshawk, it really <laughs> whacks into the lure that's being swung around for it. And we've got, in this situation, um, four high-speed cameras, it says, uh, above and uh, six below. So that's a 10 high-speed camera setup, uh, and it's all to do photogrammetry, stereo reconstruction of the surfaces. But we want to perturb them as well. And so in this experiment, we had um, fans which are blowing directly upwards at a velocity which is the same as the forward speed of the bird. So it's, it's unwise to extrapolate, but if you're flying in a 747 at 500 miles an hour, it's a, a bit like getting hit from below at 500 miles an hour. And it's not really like that, of course, because the dynamics of the system. On the other hand, there are some similarities, which is that the angle of attack goes from not very much to about 45 degrees um, in an instant. Now there are the uh, fans going round. The lights are on the screen. I don't know if you can do anything about that, but um, you might be able to see them going round. And along comes the, to uh, the barn owl, in this case. And if you view it from the front, here's a tawny eagle. There's lots going on here. First, as it hits the gust, you see the primary feathers bending crazily. You see the wings go up, the tail spreads. Um, but on the whole, it's not knocked out of the sky. Here's the barn owl. And watch how the eyes stay on a beautifully le level trajectory. So it's a very gradual curve. And yet the rest of the airframe is doing crazy things. Yeah? You can compare that to a to chuck glider here, um, which Jonathan Stevenson is throwing. And even though it looks happy, because I painted a smiley face on it, it doesn't end well for the glider. It goes into a pretty catastrophic uh, pitch down. So when we take those stereo images, that's from one camera pair. And there's another camera pair. And as it moves around, you get to see the uh, images from the lower camera pairs as well. So you get all 10. And then you can create a point cloud from that of the geometry. So those are video images. But this is not a video image. This is the point cloud, which we can then use for further analysis. And you 
take a look at the control case in green and the gusted case in RVC purple. And the trajectory doesn't move very much. In fact, if anything, it accelerates a little bit. Um, and then the gray line beneath is the line that that glider took, um, which obviously gets bumped up into the air um, by, by the impact. So it's beautifully dose dependent. Uh, so you can tell from the colors that red is being hit by the fan von Spree blast, turn the light up to 11, and the bird doesn't care at all. Uh, and then the blue is the control case, where it's sort of, I think, more or less the same in the, in the head and the body region. Now, this all happens incredibly fast. It, the wings are at their peak um, uh, elevation within about 80 milliseconds, and that is faster than the sensory motor loop um, that would be required for active control. So it leads us to hypothesize that there must be a mechanism by which it's rejecting the impulse of the gust uh, without any sensory input at all. And now I need to take a step back and explain things with cricket. I don't know how well that's going to work in the Netherlands, but this is a game called cricket. <laughs> I know you've played it. And this is one of the best batsmen in the world, Joe Root. And in his skill session, he's showing you how to hit the ball right off the sweet spot of the bat. Okay, and then we think about what is the sweet spot. Um, it's the also known as the center of percussion. And if, you, if, you're, if you're playing a, a bat or racket sport, you may be familiar with the fact that if you hit the ball right down at the toe end of the bat, the handle jerks forwards in your hand. <coughs> it's uncomfortable. And if you hit it right up by the handle, the uh, handle jerks backwards in your hand. So again, there must exist a point between those two where the forces and torques cancel to zero. You don't feel the ball at all as it flies off for six runs. That's the center of percussion. And then we need to think about what the impulse on the bat is, or on the wing, and that's um, boiled down essentially to the center of pressure. So as the gust hits, it acts at the center of pressure. And if that aligns with the center of percussion, then there should be no forces and torques at the wing tip. And so this is what it would look like in cartoon form at the top there. The center of pressure is outside the blue center of percussion. And so the body will go down as the wing tip goes up um, in the middle. Uh, if the center of pressure is too inboard, too proximal, then the body will go up. And if it's in exactly the right place, nothing happens to the body at all. Okay. If you can't um, demonstrate with three planks of wood, I don't know what you think you're doing. <laughs> so here we've got three planks of wood. Jim Usherwood um, is his children's swing. And here we have um, some bits in the middle which are holding the wings down. And that they, they represent the muscles, pectoralis muscle in particular. The center of pressure is given by the vertical cords which are attaching it to the frame. And then it's hinged in the middle. And what Jim's doing is being a gust at different points. So as I just run it through one more time, if the gust acts out towards the tip, the body goes down. If it acts too proximally, the body goes up in the first instance. But if he aligns the gust with the center of percussion or with the cent and the center of pressure, it doesn't move at all. Do they actually align? Now these are very evolvable um, characteristics. So you can change your feather design and move your center of pressure out or in with, just with your plan form changes. And you could potentially do things about bone length in the, the hand wing and the, and the arm wing as well to move the center of percussion. But what we find is that it's about fi within about 5% of the wing length. And so they are actually very well aligned. And we get that from CFD for the center of pr pressure. Um, and from my, uh, CT scan for the center of percussion. So this is dividing it through uh, by how much is coming from the, this mechanical response, this inertial suspension system, and then also in green, how much is from the aerodynamics. Because of course, if the wing goes up and it pitches down, then there's going to be aerodynamic change as well. And so the aerodynamic change eventually um, is the biggest effect over on the right-hand side there. But initially, uh, it's doing almost nothing, um, while the inertial response in purple is um, at its maximum. So what that's doing is buying some time for the bird brain to kick in and provide the active response and change it as well. We can move on from um, three planks of wood to uh, three bits of foam <laughs> and uh, make a hinging wing um, glider. And so this contains all the, the um, characteristics that I've just been talking about. And we can fly them uh, launched from a catapult over the exactly the same gust generator as the birds. 
and we've got hinging ring on the left, and then I've cunningly disabled the hinging mechanism on the right-hand side with some sticky tape. So what would we expect to see? We would expect to see a much greater vertical impulse getting hit on the fixed ring than on the hinge. So if we pause it there, you see the height of the fuselage, which started the same, is uh, much lower um, when we've got this suspension mechanism than it is on the other side. It works in updrafts and it's in downdrafts, and these curves look almost identical to the bird curves that we're measuring. And what it relies on is um, potentially for uh, NAD design would be to store some of the mass in the wing, um, which is very easily done. It's like super easy to implement this. Um, incorporate some sort of uh, hinging mechanism and then uh, just uh, align those centers of pressure once again. So I'm moving on to another story. Let's talk about uh, sensing flows it's another aerodynamic story initially uh, for collision avoidance. And the, the model species for this is uh, Culex quinquiatus, which is a um, four millimeter long mosquito. Um, it's not the malaria mosquito, but it does transmit a variety of pretty nasty diseases. And th the reason that we went to this in initially is because it's a nocturnal mosquito. And it, when it flies in pitch black in lab conditions, it will still avoid surfaces. Um, before it crashes into them, the floor and the wall, uh, even when it's got no visual cues whatsoever. And um, so the question is, how does it do that? And there must be some sort of mechanosensory uh, behavior which is going on here. To examine that, we again went to a large array of high-speed cameras. They're doing something slightly different this time. And we flew them in a chamber. And if we look through the lens of one of these cameras, running at 10,000 frames a second, because the frequency is so incredibly high, we see an image like this. And this is a male, you can tell, because it's got very elaborate, over-elaborate uh, antennae. Not very elaborate, I'm going to tell you what they do in a minute. Um, and it's got a shallow wing stroke amplitude, much shallower than all the other insects we've ever looked at. Um, and that's what you see with the eight cameras. And then we can do a uh, machine vision-based technique called voxel carving, or convex hull reconstruction where we carve away all the background images, but not the mosquito. And if you look from multiple angles, eventually you're carving away more and more until you get the 3D geometry of the thing in question. Then you can uh, look at these wings, their um, they're wing bending and the wing twisting, and you can mesh that up to a CFD, and you see some familiar features again. So you see the wing tip vortex. Um, those familiar with insect flight or insect flight, uh, robotic flight will be um, you'll see the leading edge vortex there. And there are a few other features of this flow which were um, unusual to the point of unique features uh, while we wrote that up as an aerodynamics paper. However, um, it was always a sensory project. So we then need to re needed to rerun our CFD, but at varying altitudes, where we've got infinite altitude on the left. I'm not talking about space. I'm talking about that little mosquito. <laughs> and then as you bring it closer and closer to a surface, is there something about how the jet impinges on the surface, on the hard surface, that changes the local flow around the insect itself that it might be able to detect? So it's entering ground and wall effect, although far greater heights than a sort of wingspan, which we normally think about with ground effect. Um, but it does have these incredibly sensitive antennae. And um, we'll come on to that in a moment. So it's difficult to see from the vector plots what uh, the difference is at those heights. Um, so this is the delta. So this is infinite altitudes, and then subtract from that the vector plots at lower altitudes. And you can see areas of disparity um, in the pressure, uh, which comes from the flow velocity. Sorry. Um, and those happen to be largest in the region of the antennae and in the region of the legs, which are also instrumented with flow-sensitive pairs. And that works when you come close to a ground and also when you come close to a wall. So if we then look at the um, frequency response of the antennae, we find that at, in the wing beat frequency, at, at the wing beat frequency of the males, they have a sensitivity peak, which is a, a trough or valley in this um, particular uh, presentation of it. 
And so we know what the difference in velocities are, and we can extrapolate down to what the sensory distance is at which it would be able to detect a leak. And actually, that 60-ish um, millimeters, so a four-millimeter um, animal, is about the, s um, the same as the behavioral measurements suggest that you start to see a basal behavior in the dog. So back to um, robots. <laughs> what was the, what, can, can we port any of this insight across to flying vehicles? And we don't need to measure velocity, which is what they're measuring. We can measure pressure instead. So we got some pressure ports and put them in areas which we thought might be useful. And we flew it around the lab with the motion capture system. And this is just the trajectories colored by uh, the pressure in those ports. And so you can see that it's largely blue at low altitudes and largely red at higher altitudes. And the same is true when you come closer to it. So that was just our first attempt at it. But despite that, I, you don't need to read these, but it's just to remind me that it works with the floor, it works with the wall, it works if we change the substrate from a hard lab floor to astroturf, that artificial grass. It works even with a two meter per second uh, crosswind. And it works with different platform sizes from uh, Crazy Fly uh, up to that Iris Plus, which is one and a half kilos. We then went through an optimization process um, where we changed the uh, rotor spacing and we changed the dihedral angle and did lots of PIV. And these are the same as the uh, mosquito plots where we're looking at, on the right-hand column, the difference in the velocities. And what that allowed us to do, all as well, is um, fabricate a pressure sensor module where the probes are in the best place to identify the differences. We mounted that on the crazy fly, and then we started flying. Um, tethered first, because we know what flying is really like. And you can see that the lights are coming on and off again at a certain altitude, and that's actually a very consistent response. And the same thing happens um, when we go to a wall, but here, of course, only one of the lights comes on, because you might be able to detect a wall, but if you don't know which side it is, <laughs> then obviously um, that can lead to disaster. And then we got braver and started piloting it. Uh, this one, the lights come on as it takes off because it's close to the ground. And then they go off and uh, on and off and on and off, always at about a consistent height. And um, I wish we had the pilots that you guys have got. <laughs> right, then we did it autonomously, so we didn't need to um, fly it ourselves and break anything. Um, and really, this is all summed up by this image, where the, uh, where the, the uh, crazy fly comes in from the left side with its blue flight lights on. It descends, it detects a floor, it goes up, it comes down, it tries again over here, and then it, and then it leaves. So you can do little mapping tasks with that. And if we look down on it, here it is um, doing three near wall encounters, um, but surviving. So we can do it with pressure. Um, we wondered what we could do with acoustic sensing, especially bearing in mind these mosquitoes are very, very uh, acoustic um, beings. So we have um, the folks Williams Hawking's equations, which uh, the inputs of which, um, being pressure on the surface and the surface ve velocity, are the outcomes of our kinematics measurements and our CFD measurements. So you can use that to calculate the sound pressure level at any point in, any, at, um, in space around the mosquito in the center there, and it sounds different depending on where you listen from. And we can make hypotheses about what they might do um, to detect surfaces, whether that's the pressure fluctuations from the downwash or reflections or the reflections and Doppler shift or whatever it might be. And again, we get to sort of Friday afternoon robot club and we can find very quickly that um, you can uh, write some very simple code to detect uh, when, when my <laughs> bank card is approaching a, a microphone array. And then we can um, build that up in something a little bit more uh, professional, and I think Simon talked about this on Tuesday, where he's approaching uh, with a wall, and the crazy fly takes evasive action. We can also do flow velocity sensing, and there is a, an artificial hair, which is embedded in a carbon nanotube infill, um, to act as a flow velocity sensor from uh, the US Air Force. And we can use vision sensing, um, which Jeff Barrows at Sentai has been flying around on crazy flies for quite a long time. And you can even put them all together, but you end up with this layer of pancakes, <laughs> and it sort of starts to topple over until your um, nice, low, you know, uh, good aspect ratio um, flying device turns into the leaning tower of Pisa as you're taking off and flying around the lab. And ultimately, you get to a point where it can't even carry the Lego minifigures, and that's where we draw the line, so we have to stop there. 
So I want to uh, change tack at this point and talk a little bit about uh, what we might call embodied intelligence. It's not, I put a little mic, um, question mark there because it's not actually a phrase that I like very much um, because I don't think it quite gets to the heart of what people are talking about here. But um, I'm more than happy to have that conversation at a later date. It's, here I'm talking about it where we might use structural design to filter or amplify um, the, the sensing capabilities um, on the aircraft. And essentially, that is improving signal to noise. Now, one example of that is the uh, cephalic tricoid sensilla. So cephalic on the head, tricoid, hair-like sensilla, sensor. And um, they look like this. And there's a, a desert locust, Chistocerca gregaria. Now, what they do um, is they respond to wind um, by spiking more frequently. And so here we've got three increasing wind speeds. And you can also see the directional sensitivity of that. So if it's not blowing into the curvature, like along the board here, then it doesn't fire at all. And that's quite a useful characteristic because then you can, again, like return to some CFD around the heads. You can look at the flow fields um, in the area where these fields of hairs are. And there are five principal fields. You can confirm your CFD with some smoke flow. <clears throat> and then you can start to manipulate that model uh, in side slip or in pitch and see what the difference is in the flow over the fields. And if you do that, here you can see uh, the change in side slip. And we're looking down on the head, more or less there. And you can see that the vectors side slip, as you might expect. And there in pitch, where we're looking in on a profile view, again, you can see the vectors at different angles. And some of them are very, very faithful sensors. So fields one and two are really good side slip angle um, absolute detectors. They follow the line of one. So the change in the angle over the sensors is the same as the change in the angle of the aircraft, or locust in this case. Um, whereas field three, there's no change in the angle uh, over the sensors uh, with side slip angle. Um, and in some, you get a very nonlinear response. So in fields four and five, there's no change in them except for when it goes up really steeply towards the end. And so that would be a really good stall detector. And this is what the flow fields look like in those regions where you get uh, attached flow from fore to aft or until you reach stall, in which case you get reverse flow over that field of hairs. And some of them, there's gain amplification. So if you look at field three and its angle of attack, the, the measured points are above the, the gain line, um, which means that it's, particularly, it's going to be particularly sensitive to those. So it's using its geometry to amplify the signal that it's getting and get a better reading, therefore. So that's on the head. We can also look at on-wing uh, state estimation. And for that, uh, we turn to dragonflies, which are uh, absolutely fantastic insects. And um, initially, some um, quite similar methods here. So we film many times. This is what it looks like. And what I want you to see from this is that the wings are not rigid flat plates. They bend, they twist, the camber changes. Uh, there are nonlinearities at a, at a bit called the nodus, which is like a one-way hinge. Um, and so all these things um, are sort of pre prescribed by the architecture, uh, the evolved architecture of the wings there. So we can uh, reproject what each camera sees to get an idea of the error on these. And that's um, not video footage. That is the reconstructed model over there. With that, we can look at the flow. And this is simulating the flow with this uh, sort of thin flat plate. It's allowed to twist and bend and change camber, but it's got no 3D architecture to it, and the kinematics are prescribed. But in real life, look at these big, heavily reinforced ridges. Um, and vein ju junctions, which are free to twist until the spike stopper hits the next one along. And so it's very nonlinear as well. Um, and so it's got all these micro features. And some of them we've started to incorporate already uh, using uh, micro CT. So that, that's uh, an example of the three-dimensional structure right there. And we can combine that um, with fresh specimens uh, so that we get a very naturalistic shape with all these interesting features um, of the reinforced 
leading edge proximally. And with that, we can do more CFD, but better. Uh, we can do some solid dynamics um, simulations, and we can do the fluid structure interaction simulations. We can test hypotheses about what do the corrugated, um, what do the corrugations actually give uh, by comparing that with the flat plate. We can look at the fluid dynamics and the pressure, and we see that actually it's quite different um, because the ridges, uh, local flow conditioners, they promote um, or uh, suppress separation. And here are some examples of that, and the difference between the smoothed and the corrugated wing shapes. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but it's just an example of the kind of things that we do. And then we can do the solid, the solid uh, simulation, solid dynamics, um, with point loads. And then you can see where the stress concentrations are, and the highest points of strain. And we can then move that onto flapping. And so this is currently an early effort, and it's in, in a vacuum. Um, but you can see how the fluctuations of strain um, progress and evolve throughout the course of the wing stroke cycle. You can then do, without flapping, you can do some fluid structure interaction. So this is cantilevered at the wing hinge. Um, this one's static. And this one, you can perhaps see the wing tip uh, elevating as the flow builds up around this wing at an angle of attack. And there you can see it, but with the vortex structure as well, with the reds and yellows and greens showing where the strains are um, along those veins. Now, that's nice from a sort of mechanical point of view, but again, coming back to flight control, um, can the sensors on the wings estimate these instantaneous loading states so that the insect, as well as being highly visual, can also be fly-by-feel, like just sensing um, very rapidly the instantaneous loads? And to do that, we go to uh, more uh, methods. These ones perhaps less familiar to you. So this is confocal microscopy. And we see the campaniform sensor here, the strain sensors. And here we see an example of a trichoid sensor, so a big uh, flow-sensitive hair. This is staining of the neurons, so there's the cell body. It innervates at the base, and then the wiring goes off inside the wing hinge to the flight controller. Now, wouldn't it be nice to know every single sensor on that wing? Well, we thought it would. So there are various different um, flavors of these. Some come next to bumps, some are not next to bumps, some are next to vein junctions, some are in troughs, some are in hills. But we can calculate the full wiring diagram of these and the location of every single sensor on the wing. And to sort of encapsulate that, we've got this movie of a, uh, an amber wing dragonfly. So there's the neural backstaining, and that's the location of all the strain sensors, campaniforms. There's the cell body hiding in the wing vein. That's what it looks like from the outside on the cross veins. <clears throat> Here are the, uh, the wing bristles around the margin. So these are flow sensitive. You can see two in that one, one at the top and one at the bottom. And they are along the trailing edge as well and they tend to be associated with bumps along the trailing edge, which are likely local flow conditioners or uh, protectors. So they'll act to um, stop those shorter hairs at the trailing edge getting snapped off in any collision. And that's uh, quite likely if you're an aerial predator. You're regularly doing combat with conspecifics and your prey. But each of these neurons needs to be nourished, and each of them needs their ion channels resetting, and the information from them needs to be processed. So you, there's a strong selective pressure that these sensors are valuable. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother having them. Here we are on Google Earth look, looking at the uh, local position of all the sensors on the dragonfly wing veins. But what information are they able to collect, and is it useful for flight control? Here we go back to our... Um, CSD, and now for any one of those sensors that we've identified and located, uh, we can say what the local conditions were for it, whether that be flow or whether that be strain. Now if we look at strain here, as it flaps, we can see it goes up and it goes down. We see in alternating blues and reds in the troughs and the valleys. This is the wing stroke cycle. 
and these are the thresholds of strain that we're seeing. So we, we're in the process at the moment of characterizing those sensors to know at what point the neuron will fire and a spike will be received by the flight controller. Now, even more interestingly, perhaps, we know that there's um, a phenomenon here called isosynchronicity, or isochronicity, rather, um, which synchronizes all of these. So the, the sensors which are out at the wing tip have um, wider axons than those which are close to the wing hinge. And what that means is that the effect of that is that all those spikes actually arrive at the wing hinge at the same time, which is going to have quite interesting implications um, for uh, spiking system uh, controllers um, and the, the phase and the, uh, the timing of all the input incoming signals. So finally, I'll just show you something which is perhaps uh, less relevant to a general application, but it's nice to see how the uh, wings are then actuated for flight control. So we've got distributed sensing, clearly. Um, in this case, all the muscles are inside the thorax. So we don't really have distributed actuation, um, but the, the uh, circuits which go from the sensors to the steering muscles are quite well known now, particularly in flies, not so much in dragonflies. So my colleague Igor uh, Sivanovic can make these absolutely wonderful uh, set stain sections and from that reconstruct the flight musculature inside the thorax there and um, get, uh, get, get a bit crazy with Blender <laughs> and see how these actuate. And so they're actually very low strain. You're looking at sort of a, you know, a few handfuls of percent that the muscles are actually contracting. But because they're on levers, of course, that leads to large amplitude um, flapping of the uh, dragonfly's wings. And so from the, um, you can infer the uh, motor neuron signals which are going to those muscles from what they actually do, um, from their contraction, because you can take the muscles out and you can do muscle me uh, measurements um, and characterize the properties of the muscle as well in the lab. And this is for steady level forward flight, but of course the kinematics measurements that we have already um, are for freely behaving dragonflies. So they sometimes turn, they sometimes chase things, they sometimes come into land, sometimes they're taking off. And so the extension of this work is to characterize that and not just do steady level forward, um, but move on to what are the incoming signals immediately prior to a turn? Um, and then how is that turn affected? And then how does it stop turning thereafter? So I've dashed around a lot of uh, topics there, um, but I hope you can see how we're starting to populate uh, this control loop cycle um, from actuation to uh, structures, airframe structures and wing structures, how they might smartly warp or smartly deform, talking morphing wings here, what the aerodynamic consequences of doing that are, what the trajectory consequences are of the aerodynamics and why that's behaviorally important, because some are aerial predators, some are long distance migrants, some hawk up and down over um, rivers patrolling their territory. Uh, and then much of this, of course, is portable, um, I think, to the uh, IMAV community. And if you think there's scope for that, I would uh, very happily talk to you about that in more detail today. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for a very inspiring talk. Are there questions in the in the room? Yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> uh, thank you, Richard, and thank you for your very good presentation. My question is about the wind tips. So you know the uh, induced drug is very important to the air plane. So engineering will design the uh, commercial um, airplane with uh, wing tips. So uh, my, que my first question is, uh, that is uh, uh, ins uh, inspired from the biology or not? And the second question, uh, I didn't see this one on the propellers of the multi-rotors. So if we design the um, uh, propeller of the multi-rotors with uh, this uh, um, the wing tip, that will be beneficial to the reduce the noise and the, um, the vibration and increase the, the, the efficiency or not? So that is my question, thank you. 
Thank you, and it's a really good question as well, because I, th I think there's actually, uh, winglets is very not a closed subject, certainly um, not on the biological side, because you think if it's going to be beneficial, um, you can ask the question, why don't they all have imaginated primaries that bend up at the wingtip, and you have this multi-slot or whichever kind of effect it is. Uh, and yet, if you look at the birds which have them, they don't really fit particularly well into certain groups. So there are soaring birds which have them, and this is what people point at. Um, but there are also soaring birds which don't have that. And there are non-soaring birds which don't have that, and non-soaring birds which do have that. So I think the actual aerodynamics is yet to be fully understood, which is a terrible answer, but I'm, what I'm actually saying is I don't know, and I, I'm not sure anybody has a particularly good answer to that. But we do know that um, you get induced drag benefits. Um, whether those induced drag benefits are greater than just flattening it off and having a wider span, it, I think actually they're pretty comparable. Um, so when you're applying that to a multi-rotor design, you probably will get the benefits of having a larger disc area, actuator disc swept area, um, but you would be able to have those closer together. What then happens with the interactions, again, would be really interesting to see. I'd like to see that. I think if you want to make them quieter, by the way, you should just uh, like reduce the wing loading. So if you look at owls, they have a whole range of quietening um, methods, including serrations at the leading edge and porosity at the trailing edge. Um, but the, probably the major drivers are soft, downy parts of the feathers so that when they rub over each other, they don't go, or <laughs> they don't do that, um, which if you get two feathers, if you find two feathers outside and rub them, they'll make a noise. Owl feathers don't do that because they're softer. They have a, like a velvety part underneath. Um, and the other thing is that they're just totally off the scale with wing loading. So they have a very, very low wing loading and that has aeroacoustic benefits. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? I see Sonji with her hand. Uh, hey, don't do this to me. Eh? Not the next question there. Eh? <laughs> uh, hi, Richard. Um, I work on sensing for flapping wing drones, so your talk is very relevant to what I'm doing. Uh, so when designing uh, airflow sensors with hair, I noticed that uh, uh, these hair sensors, in a way, they kind of can also serve as a local strain measurement uh, based, uh, depending on the design of the hair sensor, so I'm wondering in nature, uh, is there any sort of uh, coupling between the airflow sensing and strain sensing on the wing membrane of the, let's say, the dragonfly? Again, that is a really good question, because I think I would be surprised if the strain, if the hair sensors, which we talk about as being flow sensors, were completely insensitive to strain. That would surprise me, um, but it's not been recorded. And I, I would be a bit more surprised if the campaniform sensilla that were sensitive to wind um, because they tend to be embedded. So they, they're sort of, the active part is sometimes even below the, re the main surface that's local to that sensor. So I think probably they are not um, wind receptive, but I would be surprised if you couldn't get um, a, a spike from a hair sensor by straining it. Probably it might have to be quite dramatic um, but straining a hair sensor. They are also sensitive to uh, temperature. So and if you shine a, a laser onto the campaniforms, you can measure that. Um, and then the sort of background firing rate changes as well. So it's, uh, that they're not perfect sensors. And maybe I should have made more of a point of that. <laughs> so it's noisy data. And while the whole system is very robust, Dragonflies, are, for example, I have a nice picture of a dragonfly where half the wing is just missing. So you might say, well, if they're that important, how can, how can it do it without them? Um, <clears throat> but I think that exemplifies the robustness of the system. And I, I re retain the point that I did make about it, it would be unlikely that they would keep so many if they weren't serving some function. Thanks.
Uh, we have another question here. Thank you, Mathieu. Yeah, thanks again for the very nice presentation. And uh, yeah, just to follow up on this, so you said that there are many sensors which are costly, uh, but could it be that because of this robustness, you prefer to have many, also because the data is noisy? So maybe on a on a drone where we can have like better sensors, we wouldn't need as many. Uh, we could just need a few to serve the same function. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. And one of my interests is uh, how few we might be able to get away with. Um, if you take that to the limit, let's say one is necessary. Um, if that one breaks, then you're in trouble. Yep. So. At some point, there's going to be a line drawn where it's, it makes sense. But you, you can look at um, mitigating that risk. And I think this is what dragonflies are doing, because in their forewings, you get relatively few sensors around the trailing edge of the forewing. And it gets bashed by the leading edge of the hindwing quite frequently. And so sometimes you can hear dragonflies doing an extreme maneuver and they sort of go like that and that's because the wings are bashing together so if you you want to move them away from the areas of most risk of damage um, and then of course it's a trade-off between robustness and uh, economy yep thanks we do have time for uh, a few or questions still if anybody yeah great coming <laughs> Uh, thank you. I find it very inspiring as well. I'm just wondering, because when I saw the example of the bird and the insect, uh, I have very limited knowledge about uh, animals, but I'm just thinking the brain, how like also the neuron works, is differs between the bird and uh, the insect, because my knowledge about biology is the bird, the brain is much more uh, like complex than the insect. And I think the insect also have this ganglion and uh, like embedded into the body, if I remember the right. And then uh, compared to humans, that our mind is or like a brain also work quite differently because we have this cerebellum that basically we can balance our movement that doesn't go into the con conscious level. So when you mention about the, the bird examples, I was just wondering, because I do think that the bird wings and the structures have a lot of these small sensory neurons that also can sense all this, uh, uh, like the, the balance or the winged, this movement. So it's actually have, goes through to this uh, like uh, central nervous systems to really compute, maybe need the minimal energy to maintain this gesture or certain delicate position. So I'm just wondering if there was some study in that area to further uh, like articulate the uh, phenomena. And also I think for uh, like UAV this inspiration because I do understand the biology features are super delicate. And do you also think that we should make such kind of wings or or do you think go to that direction to make it a super fine and uh, delicate structures for UAVs? And then in that sense, that do we also need to learn from biology that we have to throw a lot of this fine or like small data in, in case uh, computation is much more complex than the current uh, state of the art? Thank you. Thank you. That covered a few topics. I'll try and, if I forget one, remind me. <laughs> so. Uh, on robustness of the structures, of course, we're dealing with biomaterials here, and they're in some ways very different from the ones that we tend to use. Um, we don't use feathers, for example, and yet feathers are actually pretty good, but feathers are quite hard to replicate. But they are useful in that they're um, very lightweight, they're stiff, they deform in a way that you can prescribe, so, and uh, they can form continuous surfaces which expand and contract. So that's a very desirable property. Um, and something that which we might look to do, um, uh, I think, like progress in that area would be very good. So I'm calling on materials scientists there, <laughs> and multifunctional materials. And when we're talking about multifunctional materials as well, you can um, look along the lines of uh, things which have very prescribed deformations. 
And there we can take inspiration from nature, I believe. We can look at uh, that at the material level and the architectural level. Um, we, that can also be used to improve robustness in what it initially looks like a delicate structure, because um, whether it's too delicate depends on what the task is that it has to do. So, and if and how acceptable damage is. So is it strong enough to support weight? That's one category. Is it strong enough to do that if you lose 5% of the wing area through damage of some sort? That's a, that's a design criterion that you may wish to have or you may not. Okay, so that's, that comes down to the task that you want your vehicle to perform. Um, <clears throat> In terms of the processing, uh, yes, they, they do it in very different ways, and yes, the brains of birds are much more uh, complex, bigger uh, than the brains of insects, and yes, there's distributed processing. In fact, uh, other than the reflex system, which you uh, mentioned, um, there are other sensory modalities, which, uh, like for example, humans don't have um, specific to those clades, those groups of animals. Y you have distributed ganglia in um, insects, which can do certain processing in the thorax. In um, birds, you have the lumbosacral organ, which the um, current thinking is that it acts like an IMU. And the lumbosacrum is here, so it's sometimes called the brain in the butt. Uh, and that might be quite useful for animals like birds, which are essentially um, decoupling the motion of their head with the motion of their body, the, the thorax and the abdomen. So the thorax and the abdomen can bounce up and down with each wing stroke because of the dynamics of the system. But the head, thanks to the suspension system of the neck, can continue and get um, un, uninhibited, unperturbed uh, optic flow, and you can pick things out a lot more easily. So there's a world of things out there <laughs> that could be useful. Uh, I suppose that's a little bit analogous to a maybe the, the seeker on a missile where it's not pointing necessarily in the direction that you're going, you can adapt, and we already gimbal cameras, but that's the kind of thing which I suppose birds are doing and uh, insects can do. And that sometimes they keep their heads stationary to limit the, uh, the optic flow that they're experiencing from the maneuver. But of course the thorax is doing large amplitude motions around that in order to steer. So. All, all these things are happening, and um, there is research, of course, into the processing of that, and also the multi-sensory integration. So somatosensory, like tactile information, which you're getting from loading at the base of each feather, can be mapped to the same area of the brain that the uh, optic flow information is coming um, from the retina. And it, so that they go in through different pathways, but ultimately they get to uh, the tectum um, where presumably some sort of fusion of that information is happening. So was that, have I missed any specific question that you had? I think you covered most of them and I really appreciate it. Uh, I learned a lot today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me check the time. Yes, so then let's uh, thank uh, the speaker again. It was a really great talk. And um, today uh, I told myself that I would not forget what I have been forgetting the other days. So we actually have gifts for keynote speakers. <laughs> so here's a token of our appreciation. And the Drony Sauce people, if they're in the house, yes, they're there as well. And also to provide them still with a gift for yesterday. I don't know if they're uh, listening. So here, this is still for you for yesterday. Also for your CEO. Yeah. So thank you very much, Richard. Uh, at the moment we have a coffee break. So uh, if I understood well, it will be downstairs here with the tables. And, uh, and then we see each other back for the first uh, session.
You like the participant to get to the coffee break as well?
I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Okay. This is a message. This is a message. Screen sharing. Latin screen sharing. I need permission to permission to to share. Yeah, yeah. Can you see the you presentation? See the presentation. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 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 Okay.
Ja, is goed. Dat is misschien wel goed, hè? Wat is jouw uh, hoofdexpertise, Dennis? Uh, ik weet dat uh, in de autoliet controle zoiets. Ja, okay. Guidance. Ja. Ik zou dat. Uh... Maar het is de, de deep learning factor, hoor. Ja, dat is het pas goed bij elkaar. Ja. <laughs> So um, welcome back. Uh, we now have uh, our first session of today and we have a session chair, the famous uh, Dennis van Wijngaarden. Uh, he's an expert in uh, guidance and control and obviously, of course, deep learning. So, uh. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Guido, for introducing uh, me. So uh, yeah, I will be the chair for the coming hour. So we have the deep learning session. Um, yeah, and I would already uh, yeah, give the word to the first speaker here, if he is ready. It's, uh, uh, yeah, you can introduce yourself, and yeah, if you're ready, you can start. OK. okay. Uh, thanks, Guido, and thanks, Dennis, and thanks, uh, Richard. That is a very good uh, presentation. I like it very much, especially for the same things. Well, let me talk about something about it. The deep learning, uh, uh, deep learning based uh, flight speed estimation using uh, thermal animators. This work is a drawing with the um, Jingang Chu Pascal Imohan. Pascal Imohan. Well, the objective is um, air velocity estimation and then the flight speed estimation. The definition is that the air velocity is the uh, mass velocity relative to the natural wind speed. This work is dedicated to the MARV, especially for the um, multi rotors MARV. There are many different, uh, different solutions for the air velocity estimation. Um, for the MAV, people, I mean, th uh, those sensors could be divided into two categories, based on the velocity or based on the dynamic pressure. For MAV, people will prefer use the um, uh, compact sensors, for example, the whisker like hole based uh, animometers. Well, in this work, we will use the bi directional thermal animometers because it is uh, uh, smaller, lighter, and especially have no uh, uh, mechanical moving components. So one motivation is to predict the flight speed as, um, predict the flight speed in the GPS denied and the dark environment, the, uh, usually with uh, weak, uh, weak winds. The vision sensor um, is uh, sensitive to the illumination and uh, dynamic uh, environments, while the airflow-based sensor has lines dependent on the environment and has low uh, latency, high frequency, and the higher reliability. So we install three uh, uh, thermal animometers orthogonal to each other over um, uh, above our dividable MARVs. And the thermal animometer have different configurations, uh, for example, the multi sensors and the multi heaters. According to the principle of the thermal animometers, the sensor measurements could be, um, it's actually a strictly monotonic monotonic function of the air velocity. So in this work, we propose uh, two-step approaches. Step one, linear model identification. We use a sliding window average method to filter out the environment noise, and then use the Gaussian least square regulation for identifying the linear model parameters. And step two, we design a GRU-based um, uh, deep learning neural network model for denoising and decoupling. Um, in this work, we want to uh, predict the flight speed only based on the airflow uh, sensors. Well, we don't have any other sensor we used here. So um, the experiments uh, are performed in indoor without any uh, natural wind. So the air velocity is equal to the flight speed plus the induced velocity. The induced velocity should be removed. Let me present the step one, linear model identification and the sliding window. So the commercially available uh, Animometer has very good uh, linearity, so the measurements could be considered as a bias linear um, model function. And then we collect a set of data um, and use uh, the, the, the sliding window average method to field out the uh, uh, measurement noise, the results showing at the figures. While the measurement is happy the um, uh, Gaussian white, white noise uh, characteristic overall and uh, turbulence locally related to the 
um, the, the flat state. So the linear model parameters, the buyer B and the scale S could be easily obtained by uh, um, building a Gaussian least square regression, right? Step two, the GRU-based GRU model. Well, the linear model is able to predict the error velocity, but it cannot remove the induced velocity. So we designed the GRU model um, for denoting on one hand and de um, uh, decoupling on the other hand, especially for removing the induced velocity and the ground effect. So the ar architecture are showing at life. The input contain the raw measurements of the air flow data and the angular velocity within a continuous uh, time window, while the output contained only the flight speed at the last time, last, uh, last moment of this uh, time window. The angular velocity is uh, taken from the, uh, the, the geoscope on the other pillow. Well, the scaling layer used the identified um, linear model param parameters, the bias and the scale to uh, normalize the, the row of uh, airflow uh, measurements in order to reduce the, the linear, uh, sorry, in order to reduce the learning uh, difficulty. The two layer of the convolutional neural network is used for uh, uh, denoising, while the two layer of the GRU model is used for the uh, decoupling, I mean, to uh, extracting those uh, um, deep features. Well, the output is uh, supervised by the ground truth velocity in the body frame. So we equip the MAV with a depth camera and the ORB SLAM3 system used for uh, obtaining the uh, position of the uh, vehicle. The EKF um, built into the autopilot um, predict the flight speed in the body frame. I mean, in, uh, predict the flight speed um, by fusing the, the, the AMU data and the SLAM output position. And the flight speed in the body frame could be uh, obtained by a uh, uh, free uh, transformation because we have the attitude the ground truth from the slime. And then we collect a multi, multiple uh, set of data on the different days. And each contain a uh, different five uh, flat faces. And we divided those uh, data into three sites. The training site contained 20 minutes flat data. And the validation site contained 40 minutes data. And the test site contained four minutes data. The Prediction uh, result of the two uh, model versus the ground truths are shown at left, and um, the relative errors are shown in the right. The prediction error variance is uh, recorded into the, the table below. Well, note that for uh, identifying the linear model um, in the z direction, we just only refer to the hovering and the vertical fly states, I mean, the faces. The Prediction curves of the GRU model is a smooth and overlap with the ground truth, which means that the GRU model could effectively couple the, the, the noise and the turbulence and also uh, decouple the induced velocity from the uh, flat speed, especially for the vertical um, flat speed prediction. Well, here is a um, one shot to the end videos for the 40 minutes flat data. The orange one is a um, orange curve is a um, ground truth, and the blue one is a GRU based um, prediction. Let me show it. Very bad. This is for the vertical flight. But that is actually the 
14 minutes of flight, so I just uh, speed up it. And land it. Well, the conclusion. Well, this is the first work to use the triaxial thermal anemometers to uh, predict the flight speed um, by using a deep learning uh, neural network model uh, in the 3D uh, dimensions. Well, we uh, identify a linear model for the air velocity estimation and then train a GRU model for denoising the decoupling. The results demonstrate that the GRU model has a reliable flight speed estimation. The perspective, I think there is many th things could be done. Well, the firstly, um, the wind perception and the aerodynamics model identification in the order centers uh, with other sensors, for example, GPS, uh, anyway. And second, fusion uh, with other onboard sensors, for example, the IMU, the parameters for uh, robustness for the odometry. And second, uh, sorry, third, uh, design of the smaller uh, customer animators. So actually, that is uh, this one. And that is uh, that one, the smaller animators. Well, thank you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. Okay, um, yeah, thank you for your uh, good presentation. A very interesting topic. And I'm wondering uh, if there are questions from the audience here. So, uh, Guido. Maybe you know how to switch on the other microphone. <laughs> and I will give this one back to uh, the presenter. Yeah, OK. Hi. Thank you uh, for the very interesting uh, presentation and work. I, I think the result is very impressive. Like uh, you fast forwarded it 10 times, and uh, the lines seem to f follow very well. Uh, the flight speed, um, assuming, of course, at this point uh, that it was wind still there, so it looks very impressive. My question uh, would be, sometimes there's a slight deviation, perhaps still, between the two, uh, the measurement and the, the estimate from the network and the ground truth. Um, yeah, what, what do you think the worst deviations still are, or the main challenge still is with this? Like, what... Uh, what, uh, are there still situations in which it really deviates, or is it always quite close? And uh, yeah, and what would the next step be? So the question is about the um, actually it's about the noise or not the deviation of the the between the the prediction and the ground truth, right? Yeah. So in the in the quick video, you see the orange line oh, yeah. and the and the ground. Uh, and yeah. the other one, and sometimes there's a slight deviation, right? But I don't know. I mean, you've looked at much more data than I could see in the very fast video. Yeah. And so I'm just asking: Are there still points? Are there still points at which uh, they diff are different, uh, yeah. like that there's an error? And in what cases do you think this happens? And are there approaches to solve it? Okay. Okay. The question is: um, How about uh, how do we think about the the deviation uh, between the uh, neural network prediction and the ground truth. So, um, well, actually, you know, because this one is a uh, output of the um, AI, I mean, the deep learning method. So the AI, well, that is a very good uh, um, um, method to, to identify the, the system. But I don't think it's a very good uh, estimator. So in this work, we will use the the neural network to predict something. For example, we want to um, remove the induced velocity, which means we want to extract the induced velocity from the measurements. So you you know actually, especially for the vertical fly, the induced velocity and the flight speed will will couplet with it, each other. So we, we can measure the, the the wind, but actually this wind contains the downward velocity. So we need to remove that. That is our main uh, objective. Well. The direct, uh, I mean, the difference from um, between the, the the prediction and the ground truth that is, um, I think that is normal. So that is why the in the future work we want to use uh, uh, fusion with other sensors on board for them, IMU and the barometers. 
So the AM module, that is very good. It's a very good at the, um, uh, identifying the system. But it's similar to the Carmen filter. That is just a prediction process. We need also a correct process. So this one gives us a very good prediction. And uh, very quickly, but that is, um, I mean, the AI is too uh, self-confidence. Uh, so we uh, normal, uh, I mean, usually we could believe it, but sometimes we cannot. So we need another process to correct it. So that is why there is a difference, but we need to uh, correct it in the future. So this is the first step. And uh, another one is, uh, for example, the AIO is an airflow inertial odometry. We need uh, another sensor to correct it. So the AI is not only the one thing we, uh, we should do. We need another thing. That one is for the robustness. That one is for the reduce uh, difference. Fantastic. Thank you for your answer. Thank yeah. you. Very nice work. OK, uh, unfortunately, we're already running out of time for this presentation. So I will thank you again. And uh, yeah, we have to set up now uh, a virtual presentation connection because the next three presentations uh, will be virtual. So uh, I will quickly set up uh, the Zoom screen here, and then we can continue. Sound check. The next presentation will be by Miranda. Can you hear me or can the presenter uh, answer? Oh, sorry, I first have to connect my screen. Try to do some sound check. Hi, I'm here. Hello, I'm Oyuki Rojas. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you uh, clearly here. Um, so, yeah, um, um, actually, I would say uh, you can start your presentation and we'll, uh, yeah, and you can introduce yourself first. Okay. 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 Well, um, I will well, present the uh, article. I will present the article in title segmentation, semantic segmentation, aerial, aerial images, using aerial CNN images and using CNN and and superation. Uh, in recent years, a large uh, amount, in recent years, uh, a large aerial amount images of have been aerial available images have been they available are taken for a they are taken for airplanes, 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 for uh, there, Although, are several, uh, there are techniques several to analyze techniques to uh, analyze them, for example, uh, example uh, statistical methods to machine learning techniques, uh, present the most popular technique, is, the most popular technique is so popular. in this world, so we in this world, uh, LGBT, we employ uh, aerial, uh, images, LGBT, aerial from images 100 to 300 meters uh, above the ground, which are employed to avoid uh, CNN based on a variant of BGG-16. Architecture for semantic, for semantic image segmentation. Uh, we uh, we define the classes for classes to identify, to identify urban, zone, urban vegetation, zone, vegetation zone, agriculture, agriculture, and roads. And roads. Uh, due to the uh, high, high resolution, special resolution, pixels are a group, are a group concerning similar textures and, textures and, superations, and superations to reduce the number, reduce of, the number of pixels by CNNs. This set of this set images, of images employed to train, employed the, to train the, model the model is, is composed of 360,000 images, images of 60 times 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60 
and in the and name, in the name batches, batches, we, we extract, we extract batches these from batches Google, from Earth, Google Earth, Earth, corresponding, uh, corresponding to, the to the megapolitan area, area of the center of Mexico, Mexico and pictures and of pictures different, of states, different states, of states of Mexico, of Mexico, Mexico taken, from taken from drones. And the attitude, and the attitude of, the Google, of the Google Earth, Earth images are between, are is between, is between And also due to the CNN require a large quite a large of training amount data, of training data, the data set the data set was increased by synthetic data, 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 data augmentation tech and we apply and we apply some transformation, some transformation to the data set, to the data set for example rotation and translation and we implement the CNN architecture uh, based on BGG 16 and after the last block of building CNN is employed in the one fully connected lawyer following by the one drop uh, with a portion of uh, 0.5. And this is employed to prevent the overfitting. And finally, a softmax classifier, which computes the probability of each class uh, we aim. And the output vector is the size of four corresponding classes. Okay. And our approach can segment aerial images in any size, however, the minimum size is 60 times 60. And due to the models predicts the label of the central pixel is, our proposal is named pixel-based classification. As a consequence, the number of the classified pixel is based on the size on the image, multiply the weight and height, and, and also when it's a disadvantage for large images. Uh, in the in the images, when well, the images are the example of the original image, for example, uh, we we define this image this original image as image one, and this version dividing into the super pixels where each pixel is surrounded by a green line, and the image dividing into a super region, which each. Uh, whether uh, each separation is represented by different color and, and we shown in the third image. So the, the first image, the original image, has a total of 360,000 pixels. While meanwhile, the number of, uh, okay. Uh, and meanwhile, the super pixels has uh, 1,069. And finally, 421 uh, super eight. Uh, the model segment area was developed with libraries with Keras and TensorFlow, and the experiments were conducted in uh, Intel Core i7 processor with a RAM with 50 gigabytes and a uh, GPU from NVIDIA, GFORS. Uh, and we use the segmented aerial for experiments, which are taken between 400 and 200 meters. And regarding with the ground truth, the roads are represented by brown color, the, the vegetation zone is colored with green, and the urban zone is shown as, as as blue. And the agriculture zone is painted with a yellow color. With respect to the image number three, the architecture of the houses is different from respect to the tools employed to the train model. And the test image contains city and suburban surface concerning the, the urban images presenting a, a mixture of textures or roofs, uh, such as concrete, steel, and wooden. Okay, uh, we 
we, we perform three experiments. The first experiments consist to evaluate the images pixel by pixel, and then super pixel, and then superation. The, uh, this, this experiment, we separate in quarter and a half of, of this region. And in the table, uh, it, the, the table shows the number of the elements classified by your model, where the number of the elements is the highest for the first experiment, and the lowest number corresponds to the super region based on the quarter element. And the next table presents the time required in seconds to prepare for pre-processing and segmentation in aerial images. Um, the behavior is very similar to the number of the elements classified to the high numbers of the elements. And the, um, the time required is, is very high. So the, the lowest number of the elements, the time required, uh, uh, the time required is low. Um, the difference between the super pixel base and the super region based classification is between two and three seconds. Yeah. Uh, in the first experiment, the number of the elements classified was defined by the size of the image, that is the weight, the height, and we performed the measures of the images number one and number two for each class. And we show in this table, Although our model was trained with another type of architecture of houses, it correctly classified more than half of the pixels of image two for the urban zone. Uh, and on the other hand, the words F, F score uh, value for roads was 0 0.3, uh, which was less than 0 0.8. That corresponds to the image one. Uh, the previous results can be generated because the patches corresponding the urban zone and the roads in some cases have similar texture and particular on the roof with the weather problem. And the next table shows the average performance measured for each image presented according to the average precision, the recall, and the F score values. And you, our model is able to classify more of most of the pixels correctly. However, this is a mistook when the attitude of the image is near of is near of is near four hundred meters. Uh, that corresponds image image two. And the architecture of the houses is different that to those we employed to train the CNN model. Uh, okay. The second experiment uh, corresponds the shows the number of the elements in the table was defined multiplying the weight, height, and the constant value. And this constant value we define as 0 0.003. In the table, uh, we, we show the performance measurement for image one and image two for each class we present. And according to the F score values, the use super pixel improve the, sem the segmentic segmentation for image and the average performance measure for each image using super, super pixel based classification are exposed, no? Yeah. In accordance with the performance values, uh, this approach improves the accuracy from image one, three, and four due to the values are higher than those reported in, in the previous table. Uh, additional, the average values for this experiment has been improved. Okay. Uh, the final experiments corresponds to the to their super region based classification. Uh, this this first table corresponds to to quarter, sorry, for half is the half super pixels, and the evaluation of the half of uh, half super pixel report in the best performance measures. Meanwhile, the evaluation of quarter of super pixel had a similar behavior than a super based classification. So we we show a graphically comparison. And the image shows the output corresponding the first uh, the first test image, and 
Know that the pixel-based classification presents a salt and paper effect. And this. Um, moreover, the region labeled by a, a number represent means classified region because this is these are shadows. Uh, um, the regions surrounding by the red rectangle present an area of image with low accuracy of prediction and gradient mark of pink rectangles, misclassificate some pixels. And finally, super pixel based classification and super region based classification improve this misclassification in pink areas with respect to region label with number one and two were improved. Finally, two region delimited by red rectangle preserve the behavior to the to any approach and our CNN model was not able to improve the misclassification. The next image corresponds to test image two and the CNN model misclassifies the road labeled as urban regions. And furthermore, these problems happen in less degree in agriculture, in agriculture and vegetation zones. And in this image, the plantation grow land share features with a vegetation area. And for this region, is classified as a vegetation area. Okay. Uh, we focus these works uh, to testing the performance of a CNN model trained with RGB aerial images. That is without additional information. Uh, moreover, the altitude of the image is closer than satellite image. That is image taken from 100 to 300 meters above the ground, um, which represents a challenging task because this image contains more details than satellite, satellite images to to this uh, a high pixel resolution um the computing effort to process an image is reduced and the number of the elements to be classified by using super region or super pixels according to the results our model can predict most of the pixels correctly um or pixel based approach approach produce the salt paper in effect in which is decreased with the use of super pixels and super region. Although uh, the accuracy is similar in the three approaches presented in this work, and um, the use of super pixels and super regions reduce significantly the required time to segment an uh, image. Um, in a future work, we aim to optimize or propose methods to enable online processing and our goal is to carry out the classification during the operation flight, in particular by using small drones. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions. Okay, hey, thank you hey, for hey, your uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, attention. And also, thank you for standing up in the middle of the night because uh, night, because yeah. uh, night, because yeah. night, because <laughs> because it's uh, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, in the middle. Was muted. But... Um, okay, we still have time, I think, for one question here, uh, and then we already have to move to the next presentation. So, um, is there a question here? Uh, Okay, I will pass the microphone to you and I will repeat the question via Zoom that you can also hear the question. One moment. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hi. Okay, there's no echo. Yes, thank you very much for the nice presentation and clear. Uh, I just have two questions out of my curiosity. What are your motivations for considering these four classes and what are the intended application of this work? Okay, did you hear the question? Yes, we heard the question. 
So the question is whether the intended applications for this work, is that correct? And yeah, that's uh, correct. Originally, this was, yeah, okay. Originally, this was um, part of a project where, let's put it this way, the client was interested in doing some assessment of the terrain. They wanted to do a, a sort of auditory where they were interested in measuring uh, the size of the urban area, vegetation, agriculture, and also for the roads. So this was kind of the motivation. And I think I missed the first part because you said you, you had two questions. What is the motiva uh, the the last question was what is the consideration for mot the motivating the four classes? Why need four classes? What's the motivation for that? That that was the last question. Uh, it was that that was the way it was requested. So they were interested in just uh, detecting these four classes. And then again, it was for auditory purposes. So they, they wanted to use a drone to fly over a region and they were interested just in measuring uh, in, in terms of number of pixels, the uh, where, where you had vegetation, where you had urban areas, roads or uh, agriculture terrains as well. And something that I think it was not conveyed properly is that uh, basically in this work we were testing the use of uh, super regions uh, based on super pixels because we wanted to assess um, whether we could speed up the process of classification because if you if you think of very large images um, one of the problems with deep learning is that if you want to use models and then usually these models take uh, small images like uh, 200 times 200 or 150 times 150. But if you capture a high definition image where you have, you know, like the dimensions are thousands times thousands pixels, then the process is going to be slow. Uh, so basically the idea was to do this patch based analysis, but then it, it becomes very slow. And the idea is to then test using these uh, concepts of super pixels, which basically just group uh, similar pixels. And then we test super regions, which group uh, similar super pixels. And basically the idea is that, of course, you speed up the results and uh, in terms of processing time, and then you also get very similar um, accuracy. So I, I hope that is, um, better explain in terms of the purpose of this whole work. Yes, uh, I see that uh, your uh, question has been answered. So I will thank you again because we have to move on to the next presentation. And I will thank already you. introduce uh, Audrey, or, or yeah, maybe uh, first some applause for this uh, presentation. And then we can move on to the next one. So next up is also a presentation presented from uh, Mexico. It's Aldrich Alfredo Cabrera Pons from the Benemerita Universidad Autónoma um, in Puebla. So um, I think Aldrich is in this call. And when you're ready, um, yeah, you can start your presentation. And also thank you for joining in the middle of the night uh, again. Uh, thank you so much. Um, can you see the my screen? And can you hear me? Yes, we can clearly hear uh, hear you and see your slides. So uh, technically, everything is uh, okay. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Cabrera-Ponce, a PhD student at WAP in Computer Science. I am going to present you my work entitled Multi multimodal continuous learning for camera localization from aerial images. As part of content, I will briefly mention an introduction about the problem we want to attack using deep learning and continuous learning. The methodology used for developing this work, the experiment performing with our approach and the results obtained from them. Finally, I will end with a conclusion as well as the future work we are developing. 
So first, camera localization is a well topic in many areas of you know, computer vision from the problem of obtaining the position within a scenario using visual information extracted from the captured images. In robotics, in combination with ground and aerial platforms, is one of the main functions to relocate a robot by estimate the position as well as navigation tasks. Some of the best known methods are feature matching, visual odometry, a slant system, and in research years, they use the, the deep learning methods with learning traditional functions. The later using a convolutional convolutional neural network have helped to obtain the pos position of the cameras through training data set whose uh, images are labeled with the pose from which it was captured. PostNet is one of the most popular words that have to attack this problem. However, there is a problem with this method. The first is that they assume that a no scenario uh, for the creation of the data set. The loss of the localization while navigate is another problem. And finally, the training can can take a long time to obtain the learning model spinning a, a lot of computational processing. Therefore, the proposed solution is to create a multimodal system for the task of localized camera using learning segments and convolutional neural networks and continual learning methodology. Um, for this approach, we also present a keyframe searching that we allows, allow us to find the correspondences between the current image and the keyframe. Thus, we will use the model corresponding to to, to that segment scenario. We also present a deep learning method based on the Latin replay of the data. This is the is because with a continual learning data is planning incrementally. For example, is a, we had a data, the first data, and then we plan the data to to create and generate the model. However, when new data arrive this model and this information uh, will lose the continual learning try to 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 recover and avoid the catastrophe forgetting of the previous the previous data for that the the new information try to to update the model using the the new information and the old ones so in this sense, continual learning is about learning information over time without forgetting previous knowledge in such a way that is does, doesn't now create a, a big data set like traditional training. The continual learning use new data comes one by one and incrementally training by one by, by one the, the data in mini batches on a small small set and for all for a small set the the model is great and good date with with weights of the previous data and the current ones for our methodology we perform perform it into a split step the first step consists in the generation of the data in many batches we coordinate information time from the gps sensor the second step is the continual learning of the of this data into mini batches to update the model when new information with new mini batches created and finally the evaluation is performed using the keyframe searching based on the color histogram of the images for the data set info the generation we perform the this generation in four scenarios to capture the images and the gps coordinates converted into methods to have a better handling of the pose, the camera poses. The acquired images are divided into mini batches with a number of images per mini batch, where the label is represented by index. And this index will represent a class of the trajectory segment with which the mini batch was created. For a better handling of the data, we merge the, the poses on 
the, the segment poses on average to have a mean flight coordinate. Thus, a class will represent the mean coordinate of the trajectory segment. And in the table one, we present uh, the indices that represent the labels for the classes and the mean flight coordinates that is the merge of the several coordinates captured in, by the run into the images. So this table is the representation of the labels represented the, the indices and the mean flight coordinates for, for the classes. For continuous learning, it consists of the method called the regressive model using a mobile net architecture. This method performs a Latin replay of the important data from the previous mini batches in external memory. Uh, some important aspect of this method is to store the import weights in a Latin replay layer. We define the pooling seats layer in the Latin replay. So when the first mini batch arrives, we save the the patterns in the in this Latin layer, and then when new one mini batches arrive, we slow down the the learning in the lower layers, and we use only the patterns in the Latin plane and the, the learning in the in the layer in the upper layer three. The histogram in, that we create. Uh, first, we change the VHR to H HSV color space and define a number of bins for the each color channel. However, it is possible that histogram looks like a few frames that don't below it. So we decide to split the histogram calculation into five regions of the images. And then with the, com the comparison, the current image with the key frame, uh, we use the, the G square metric. In this way, for each color image, we calculate the color histogram to find the corresponding difference and load the model belonging to, the, to that legend of the trajectory. For the experimental setup, we perform the experiment for the camera optimization fields. First, we evaluate the key frame searching. Then we evaluate the data set testing with a simple model and key frame searching and the multimodal approach. As a result of the first and second experiment, we obtain the following tables. In the first, we present the search of the evaluation data set of the first trajectory using different histogram bins. The third one, the third one is the vendor performance. For the second experiment, we use the, the second model consisting in use the single learning model to evaluate the, the testing data set. Or of each trajectory obtaining the following results and the speed of the, process, of the processing. Finally, in the last evaluation, we use the multimodal approach with the keyframe searching in the testing trajectories. And we also compare the accuracy result with the RSLAN2 and use and we use the glute meet square error method for a better appreciation of the obtaining results. As we can see, especially in the uh, trajectory one, or land to fails to localize the, the camera. So we are going to uh, argue that is because the scenario is hard to obtain the camera localization even with the slant system. In other trajectories, we had that our method is on par with our slant two, trajectory two or three, and we we win the trajectory four in accuracy and processing speed. We show we show a, a representative video. <clears throat> Firstly, of that we perform the continual learning while generating the mini batches with images of the area and GPS information converted into methods. So in the video we can see how we create the, the classes divided in folders called S1, O1, O2, O3 and the images capture. For the mini batches create, create, creation, we merge two or more classes of the, the of the classes. And when the first mini batch is created, the continuous learning 
method starts to, to claim. Immediately, immediately after the mini batch is created, the network starts claiming incrementally. In this way, will the other mini batches are be, being created, the network will learn them. Once the, the network finishes planning, the last mini batch will start with the evaluation of the multimodal system. Okay, and evaluation. So if the keyframe corresponds to the current image and the camera, it returns a descriptor indicating which image is, and therefore we load the model corresponding to the segment of the territory. And in this way, we evaluate all the images by, by loading the corresponding models using the, the color histogram for the keyframe searching and the current image searching. So this, we presented the, the frames per second uh, and the accuracy. Finally, in conclusion, we present a continual the camera approach using a searching descriptor based on the color histogram of the images. The Latin replay method keeps the previous data of the mini batches avoiding the catastrophic forgetting of the, of the data. Um, for future work, we want to change the visual descriptor to a more efficient one. And we plan to use the Latin replay method, the continual learning method, in a regression architecture instead of a classification architecture. Um, thank you for your attention and any questions. Okay, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation, uh, Aldrich. Um, yeah, we're running a little bit behind the schedule, so there's time for one small question. Um, so does someone have a small question? Otherwise, I might have uh, one for my, uh, myself then. Um, so for example, uh, how many, much fly data, for example, do you need in, in, in certain area to, to apply this uh, localization on your drone? I mean, like if you're a company flying like at several locations, you first need like base data to train your network. So how much fly do you first need to perform to really be able to, to localize your drone? Um, okay, <laughs> sorry, can you repeat the... Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, I think the question is um, how much or how many images do you need uh, for the network to learn yes, the position? Uh, yes. Okay, so... So after how many images the okay. network can begin to predict position? Go ahead, Aldrich. Okay. Okay. Uh, to cluster to to plan in the the architecture for in context and continual learning, there is no amount of images. So in this case, we use uh, a random amount of images for for the mini batches. For example, in the first trajectory, in the first area, we use 99 images with data augmentation to training. So with that amount, the, the continual learning is, is to be able to, to predict or to obtain the, the classification results in the finally, in the finally model. So it's, it's a an advantage of the continual learning to, to start playing uh, a no specific amount of images. So yeah, okay. So if I can complement, basically, um, the quality of the of your prediction is going to depend upon the number of images. But the advantage of this concept of continual learning is that basically you are trying to learn a model online. So you can start even with two or three images, but then of course your accuracy is not going to be very good. Or, um, so the idea is to give 
a window of images. And in this case, as Aldrich is saying, perhaps a hundred of images would be enough for the first model. So the idea here with this work is that rather than having a single model being learned continuously, we want to learn several models. And in this case, it is equivalent or very similar to what people do in Visual Slam for sub mapping. So where you have a map partition with several small maps. So I, I hope that helps to answer the question. Yes, that did uh, answer my question. Uh, I will, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you again for this uh, nice presentation. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So then we'll already start announcing the final presentation in the deep learning session. Uh, that presentation will be given by Laticia Oyuku, and she is also from the uh, Benemerita Universidad Autónoma from uh, Mexico in Puebla. Um, so I think Laticia is already here in the Zoom call. Um, so yeah, if you can start sharing your slides and do some uh, sound check, and I can verify that everything uh, works fine here. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. And uh, yeah, thank you also uh, for joining uh, uh, and giving your presentation remotely uh, at this time. <laughs> okay. Hello again. So I, I I present I will present the leveraging of neural pilot by automatic gain tuning using gate detection for autonomous run racing. Okay, uh, autonomous drone racing has pushed to develop of artificial pilots that enable a drone to fly autonomously on a racetrack. And recent resolution for autonomous drone racing have proposed to use the approach involving path planning, control, trajectory tracking, and via model predictive control, and even reinforcement learning to find the optimal trajectories and predict the control signals to navigate in a racetrack as fast as possible. And some of these approaches have been successful in demonstrating performance comparable to a human pilot. Uh, in this research, we explored a more reactive, reactive strategy where no drone position on a racetrack knowledge in, is available to the artificial pilot. Instead, the leader is training to regress an instantaneous flight signals from an image captured with a camera on the on board the drone. In our previous work, the pilot, we present an artificial pilot based on a convolutional neural networks that includes, includes temporal information for flight signal estimation by using six image equal sample in one second. In this case, we use, we refresh every five image per second. And this image from a single image mosaic are associated with the corresponding flight signal, in this case, roll pitch row and altitude. And we implement uh, a smooth signal to, to, to reduce the jolts and oscillatory behaviors. So the pilot learns learn seven basic movements front, backwards, left, right, up, down, and rotation to left and to the right. And we in, in this work, we separate for three specialized models. And the architecture of, of, of the pilot compares three parallel branches to infer roll and pitch together, but geo and altitude separately. And each branch has a fourth convolutional lawyers with three inception models one fully connected lawyer and a regressor lawyer at the end. Although uh, the pilot have, well, although the pilot can get a drone on a racetrack have deficiency, for example, the outputs require a noise filter to smooth out peaks in, in the flight signals. The, this noise signal produces a jolts and oscillatory behavior. And if we change the platform, uh, for example, the, the vivo, the estimated flight signal are correct regarding what the flight signal has to be sent to the drone, but with the incorrect proportion of the signal of the flight signal. And there are two options to solve this. The one is tuning of set a constant uh, that act as that act as a gain to improve the performance of the artificial pilot, and two, providing more examples to the training set 
However, did it, it would involve the generation of large amount of data and a long training times. So we propose uh, they use the gate detection to refine these gains, and we believe this step is more feasible and faster than collecting a new data set and training the network since the only problem is the, the proportion of signed value. So, okay, we define the first case by using the gate detection area and we, we obtain the gain for pitch as depending on the area. So the, this, this gain is higher value when the, the detection area is smaller and therefore the vehicle flies faster towards to the gates and decreases the value of the, this gain when the area increase. So for the second condition in this case, in the case one, it's where the deep pilot model doesn't not correctly the, sorry. The second condition uh, affects to the value when the centroid of the of the gates uh, shows the second image in the case one. It's it's center, so we increase the value to to twice. In the second case, it's that where the deep pilot model doesn't not correctly provide the the roll signal when the gates is too close, and to the orientation or ori horizontal image age, even the gate is inside in the viewing area, but the pilot indicates that value in roll, it's equal to zero. And for this reason, we design the following rule. When the, the centroid is gate, with the centroid of the gate is at the edge of the image, the value of, of, of this signal for roll, we replace by one or by, or a negative value, depending on the which age the gate was exposed. So let me show the video. So in this video shows the, the deep pilot without gains. It's only used the noise filter. And this case in the first, the, in the first gate crosses successfully, but the second gate is evaded and in the in the following, it's missing the, the track and didn't complete the, the race. Okay, so uh, for the case three, when oscillatory behaviors is present when, when the drone is in front of the gate, we define this gain condition to to depend the distance of the pixels, pixels between the centroid of the detection and the center of the images. And this distance is normalized of the hull of the image width. And this is the, now, uh, now the, this strategy helps to reduce the roll signal provided by the pilot and, and reduce the oscillatory behavior. And the last case is to, to slow rotation when the gates are skewed as shows the figure in the case four, uh, and show the figure in the case four, and we obtain the value of the the gain for for flight command co respect to to Joe, depending on the width of the bounding box detection, and which is subtract from one and normalized by the height to obtain the inverse ratio uh, to width. We perform some experiments in the platform, in a new platform with a simulator rotors S with people from Parro. And we use the model training on the same track with the aerodrome platform on the Tomb Simulator. And, and, and therefore, we we, if we perform several flight experiments. Uh, we found a set of fixed winds, which, which after, let me show the video, multiplied by flight signal estimated by the pilot and produce a reasonable performance. 
And this is the drone managed to cross almost all the gates through, although it always it hit or few outside some gates. So you can you can show you can note this behavior oscillatory at the front of the gate, and we use the pilot with manually set gains. So the in this experiment, the drone almost complete the racetrack, but missing the the gate five. Okay. So the last experiment with the pilot with automatic gain tuning using the gate detection, we have um, a better performance and also it's more faster than the previous experiments. And, and you cannot, it's not oscillatory behavior, it's more faster and reacts more effectively. The effectiveness in, of the case three is notice, noticeable along the, the track since the, the trajectory doesn't not show large oscillation compared to the performance with the pilot and fixed gates. And in the case four is activated in the gates eight, uh, 40, is the 14 and 18. As previous gates are closed, exhibiting the, the skew view. So the the 80 gate is, is the following. And you can view, you can see the, the skew view of the gate. So the drone completes the, the racetrack without missing uh, any gate. So these experiments, the most that our proposal works effectively uh, under this situation. Additionally, We show a comparison of these trajectories, and you can see the, the red lines corresponds to the pilot without gains. The green, green lines corresponds to the pilot with manual set gains. And finally, the blue, the blue trajectory corresponds to the pilot with automatic gains using tuning, gain tuning using gate detection. Uh, you know that green, green trajectory is have a very oscillatory behavior and incomplete lab, uh, missing two gates, also missing the five, uh, the five gate. And the trajectory blue, or proposed, are more effective and faster. Additionally, we implement a test with dynamic movements. So along the racetrack, we move the gates aleatory to demonstrate that all propose is feasible to, to, to complete the racetrack without, without, uh, without problems. In this case, we, we know the reaction to, to replace the signal that the, the center of the gates are or it are in the edge of the images. Okay. The trajectory shows in, in the images corresponds to a 10 flights and also a 18 consecutive flights. Know that it's a repetitive uh, trajectories, and we know that uh, this, this behavior is interesting because the drones have a move dense specifically and then replace the trajectory every, every lap. Finally, as conclusion, 
Uh, we have present an automatic gain tuning approach for neural pilot, called uh, deep pilot, uh, developed for autonomous drone racing, and the pilot estimates like signals to enable the drone to cross the gates in a racetrack. However, this estimated flight signal should be noise filters to, to the output values to smooth the peaks and flight and, and these flight signals produce an oscillatory behavior and jumps. And therefore, in this work, we propose using the gate detection to tune such gains automatically. And our experiments is sim in simulation have shown that our proposed approach archives better results than the original pilot in a large racetrack with 18 gates randomly placed with variation in orientation and height. And for future work, we will carry out and experiments in real scenarios and also discovering effective waypoints for autonomous drone racing. So we complement this, this work with with a module to discover the blind spot of the gates, to generate a set of waypoints and then replace it to reproduce it with a waypoint controller or trajectory generation. So the system, uh, it's able to, to, to detect if one point is, 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 is double, double recorded. So if it is, is a if it, it is the case, the system removes them, the, the list of the waypoints. Okay. So uh, the drones records the, all the waypoints by a waypoint controller. So it's a, a, new, pro, a new approach to, to discover the, the trajectory in a, in a racetrack for autonomous drone racing. Okay, uh, Leticia, I think that okay. concludes your presentation. Uh, um, so yeah, thank you uh, also for your presentation. Um, um, yeah, we're uh, running a little bit behind of schedule, but I will still give the opportunity to the audience to still ask uh, one question. Uh, so, does someone has a question uh, uh, for Leticia? Maybe I have some question then. Um, the, like, what kind of problems do you foresee when you uh, will apply this algorithm on like a real drone? Because now I saw a lot of simulations. But what do you think that will change with respect to the simulation if you apply, yeah, you, your method you explained, like on a real platform? Yeah. Uh, well, I think this this approach will will will. Mm, we can use in a real platform because the deep pilot learns seven movements con respect to the gate. So we complement this gate detection to correct this, this behavior to guide the drone into a racetrack. So the, the main problem in this case is the fine tuning to the gains to, to improve these signals provided by the pilot. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think if I can uh, complement as well with that, uh, the, the main issue is the um, onboard processing because we require to do, uh, to use deep learning or these neural networks. So for that, you require um, an NVIDIA uh, computer board. So, um, I mean, nowadays that is not an issue, but um, we require that kind of hardware. And also the, the fact that if you are, in a real environment, then maybe the drone needs to fly slowly to learn or to detect these, uh, to discover these points that Oyuki was mentioning at the end. Um, and then, of course, once you have the points, then you can just do trajectory tracking. So, um, in principle, I don't see much of a problem of implementing this in a real platform. Uh, it's just a matter of the strategy that you want to follow regarding the the challenge of autonomous drone racing. Thank you.
Yeah, okay, thank you for answering the qu question. Uh, you, you clearly answered it. Um, okay, that's uh, um, yeah, so we are, uh, yeah, that it will finally conclude the, the session. So I think I will pass the word back to Guido and he will explain what is coming next uh, today. So let's uh, thank uh, the speakers in Mexico again, where it's really in the middle of the night. <laughs> okay, um, we now have lunch, uh, so it's uh, going to be downstairs here. Uh, a warm lunch, uh, I think, uh, should be pretty nice. At one o'clock, we will start uh, the next session, uh, in which all the presenters are uh, physically uh, here. So uh, I would say, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>
to burn out the, the, the extra. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Goethe, yeah. Oh, yeah, let me introduce you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, perfectly on time, almost. So, uh, uh, we're going to start uh, our first session now. And as a session chair, we have uh, Goethe Attenberger who I think uh, you all know uh, quite well, but uh, he's a professor at ANAC. So thank you for sharing this session, uh, Gautier. Okay, so uh, let's welcome to everyone. Uh, we are about to start this uh, session on uh, the uh, control of uh, uh, hybrid transition vehicles, uh, MAVs. Uh, this is also the session known as the INDI session. This is why I got my special T-shirt today. So if any of you is reading something else that the indigo name color, please refer to the flight director, it would smear. <laughs> okay, no, no kidding. Uh, the first presenter today is uh, Denis, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Denis, uh, oh no, okay, sorry, I can't pronounce that. <laughs> Denis van Wingarden. Almost, okay. <laughs> please come in and uh, so please welcome the first presenter. He will be presenting the INDI control of an oblique wing plane uh, with quad plane drone. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you uh, for handing over the word, uh, word uh, Gauche. Yeah, today I will uh, introduce you to a new prototype of drone we developed in the uh, MAV lab in Delft. And it's the, the yeah, and I will also explain the control we applied on this drone. It's the uh, oblique wing quadplane drone, but we also name it just rotating wing drone, and you will see later why uh, we name it like that. Uh, another author is also in this room. That's Bart, and uh, together with him, um, we have done the research on this drone. So today I will first start with the introduction, then I will introduce the drone. I will uh, explain everything about the inner and outer loop controller of the drone and uh, I will show you, show you some experiments and results. So first of all, um, we already have some current solutions of, of drones. For example, uh, we built the Delta Copter a few years ago. It's basically a combination of a helicopter and a fixed wing. And for example, the Nader drone you saw flying yesterday at Falkenberg. It's basically a tail sitter and a multi-rotor combination. Um, those drones run INDI controllers, and we do that because for an IDI controller you don't need like to have a detailed model of your drone. It's just yeah, you just need to know your uh, effectiveness values of your actuators, and without the model of the drone, you can already start prototyping. So we also uh, implement an INDI controller on this uh, rotating wing drone, or the oblique uh, wing quadplane drone. It's also very uh, uh, good for wind gust uh, rejection, as we use directly input from the uh, accelerometer and uh, 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 gyroscope. And actually, you have some downsides of the current solutions because you can see that there's always a big wing sticking out during landing, and this big wing is also like susceptible to wind gusts. And yeah, we want to make a drone that is uh, uh, not that sensible to wind gust and can still land in the box. And there, the oblique wing quad plane comes into play. So, what is the oblique wing quad plane? It's basically a combination of a quadcopter and a fixed wing for which actually the upper part of the drone can rotate, as you see here in this picture. So basically we can align the, 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 the wing with the fuselage, but we can also rotate the wings like out to for forward flight. So if we don't rotate the wing, so that's angle uh, theta, zero degrees means we are in full quad mode, it's a plus quad then, and when we say the screw angle is 90 degrees, then basically the two roll motors in quad are aligned like with the fuselage and they can even help also in producing uh, upward force. 
So the oblique uh, wing quadplane drone has 10 over uh, 10 actuators and it's over actuated uh, because of that. Actually, when we are in pure quad mode, then we are not that much over actuated. But as soon as we have airflow and we have airflow over the aerodynamic services, we have uh, uh, over actuation. So we have a front motor, now the right and the left motor rotate with like the skew angle rotation. The ailerons also rotate with that. Uh, I will come back to that later. So we have uh, four quad motors, two ailerons, a rudder, uh, a uh, vertical uh, elevator. Uh, we have a pusher motor and an actuator to actually um, uh, rotate the, the, the wing and the, the quad arm. So to introduce to, to the INDI inner loop controller, um, um, yeah, basically the INDI uses like uh, is commanding a reference angular acceleration and will calculate the, the, the change in, in command we need to achieve this angular accelerations. For that we need to know control effectiveness, so basically how much control we have to add to achieve an increase in, in angular acceleration. Um, and with that, we can basically calculate the trust values and, and the attitude values. So we have an effectiveness matrix, but as you already saw, our drone can change configuration in flight. So actually, uh, to implement an INDI controller on it, we implemented the control uh, effectiveness scheduling, such that matrix G, the effectiveness matrix, is being updated in flight. And this is being updated based on the skew angle, like if we rotate the wing, some actuators will get a different effectiveness in a different uh, uh, axis. And of course, it also depends on airspeed uh, for the aerodynamic services. So to summarize actually what we found out, the control effectiveness of aerodynamic services scale of course with the airspeed squared for actuators five, seven, uh, five, six, seven, eight. And so the control effectiveness for the hover motors increase slightly with airspeed. We verify this in a wind tunnel. They will, yeah, they, they become a little bit more effective. The roll effectiveness of the ailerons scales with the sinus of the skew angle. So when the ring, wing is aligned with the fuselage, it's not effective at all. But when we skew, skew the wing or to 90 degrees, so to fixed wing mode, they become effective. And of course, here there is also the airspeed squared plays a role in the scaling for this value. Uh, we activate the, the ailerons from 30 degrees because before that there are some non-linearities and from 30 degrees we found out that the ailerons are working. And it's for actuators five and six. And the roll effectiveness of the roll motors scale, uh, so that are basically uh, actuator two and four, scale with the cosinus of um, that uh, of the skew angle um, for roll. So it means it's very effective in roll if you're in quad mode, and not effective at all if we are in in fixed wing mode. Uh, but also when we rotate this uh, uh, the, yeah upper part of the drone. Uh, you can also see that the, the, the center of gravity is located actually in the rotating mechanism that uh, actuators two and four will also become effective in pitch due to a change in uh, a moment arm in the pitch uh, axis. So the roll control of, of the, 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 the hover motors are being deactivated from uh, an angle of 70 degrees as from that uh, point onwards the ailerons will take over fully. And the roll motor, yeah, what I already told the, the motors uh, are two and four. The outer loop controller is also over actuated. We can, for example, achieve forward speed by pitching forward or using the pusher propeller. And the upward force can, for example, be achieved by increasing airspeed, increasing pitch, or just uh, increase the thrust on the, the hover props. Therefore, we added the weightedly square uh, a control. Uh, allocation method to, to be able to control the roll, pitch, uh, the thrust in the body Z direction, so the, 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 for, for the hover props, and for the pusher prop, the, we calculated the thrust value. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the heading is still free, and we just point the heading in the direction such that side slip is minimized. So we have done some experiments with this prototype of drone in a wind tunnel. So we use the uh, TU Delft Open Jet facility, which is basically 
huge wind tunnel and you have a test section of two by two meters. And we uh, put the drone in the test, test section and we put a safety rope on top of the drone. But actually during the test, we released the, 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 the tension from this rope. So yeah, to, to mimic the real flying characteristics of this drone as there was no tension on, the, on this rope, but that was purely for safety there. And we tested uh, and investigated how to transition. Can already explain you when the wind speed is low, you want to be in quad mode. And when wind speed increases, you actually want to rotate the wing to generate lift with the wing and also put more control on the ailerons instead of your roll motors. So you're shifting basically the control from a set of actuators to the other one gradually with increasing airspeed and increasing skew angle. So I want you to, sh to show you some data of some successful transitions in the wind tunnel. Left you see in a plot in airspeed. We went up to, uh, in, in this test, to 70 meters per second. And you can see uh, in the right plot um, the rotation angle uh, of the wing. So you can actually see that we swept from zero degrees, so quad mode to full fixed wing mode. And you can also see that the airspeed already reached 16 meters per second, but yeah, there is some lag in the mechanism of rotating the wing, so um, that takes a little bit longer. At the other side, you can see that we reduced the airspeed, um, I think uh, the, uh, from 10 meters per second, the wing will rotate back. And you can also see that in the plot that the shape kind of matches with the airspeed. Uh, Another interesting plot is uh, looking at the, the uh, thrust at the left side. The orange uh, line is the thrust of the pusher motor. The blue line is the, the thrust of the hover props. And you can see uh, actually um, when we are fully transitioned that the hover props are switched off as the thrust is zero there. But another interesting thing is we reduced the, the airspeed to 10 meters per second. And actually you can see um, that at thi in this case, even in forward flight with a skew angle of 90 degrees, you already have 30% of thrust on your hover motor. So this means that with this platform in, in full fixed wing configuration, we can add extra lift using the hover props. So we can fly below the, the stall speed. Here you see left uh, some plots of the attitude and right the position accuracy. So actually we want to, to keep everything at a single line, which is the reference of the wind tunnel. And you can see two uh, spots in this plot where the drone is a little bit unstable. This is around 8 meters per second. And we found out actually um, that the, the, the tail, the, the, the elevator is saturated at this point. And this is because the hover motors basically uh, push airflow down. And there is a downwards flow over the, the elevator. So that still needs to be uh, improved. So I will show you one uh, video of a successful transition. Here you see the drone underneath in the wind tunnel, where we are now going to switch on the wind. The drone is hovering at this moment, and you can see at a, a little bit of toilet paper at the left side that the wind is uh, flowing, and you can already see that the wing is rotating now. Also, have a look at the hover motors. You see them switching off at some point. Yeah, now they're switched off. And we now have about 17 meters per second airflow. And the drone is still staying within the, the wind tunnel section of 2 by 2 meters. So the position is really accurate uh, during this test. So we also lower the wind speed again. And then it transitions back to hover flight. Here you see the little bit of the unstable region around 8 meters per second. And here it becomes more stable again. And here we are back in hover flight again. So to conclude this presentation, uh, the control, yeah, we, we um, proved that the, the, the controller is feasible for the new prototype of drone and that we successfully implemented uh, the controller on this. And for the future work, uh, yeah, we have to overcome this pitch saturation where you have still like the, the, the uh, region where you see some fluctuations in attitude and position. And uh, we have to continue performing real outdoor tests. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for this uh, very uh, original design. Do we have some uh, questions? Oh, yeah, a few. Okay, uh, Denise, thanks for the nice presentation and uh, congrats on the nice work. 
Uh, I'm quite impressed to see this transitioning in the Ogen wind, tun wind tunnel because uh, I ran some experience there myself with uh, Delphi, which is yeah like an order of magnitude or even smaller vehicle. Uh, and especially like the first flies are quite challenging because yeah, you really need to be very accurate with your position control or well, yeah. And so I was wondering how did you do the first flies? How did you tune the controllers? Was that like based on simulations or did it require a lot of trial and error? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. So how we started the first experiments was basically trial and error. We first uh, tested without wind, just hovering added more wind. Uh, actually, we first had a manual slider to basically uh, try different wing positions. And then during some airspeed, we swept over the wing, uh, over the screw angles, and see at what point it became instable. So I think this data generation costed some weeks. And at the end, we could make a plot like, ah, the transition should go through those uh, airspeeds with this screw angle. Um, so yeah, it was just by trail and error and yeah, write down every setting we used and, and see how stable the platform uh, stays. Okay, thanks. Maybe a very short question that you only need to answer with one figure. Um, in hover mode, what is the percentage of the thrust by the two uh, motors on the fuselage and how much of the wing? Because the fuselage motors are partly covered by the wing. Uh, I think for for the experience we did, we tuned them uh, we tuned them in such a way that they all had equal trust, and that was about for this prototype around the sixty percent. How do you um, see the chance of overcoming the the pitch saturation? So, what can there be as what strategy you think about there? Uh, for example, uh, yeah, thank you for for, for this question. Um, yeah, we're already thinking about that. So, uh, what you actually want to do to overcome this pitch saturation, there are multiple options you can do. You can, for example, extend the tail backwards such that it's not that much in the downward airflow, and you have a bigger moment arm uh, of the tail. Can make the whole tail, uh, yeah, basically the tilting. But you can also, for example, come up with a tilting uh, pusher prop uh, at the back to basically yeah, also compensate for this with, with the pusher prop. So there are multiple options that, that still can be tried and, and thought of to overcome this uh, pitch saturation. OK. So thank you very much. Please uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Julian Muller. He will present the miniaturization and control of uh, unmanned uh, tilt-wing aircrafts. Yes. All right. So my name is Julian Müller, and uh, today I'm going to talk about this little aircraft you can see in front of me, and to be more specific about the miniaturization and control of an unmanned tilting aircraft. So besides motivation and summary, my talk will split up into three main parts. First, the miniaturization of the tilting aircraft, then the control of the tilting aircraft, and a validation. The main motivation for my, motiv for my um, work was a feasibility study about how far can a tilt wing be miniaturized. Its use case is as a demonstrator, so sh it should be applicable in small areas, for example lecture halls, and have a reduced injury, injury potential. Additionally, we wanted to expand the range of application for INDI control, uh, especially for tilt wings with low mass inertia, and investigate if there's uh, more detailed model of the controllability is required, and if the assumptions of INDI are still valid. Let's begin with the miniaturization of the tilting aircraft. Starting point for the miniaturization was the existing aircraft Mavericks with the design state of 2018, which was developed as at our university. 
And from there, we derived the job level aircraft requirements for the miniaturized aircraft, which we call Edifix. And it's a wingspan of less than five meters, a mass of less than 200 gram, a minimum aerodynamic flight speed of less than six meters per second, and a flight duration of over five minutes. But most importantly, we wanted to conserve all the key functions of Mavericks, which means we wanted to use the same control devices and especially a tiltable wing about the uh, wing quarter line. Yes, for further design, the aircraft was split up into four different um, sub-assemblies. First, the propulsion system, the fuselage, the wing and the tail. Unfortunately, I cannot go into the detail for every part of the construction, but I will uh, highlight some key features. First, the fuselage. We chose a 2D structure, which, is, um, which suffices to absorb the mainly attacking two-dimensional forces. It's easy accessible from both sides, and it can be manufactured in one piece. The consequence of the miniaturization is that we have a very small installation space, so we had problems with uh, electromagnetic interference, especially between the high current harness and the signal tra transmission harness. Our solution was to apply uh, electromagnetic shielding fleece on one side of the fuselage, and hereby we could separate both harnesses and reduce the disturbed signal strength by up to 100 decibels, which pretty much solved all of our um, EMC problems. The dimensioning of the wing was realized with an element-based simulation in Simulink, in contrast to Conventional design tools, it has the advantage that it can consider tilting specific properties like the tiltable wing and thrust vector and the downwash behind the propellers. And at a design speed of six meters per second and an angle of attack of eight degrees, we simulated a wing area of 0.5 square meters to be um, sufficient to generate enough lift, which is one fifth to that of Mavericks. The wingspan we set to five meters, which fully utilizes the um, first top-level aircraft requirement and um, gives us a little bit more efficient lift distribution. As for this construction, the wing is CNC emitted from polystyrene rigid, rigid foam um, in a semi-shell design with integrated rib structure to maximize the weight reduction and is reinforced with a, a four millimeter carbon fiber tube uh, to have enough stability against the uh, aerodynamic attacking forces and it makes the initiation of the uh, tilt moment uh, much easier. The total mass of Edifix amounts to uh, 175 grams, which fulfills the second top-level aircraft requirement, and it's uh, one-tenth to that of Mavericks. The main contributors are the fuselage with 110 grams, the wing and the main motors with 50 grams, and the tail and the tail motor with 15 grams, let me point out here that most of the weight comes from um, the electronic components, which we couldn't miniaturize much further, highlighted in red, whereas the structural weight is very low due to, due to the um, consequent uh, lightweight construction. Let's continue with the control of the miniaturized aircraft. Analog to Mavericks, we used um, INDI for the attitude control, which is a control of the angular accelerations. It's very robust against uncertainties in the model of the controllabilities B and the actuator dynamics A, which are highlighted in green. But a better model obviously leads to a higher control quality. For over-actuated systems, the B matrix is um, non-quadratic, so the side inverse has to be used. Alternatively, the optimization problem can be solved with an active set method, which we call allocator, and it calculates the optimum changes in control input, depending on the current control input, the control deviation, and the controllability matrix, including weightings for the control inputs and the consideration of control device limits. As just mentioned, the control quality benefits from a good controllability model. So for Mavericks, the distance between the tilt joint and the center of gravity was very small and therefore was neglected in the um, controller. But for Edifix, the center of gravity is much further back. Th this leads to a pitchability of the main motors, which equals to 33% of that of the tail motor in hover flight. So this controllability is no more negligible. 
and can be described with this equation. And it's the um, derivative of the motor thrust with respect to the control input and uh, a lever arm HM, I highlighted in red on the right side, and it's basically just a geometric function. The easiest way to consider this uh, controllability is by expanding the controllability matrix B. This leads to more control inputs for the pitch control, and also different combinations of the allocator weightings may be possible. Another way is uh, to consider it as a disturbing effect. So the control abilities are divided into uh, main abilities and disturbing abilities, and the compensation can be done after the allocator. So the additional tail motor thrust UT at is calculated by the change of uh, thrust produced from the main motors by this function you can see there. So this means that no adjust adjustments of the allocator ratings are necessary. But this solution is not no more optimal because it bypasses the allocator, but it can serve as a comparison to the compensation with the expand bead matrix. Let's continue with the validation. For the validation of the pitch compensation, we applied load multiples of 0.75 to the aircraft, and in hover flight, without compensation, we experienced um, control deviation of up to 40 degrees, whereas with compensation, we could reduce it um, to less than five degrees with both um, variants I just explained earlier. In aerodynamic flight, however, we almost didn't experience any control deviation without compensation, but overcompensated the effect with the compensation. So we need to take a closer look to the main con motor controllability. If you give a step to the thrust signal, we also um, obtain an additional thrust due to the additional downwash from the main motors with the force FA at and a lever arm HA at, which uh, induces a moment. This moment amplifies the pitchability in hover flight, but reduces the pitchability in aerodynamic flight. And a change of sign is at about um, a tilt angle of 50 degrees. This means in aerodynamic flight, both effects have to be considered to avoid the deterioration of the motor model. However, it's quite difficult to determine the exact quantity of the force and the lever arm. So we decided to do a trade-off and just apply the pitch compensation when the effects have the same sign, which is between uh, 50 and 90 degrees tilt angle. So there, we guarantee to, con con to improve the controllability model. For the validation of the attitude controller, we analyzed the step response for the attitude angles. We experience very good control quality and very stable behavior, and it's very compar comparable to Mavericks. So not much to say about that. We did the same in um, aerodynamic flight and um, gave isolated steps of the attitude angles to the system. And in roll and pitch, we have approximately the same behavior as above with a slight overshoot. overshoot. However, in the yaw rate command, we didn't reach the commanded yaw rate after five seconds, whereas the redu reduction happened in like 0.5 seconds. So we think that there's a counteracting moment which pre prevents build-up of the yaw rate, but not the reduction of the yaw rate. If you take a closer look at the isolated yaw motion, we see that over time a slip angle builds up, which induces um, yaw moment um, due to the um, vertical stabilizer. For I and the eye, slowly changing aerodynamic uh, effects do not have to be considered due to uh, time scale separation. But in this case, we have a significant, um, a significant <laughs> a significantly higher uh, change in momentum. And if you compare it to the magnitude of the commanded um, moment change due to the overcoming of the mass inertia, we see that it's almost the same size. To verify that, we increase the um, mass inertia of the aircraft in the simulation so that it fits the proportion 
of mass inertia and your attenuation of Mavericks and we achieved the, top, uh, the bottom right um, control behavior for the yaw um, rate, which is much better. So we think that this strongly supports the idea that the yaw attenuation is responsible for the lack in response behavior for the uh, yaw rate. However, the determination of the slip angle is accompanied with much more complexity and system mass. And we think that the consideration of this, is, this effect is not essential for slip angle free flight, which is almost always the case. And I'll come back to this later. Now I'm going to show you a short flight video of one of the first flights. Of course, EDFX is made for indoor applications, but safety first. So we did it on an airfield. It was quite harsh conditions like three to four meters per second, wind, and yeah, let's, let's have a look. Yeah, here you see the takeoff with a very high angle, and with a high tilt angle, very stable in the air. It's manually flown, so you can, can see a little bit of shakiness in the transition. Yeah, now close flyby, where you can see all actuators working. You can also see the wind turbines in the back, they are turning quite fast and you can also hear the wind. And now the landing again at a high um, tilt angle. A little go round because I was scared. <laughs> and touchdown. <laughs> Yes, just let's have a quick look at the flight data. Um, the control deviation in roll and pitch axis during this flight was very, very good, except of the turns. We don't know exactly why this is, but we think it may be two imperfect turns because it was a manually flown flight, and also it may be due to the harsh conditions and um, potential cross flow to the aircraft. However, we managed to achieve your rates of up to 40 degrees per second. So the previously done neck leg of the yaw attenuation is acceptable for our aircraft if we want to fly in a mostly slip-free um, angle. Last but not least, a quick overview over the flight performance. We managed to hover for about five minutes with this little aircraft, which was fulfills the third aircraft requirement. Power consumption is up at about 50 watt. In aerodynamic flight, this obviously went up to 10 minutes and the power consumption went down to 25 watts. Um, the takeoff weight is uh, 175 gram, but it can also carry uh, astonishing much uh, payload, like 75 grams, which amounts to a maximum takeoff weight of 250 grams. If you take a look at the last part of the flight, I highlighted in red the um, uh, the design speed, um, which is six meters per second, and this could be also achieved during this flight and fulfills our last top level aircraft requirement. Let's give you a quick summary of what we did. We miniaturized a tilting aircraft and we reduced the size to one third, the mass to one tenth, and the ring area to one fifth to that um, of Mavericks. We implemented an, an attitude control based on INDI and improved the main motor model and analyzed the yaw attenuation in aerodynamics flights. The validation was done with uh, simulations and flight tests. And in future work, we will improve um, the flight behavior of uh, EDFIX, but most importantly, we want to achieve a higher degree of optimization. So the next step will be finding and implementing a lightweight position determination system in GPS denied areas. I've been told that we are allowed to fly in the room uh, next to this in the break. So if you have any questions, you can ask them right now or maybe later. But until then, well, thank you for your attention. Question already. <laughs> I have, <clears throat> thank you for your interesting work and presentation. Uh, I have a question about the aerodynamic minimum speed. The Maverick has a minimum speed, I think, of about 12 meters per second. Um, 
when I calculated on the top of my head with the figures I saw, the uh, surface area of this uh, model is about one-tenth of the uh, maverick, and the weight is also one-tenth, so the surface loading is about the same. How can you achieve then six meter per second on this model? Mm, I think actually the, um, the, the wing was reduced by one-fifth, uh, and the mass by one-tenth, so this gives us uh, additional lift. And um, also the drag of the aircraft is immensely high. So we have a much higher relative uh, motor thrust signal during the uh, aerodynamic flight. And we believe that the main motors due to the downwash also increase the lift on our vertical, um, on, on, on our wing. And therefore we generate uh, more lift. Additionally, the angle of attack is quite high with eight degrees. So this all adds up, <laughs> and um, obviously it uh, achieves the th uh, six meters per second, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sh short question or no questions? No questions. So again, you will have the opportunity to ask more questions and to have the live demo at the, at the break in the room next to this one. So thank you, Julian, please. Uh, the next presenter will be Daniel Schatten, and uh, the, the presentation will be on the attitude control of a tilt-wing aircraft under tail actuator failures. Okay, we have the video feedback. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. I'm going to talk about uh, the attitude control of a uh, tilt wing aircraft and uh, tail actuator failures. Well, what's the motivation for this, uh, for the, our work? The key idea is how can we reduce the hardware redundancy by using a software controller design. The goal is for here, for example, is to increase the safety of unmanned vehicle systems without increasing system mass or, uh, yeah, and therefore increase the flight time or payload capabilities. This work was performed on the aircraft Mavericks. Here, you, as you can already see and already saw flying yesterday, it has the special ability to hover in flight, and for fast forward fly, we can transition the wing down and fly like a normal aircraft. And just to give you some key features, we have a, max, a takeoff weight of approximately, approximately 1.8 kilograms, a wingspan of roughly one and a half meters, and a minimum aerodynamics airspeed of 11 meters per second. And our normal cruising uh, airspeed is at around 15 meters per second. Our aircraft is actuated in hover flight with asymmetric thrust as roll control, uh, tail rotor is used for pitching, and our ailerons are used for joint control. Our aerodynamic flight is achieved by using asymmetric, uh, asymmetric thrust as yaw control, uh, ailerons are used for roll, and elevator is used for pitching control. Think about the uh, scenario you are in a hover flight, for example, you are trying to fly over a person or a crowd of people, or just simple buildings or an urban area. And then your tail rotor failure, uh, you have a tail rotor failure. Mainly you just have three yeah, big strategies which you can adapt. Mainly it's to adapt mission planning. For example, you say, we're not that the failure safe in this kind of situation, so we are trying to avoid the situation. By, for let's say, let's say we're not flying above a crowd of people or buildings. This is not a very feasible approach because you're losing mission capabilities in this case. Strategy two might be 
for example, to increase the hardware redundancy by, for example, in our case, we could put a coaxial tail rotor on our system or, which is more common nowadays, put a parachute on our system. But both have their downsides, for example, um, yeah, a, a coaxial tail rotor increases the system mass while we don't really need it. And to be honest, in 99% you don't need a second motor for the same pitching authority, for example, and therefore you have this additional mass and you lose uh, hovering time. And another downside for this configuration, for example, is the reduced prof propeller efficiency. The third strategy uh, which, which, which we could employ is, for example, uh, controller-based redundancy. Which, what is meant by the controller-based redundancy? Uh, the, the main goal for this concept is that during a tail rotor failure, our aircraft mavericks stabilize as a flying wing while minimizing height loss. We, by, we achieved this by just using our tilt angle sigma, which is uh, from the uh, aircraft longitudinal fuselage to the, well, uh, to the yeah, angle of the main wing. While the main wing is uh, used for uh, control and pitch and uh, in combination with our thrust. During this relative hard maneuver, uh, our center of gravity swings beneath the wing pivot point, and now we're trying to stabilize as in this mode. How can we achieve this? First of all, let's look at what's our control strategy and especially how does our pl airplane plant look like. It's derived in an aerodynamic model, a six degree of motion model, and an actuator model. First of all, let's look at the motion model. If we rotate our uh, center of gravity below our uh, wing, um, wing pivot point, or better said, wing pivot point rotates above our COG. We are in a rotating frame, so we have to use translation and a rotational uh, equation of motions. Our translational accelerations are modeled, uh, so um, we're taking into account, for example, motor thrust, uh, our grav gravitational effects, and our aerodynamic uh, forces acting on our aircraft. For rotational accelerations, Similar to our uh, translation accelerations, we're using, uh, especially taking, uh, looking at our uh, axis in the spanwise, um, span we are using a model where the motor uses a pitching moment, or we have a servo, and we have aerodynamic moments acting on our aircraft. The moments are just plain geometric uh, equations, taking into consideration our wing tilt angle and our actual our mode of thrust. Like I already said, we are, uh, move, we are rotating our uh, plane around our COG and we are using a servo to move our wing in relation to our COG. So we are employing a moment on our wing which also acts on our um, center of gravity, so we have to account for this as well. We are doing this by using a simple plate model uh, which employs, yeah, for example, the normal aerodynamic um, equations with um, polars, for example, and our uh, air wing inertia. Our aerodynamic model, considering the entire plane, we divide our plane in elements, and every element has its own aerodynamic model, for example. For example, you take a polar of, CA, uh, of a lift and drag, and you use the local aerodynamic flow, then you can calculate forces and moments uh, for every single element, and then add them up and put them in comparison, uh, sum them up in the center of gravity, so you have uh, forces, act, forces and moments acting on your center of gravity. The actuator um, model R is just uh, based on our thrust measurement, which we did on our test stand, and it's just a simple model where uh, the voltage of the battery and the thrust signal, uh, yeah, create a, thru a thrust, com um, yeah, thrust command. Our servers are modeled as a time-delayed rate uh, limited model, which is a pretty common approach nowadays. Let's look at the um, control strategy again. Here we have our uh, INDI attitude controller. It takes as inputs the rotational accelerations, and we have an LQ LQR controller and a height controller. Let's look at the INDI first. Don't worry, I'm not going to too much detail into INDI because I, most of us already know the concept of INDI. I'm just going to talk about the simple key features here. Uh, the basic principle of INDI, we're using our equation of motion and we are inverting them for 
a control law which enables us to control uh, to calculate a control signal for our desired uh, deviations of, for example, ex angular accelerations commands. But the big downside for this, of course, is always we have aerodynamic effects. And to counteract these aerodynamic effects, we can use a Taylor series, um, Taylor series around our state and input vectors, and therefore we can derive a simple yet powerful equation, like this, this one here, down here, which basically just calculates a signal, uh, a motor actuator signal, based on um, yeah, our deviations from our desired state and our um, taking into account the motor model and our inertia of the plane. Here you can see the equation again. Thinking about the uh, uh, plant I just talked about, now we can just take our model for our plants, build the derivative of this model, and put them in our B matrix here. And then, we, and if we know our inertia, which we can approximate by a point model mass, for a point model, for example, we're able to have a pretty robust um, controller, which is, enables us to control the um, pitching of our aircraft in this uh, failure mode. Yeah, the LQ, LQ, LQR controller basically has its input, it's the uh, thrust vector, uh, the main thrust vector, which we want to use to stabilize our aircraft, and it has output stack angular accelerations. Yeah, the goal of the LQR controller is basically to generate rotational acceleration commands based on trim state deviations, according to weighting permits of state deviations or actu actuator usage. How can we do this? Well, basic principle LQR control, we're taking a uh, quadratic cost function, trying to minimize it, and then we get a feedback control law which satisfies. For example, here you can have the uh, parameters Q and R, which are weighting parameters for either is the state more important or do I want to have more uh, actuator usage? You can, so it's just tuning parameters for in this case. Well, the height controller basically is simple PD controller for our height and uh, sink rate, and it computes us a uh, force on the co uh, contrast to our uh, gravitational effects, taking into account that uh, the pitching angle theta and sigma, and then we have a thrust command which our motors have to produce so we don't lose any thrust. Yeah, let's look at the simulation. First of all, to give you an insight on what's happening here, you can see this figure. Um, first of all, the plane is in stationary hover mode. It's just normal mode. We're just uh, hovering at zero, uh, zero meters per second wind speed and at this, uh, at failure time to, uh, at seven seconds, our tail rotor fails. What's happening? Our pitch angle goes up, theta goes up, like you can see on the top, and then our tilt angle goes down to compensate for this. As you can see on the, uh, yeah, the middle, our angular velocity is not that really high, not that high, but as you can see the translational velocity on the lower screen, you have some translational movements in the, in the horizontal plane. This is acceptable because we always have a trade-off between a height loss or a translational um, movement. But do, uh, for this emergency mo mode, the priority is not to lose height. We want to minimize our height loss and therefore where we say we're able to move freely in the horizontal axis because we were actually intending to fly here so there are no buildings, for example. Yeah, looking at the height loss, this is just one example here. We have a height loss of only quarter of a meter, which is very slow, uh, very uh, small compared to what we have expected. But it de also depends a little bit how you tune the parameters. For example, if we say we're accepting a bit more height loss, then we have less translational movement back and forth, for example. Yeah, like I already said, you have a big yeah, acceleration from one meters per second from our stationary plane, which is acceptable. Looking at our uh, INDI controller, here you can see the uh, INDI controller performance. You have some deviations here, but they are due to aerodynamic effects. We modeled the aerodynamic effects on, in the plant side, but we didn't account for them in the INDI controller. So there are always some deviations in this case. Yeah. Furthermore, we have also done some studies on the wind, uh, some studies with wind and initial uh, starting setups and we were able to control our aircraft 
uh, in roll, pitch, and descent. So we were able to fully control it, but uh, especially regarding our pitch authority, it was really sluggish. We're, here's a, definitely have some room for improvement because, um, yeah, like I already said, it's always a compromise between height, uh, pitch, and uh, latitude, um, longitudinal motion. Yeah, now I'm coming to my conclusion of this uh, work. The main idea was to substitute hardware redundancy by using software controller designs and our development goals have been reached. We are were able to maintain controllability during our hover flight and the uh, tail actuator failures. We were able to, yeah, like I already said, climb, descend, roll and pitch, even in uh, windy conditions. Yeah, and of course, uh, sadly we weren't able to do a real test flight now. The next big step is, for example, to do some test flights in a controlled environment and definitely to improve the pitch control regarding pitch damping and angular control. Thank you, and any questions? Thank you. And now we have the time for one short question. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, when flying tilted, it's one of the difficult things is doing the descent. Um, and I'm wondering how you plan, or what you think about um, uh, wind gust disturbances with the tail um, and then getting flow from below as well. Um, how do you envision that? Thank you. First of all, uh, even in the uh, Mavericks, we're not descending this fast. We're just descending about one meters per second. So the, down fl uh, the upward flow on our ailerons is not that big of an issue. Uh, but of course, if we, uh, for example, want to stay stationary, it's going to be a, a problem. But it's, um, yeah, we're able to tilt the wing a bit, so we are able to compensate for the wind effects, for example. So it's uh, not, we're not going down straight, but the wing is tilted against the wind to compensate for this. Thank you. So please, an applause for the, the speaker. Yeah, you can go. For the next speaker, uh, we are welcoming uh, Ojo Jiang, <laughs> almost. <laughs> uh, and uh, the presentation will be on the robust flight control using hybrid incremental nonlinear dynamic inversion control <laughs> for a tilt rotor UAV. Thank you for introducing. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. My name is Hwe Jong, and I am a PhD student from Chungnam National University in Republic of Korea. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, and I'm happy to have present, um, present uh, my research. Uh, my field of study is robust control and obstacle avoidance. Today, uh, I will give you a presentation about robust flight control using hybrid incremental nonlinear dynamic inversion control for tilt rotor UAV. The contents are divided into three parts. For, uh, in the introduction, we will explain why robust control is needed UAM and why the IND controller is chosen in this study. Uh, moreover, we will discuss the requirement of the INDI. In the research activities, we will talk about dynamic modeling and uh, hybrid INDI concept and simulation. Finally, I will wrap up my presentation with conclusion and future work. Let's start from the introduction. We discussed we discussed the reason why robust control is needed for UAV. External disturbance affect the system control performance. Uh, UAV is significantly influenced mission performance depending on the disturbance size and intensity. Secondly, modeling uncertainty determines the performance of the nonlinear control. And last, like modeling uncertainty, 
unknown aerodynamic parameters affect the control configuration. In this study, uh, we researched the INDI controller considering the control and the sensor delay problem. INDI stands for Incremental Nonlinear Dynamic Inversion. This slide explains the research trend of INDI. In 1998, NDI was applied to the Helio aircraft. In 2000, NASA uh, was uh, NASA NASA used the modified NDI by the feedback on acceleration, angular acceleration. In 2010, Delphi University introduced the INDI. Since then, research has been extended to fixed wing, multicopter, and tail shitter. Ahen University has been researching applying INDI to tilt wing UAV. Actually, I appreciate Delphi and Ahen University for their active research on the INDI. Their research has been of great help to my research. Recently, uh, here, I, hybrid INDI was introduced by the Korea Aerospace Industry and the Delft University. In this study, we focus on studying the hybrid INDI. Before the research activities, we summarize the requirement in the existing INDI research. First, the first problem is state derivative measurement. The problem occurs when the sensor is differentiated and reflected in the controller. Second problem is a change in control input affects the system more than a state change. Third problem, the control update rate should be fast. It can affect the uncertainty term and the Taylor series expansion. Finally, all INDI structure must have exact control effectiveness metrics. In our study, focus on the first problem because we had been a basic stage based on IDA, INDI. To solve the mismatched model and measure the delayed problem, we studied the hybrid INDI. This is a reference for INDI researches. Uh, let's start from the research activities. The first is dynamic modeling. In this study, we modeled, modeled using tilt rotor UAV. Reliable uh, dynamic modeling was performed using flight data and DECOM. This tilt rotor has four motors, and the rear motor is tilted, tilted from 0 to 90 degrees. We analyzed the dynamic characteristic according to the tilt angle. As shown in the figure, a full zero map is used to represent the longitudinal and the lateral directional axis. In case of the longitudinal axis, it moves to RHP as the tilt angle increase. And the lateral directional axis is converted to the zero, our origin. We use the, this the result to the IND, hybrid INDI design. The second is the INDI and hybrid INDI concept. By concept of INDI in the figure on the left, by extending the nonlinear system to the Taylor series, we can obtain an incremental form of control input. Hybrid INDI is the figure on the right. Uh, it is a concept that uses model information and the sensor data. This concept advantage is that it uses sensor data over reduced noise and decreased mo model dependency. This slide describes the concept of hybrid INDI. Hybrid INDI uses a complementary filter to fuse sensor-based and model-based data. From characteristic dynamic result, we set the filters crossover frequency and coefficient and the coefficient, damping coefficient. First, MCK system simulation was performed to check performance of hybrid INDI. As shown in the left figure, the dynamic equation was defined by linearizing the MCK system. We, we defined the sensor-based 
and model based India equation and the simulation were performed. Mm, we gave a doublet command to position for 40 seconds and we added noise to speed sensor. As a result of the simulation, hybrid INDI performed better than INDI. In the hybrid INDI, you can see that noise and amplitude has been reduced. Uh, the table on the left uh, shows the RMC and improvement rate. The position has been improved by 35% and the speed by 60%. In the acceleration, acceleration result, the complement filter reduces the sensor noise. The second simulation is about tilt rotor UAV. This slide describes the hybrid INDI design uh, of the tilt rotor UAV. Uh, as shown in the upper equation, uh, angular acceleration is required in incremental form. A uh, nonlinear equation, similar NDI, is used for the model-based estimation. In, the, in this presentation, a hybrid NDI in fixed ring mode was performed. The simulation scenario is as follows. In trim condition, we gave doublet command uh, for which angle, and we added the noise to the gyro sensor. Three simulations were performed by combining angular model, actuator model, and the angular velocity noise. We compared the PID and NDI, INDI, and hybrid INDI. First result is, uh, is a simulation without actuator model and angular velocity noise. In the simulation, since the PID gain is not tuned, uh, we can see that the pitch angle cannot follow the attitude con command. On the other hand, NDI, INDI, and hybrid INDI use more control surface, control surface, and to follow the command. In case two, when the actuator model was applied, in the NDI, we can see a non-ideal state. In particular, uh, significant vibration occurs in elevator and angle velocity. However, INDI and the hybrid INDI follow the command well. In case three, with the actuator model and, uh, and angular velocity noise, uh, we can see that NDI, uh, the NDI has the noise in elevator and attitude. The pitch angle and the angular velocity of INDI and hybrid INDI also show the little noise and some command are not followed. However, in terms of overall performance, we can see that hybrid INDI follow the command best. The table on the right shows the RMC and improvement rate according to simulation caches. In case one, the performance uh, of NDI was the best. But from case two, NDI results were not considered. They were non-ideal state. Uh, when considering actuator model, hybrid NDI's performance was the best. Uh, in case three, we added angular velocity noise along with the actuator model. Uh, the hybrid INDI performance uh, was also best. Finally, the conclusion and the future work. Uh, today, I introduce you about the concept of hybrid INDI, dynamic modeling, and the simulation. We analyze the performance of hybrid INDI uh, through MCK system and the tilt total UAV simulation. However, the limitation of this study are as follows. First, it is necessary to set, uh, set the crossover frequency of complementary filter. Uh, second, the model based method should be solved the problem um, of accurate model information. Third, hybrid INDI is a transition mode of tilt total is necessary. As a feature study, we plan to solve a problem using various experimental applications. 
Yes, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are just a little bit late, but we can take one question from the audience. Yes, no. Okay, so I'll have, I will have one for you. Um, so for this uh, new uh, filtering um, and um, kind of, you, you inject some new models, uh, what kind of tuning do you need? Can it be done uh, from test flights? Like, or, or do you tune the hybrid part of your uh, controller? Uh, your question is uh, tuning the controller, and the controller? Yeah, my right. question is like, um, you, you need to tune a new filter somehow, and this tuning, is it empirical, or is it based on uh, experiments, or models, or, or do you do it? Ah, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, for, uh, first of all, um, I want to rely on dynamic modeling, build the dynamic modeling. So I use the flight, real flight test data. I uh, supplement the, my dynamic modeling. And in the simulation environment, I tune the complement filter, the focus over frequency and the damping coefficient. So uh, this uh, complementary filter tuning value is a reliable value, I think. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. OK, so this is, uh, uh, please, <laughs> again, uh, thanks, the Thank speaker. You. So this is ending the, uh, <laughs> this uh, IND spe special session. And uh, now a word, uh, the, the most important uh, from uh, Guido. Coffee break. <laughs>
sí. Test. Okay, one, two, sound check. Okay, so um, the people are uh, coming upstairs slowly, so I'm going to start already by introducing the session chair. So Elia Cireda, he's doing a PhD in Lugano at uh, the famous institute uh, Itzia. And um, yeah, welcome and thanks that you're going to chair uh, the session today. Yes, thank you, Professor De Croix, for this opportunity. Welcome to this session on uh, math design. And we are really lucky to have quite a lot of works today in very many different aspects of design, from materials to design optimization to software architecture. So without further waiting, let me introduce our first speaker, Martin Lefebvre, from uh, INSA and the University of Strasbourg. Please. OK. Thank you, Chairman. Let's wait just a few seconds. Okay, so hello everyone. I am Martin Lefebvre. I come from Strasbourg University and in Strasbourg. I am a PhD student. And I will talk to you today about uh, recyclable bio-based composite flux helium for UAV application. And so today I will talk about uh, stock drone presentation, a code project that we started a few years ago. After I will talk about why use flux fiber for UAV. And finally, I will talk about multi-scale experiments on the biocomposites. And promise, I won't talk very deep in science, mechanical science. I will say brief about flux fiber. Um, so Alcohol Project started a few years ago, and the objective was to design a drone, long-range drones, uh, with some specification. It's a twin boom tail, wingspan of five meters. It's uh, with electrical motors of uh, 2,000 watts. Uh, the structure was made with carbon and glass fiber and epoxy matrix, and the cruise flight was about 90 kilometers per hour for a maximum takeoff weight of 25 kilograms. And we can have a payload of five kilograms in the drone. So the mission, it was designed to do some long range flights and some to do some pollution monitoring. So you can see the picture and flight of the drone and the team that developed the drone. Uh, Stork, come, the name comes from a bird, where this part of France, in Strasbourg, is very famous. That's why the name of uh, a flying bird. And uh, if you want more information about this topic, objectives, uh, there will be a presentation at the end of the day uh, by my colleagues, uh, Thomas Pavo. And now we are developing a new version. It's uh, the Stork 2. 
And this one, uh, we are breeding with mold composites. And the difference is uh, we want to use a recyclable composites. So let's start the topic. Uh, at the beginning of my PhD, I was in charge of the CAD of the drones. So I'm doing the CAD here of the wing of the master. After doing some CNC machining to have the parts and to do some composite molding in INSA. And finally, to finish with uh, have the mold of the drone. So we have 12 molds for all the drones. And the good thing with the molds is that we can do many versions. So we are, we'll do the first version classic with carbon, glass, and epoxy matrix. I want to do a new version with flax fiber and helium matrix. Alors, the question is why using flax fiber for UAV or for composites? First, because uh, flax fiber have low environmental impact compared to glass fiber. Uh, there is minus 62% of global footprint for flax fiber. And you can see all the process here, so from the landfill, after we can ex extract the fiber to create fabrics, and after we can create the mechanical part in composites. Here you can see there are some studies to compare the footprint of flax and glass fiber. And now, why using a recyclable matrix? So this is a landfill when it's cemetery of wing blade because they are made with glass and epoxy and we cannot recycle, recycle this material. All the drone that we used for the competition yesterday was made with carbon and epoxy and it's impossible to recycle them at the end of the cycle of life. So we want to st study the um, possibilities of using a new matrix developed by Arkema in France. It's a recyclable matrix with the same properties of epoxy or polyester. So it's to avoid this disaster, ecological disaster of composites. And also a second point of using flax fiber. Uh, Europe is the world war leader for producing flax fiber. France is number one, Belgium is number two, and Netherlands is number three. So it's also a good business opportunity for Netherlands. And now let's talk about mechanical uh, properties. So I use the HB diagram, it's used to compare all material. Uh, for this I compare young modulus, tensile strength, and density and I compare flax with glass fiber. And we can see that maximum properties of flax here can reach properties of glass fiber. But the most important part for flax fiber is low density compared to glass fiber. So let's zoom on this part. And where we can compare the specific properties. It means the tensile strength divided by density and the young modulus divided by density. And we can see here that E glass, the small black bubble, is also the same level than the flax bubble. But we can see that for flax, we have very wide range because there is a big variation of mechanical properties. For here, uh, glass fiber, we have small bubble. That means that there is a low variation on mechanical properties. And on the top right, you can see the carbon that's very high because high strength and very low density. So we cannot compare flax with carbon, but it's interesting to compare flax with glass. And now the drawbacks of flax composites. The first one is the high variability of the composites. The second one is high porosity and water absorption. And the last one is difficult to predict the mechanical behavior of flax composites. As you can see, it was a uh, work from Bormo. And we can compare uh, flax composites A, B, and C, and a glass composite. So you can see for black flax, we have a high variability of the shape of the diameters. But for glass, we have very strict diameters and very low dispersion of properties. And my work in, during my PhD is to do a multi-scale analysis of these composites, starting from the nanoscopic scale of flax fiber, because they are made of cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin. After I can switch to the scale of the composite, uh, excuse me, the scale of the flax fiber, because the flax fiber, only small, one sm flax fiber is kind of composite, and you can see the small diameter here, smaller than the diameter of hair, for example. And after I can switch to the scale of the composite, it's flax fiber mixed with the helium matrix, and finally, I can switch to the bioscopic scale, is multiple layers together, and to have the scale of the structure, so the UAV that we developed uh, during this project. And during my three PhD, I'm doing a lot of experiments on these composites. So the objective is to test uh, different orientation. You can see here uh, 90 degrees and zero degrees. The three S is means there is three layers in symmetric. Here it's uh, all 12 layers at zero degrees, zero degrees that you are putting in the fiber direction. And here is plus 45, minus 45. Uh, here you can see the result for the unidirectional. I mean, we are putting in all the fiber direction. And here I can see a tensile test with a plus 45, minus 45. We have a very long, very wide deformation. 
and the objective is to get all the mechanical properties, young modulus, tensile strength, and after to use these properties in my simulation. So now we are doing simulation uh, about the drone, and the objective is to compare different structures. So I use one uh, full flax structures, the second one full glass structures, and I try to see the effect of hybrid structures. And I want to see the effect of the load factor, so I'm starting at 1G to 10G. And you can see the shape of the wing, so it's a twin spare. And this is the laminate that we use. So uh, we have, uh, inside the structures, we have a uh, twill fabric, 0 and 90 degrees. In the middle, we have a very thick layer. It's PVC foam to increase the thickness of the wing. And in the upper surface, we have uh, 0, 90 degrees, and plus 45, minus 45, is to, um, to avoid the beam, the twist of the wing during the flight. And for my simulation, I use Ashin failure criterion, so we can discuss, see, discuss about it later. But it's to compare this ratio compared to one. I mean, when we have one, that means we have failure of the drone, failure of the composite. And I try to difference between compression and tension in the wing. This is a result that we I get in tension and compression. So you can see in abscissa, it's a low load factor, so increasing of load factor. And here you can see is when we reach the uh, equals one, I mean failure of the composite. In dash line, it's a safety margin for the drone. Here we can see that in tension, we don't have any problem for all of the structures. I mean, for glass, flax, we don't have problem. But if we are considering compression, uh, for flax fiber, we can easily reach at 5G the failure of the drone. And when we did the experiment on the prototype, we noticed that we can very easily reach this load factor. So we have to be very precautious if you are using flax fiber to avoid to, um, overall to be higher than 5G in the structure. And for conclusion, uh, yeah, flax fiber is a good option for designing UAV, uh, for quadcopter, for instance, and for drones. Uh, because it's a good weight saving, we can save maximum 10% of weight for the structures. Uh, we have a lower carbon footprint than petrobase fiber. Petrobase means glass and carbon. And we have good vibration damping. It's not my field, but I read some publication about it. It's used for robotics. So flax is already used for robotics parts. Um, but using flax fiber is using by precautionous with flax trajectories and avoiding to, in our case, to do more than 5G in the structure. After, we have a limitation for bigger vehicles, like plane, boat, or car, for example, because we have too much viability in the properties. And the perspective of this will be to improve the extraction process of the fiber, because we have too much viability, and could be also to select the best varieties of the fiber for the specific application. And one also perspective could be interesting for IMF 2023, would be to develop a structures made with carbon and flax composites. Or why is these two together particularly? Uh, because carbon and flax have roughly the same density, and carbon will give strength to the structures, and flax will provide absorption of dumping. Thank you for your attention. Okay, I think we have time for one short question. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> normally when you fly uh, with the um, stork, like what, what are the kind of Gs that you experience? Like would you already go outside of the 5G or is it uh, like... Uh, yeah, it was, um, it was uh, during emergency landing and we noticed that we reached 5G on the structure, but it was with a, a carbon and glass structures, but with a pixel on board, we measured this 5G uh, load factor. Okay, and you were using the hybrid uh, version uh, in, in there, the hybrid uh, glass. You were using the hybrid glass uh, fiber structure. The prototype, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. My PhD right. is to find if we can use flax for the second version. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Let's thank again Martin for his presentation. <laughs> Our next speaker is going to be Luis Fernando Tiberio Fernandez from ENAC and Université de Toulouse in France. So please welcome him.
sorry. Okay, uh, so my name is Luis. I'm a first year PhD student at INEC and ONEHA. And I'm here to present you this paper entitled Development of a Mission Tailored Tail Seater MAV. This MAV that you might have seen flying uh, yesterday, hopefully, with some success and some drawbacks as well. So I'm going to begin my presentation by telling a little bit about my PhD thesis and also about the mission definition. Then I move to the design strategy and the adopted concept. And then I'll show you two different design iterations, some flight test results, and also the competition results with our second design iteration. So the very objective of my PhD thesis is to learn how to design and control efficient MAVs using multidisciplinary design and optimization, or MDO strategies. And a very important question that always arises is, OK, but how exactly do we define efficiency? And this is actually a very tricky question, because there's no such thing as one single efficiency metric fits all missions, fits all requirements, and therefore all vehicles. So in order to avoid this definition, and really benchmark our design capabilities and techniques, we decided for this paper to tackle the very well-posed far and fast mission from this year's competition. So if you look at the score for this mission, we have that. The score is defined by the number of laps on the competition track, the capability of landing or not, the autonomy level, and the payload and vehicle weight. However, we can consider that both the, the payload, the landing capability, and the autonomy are not necessarily design related. And therefore, we can simplify even further our problem, saying that the score for us is just a relationship between the number of laps, the payload, and vehicle weight. So from now on, this is our efficiency, and even most importantly, our objective function. But it's actually not a very easy problem to tackle, it's very coupled, and I'll show you why. So whenever we want to increase the number of laps for a given vehicle, we of course want to increase two aspects. The endurance, meaning the time that we, the vehicle is capable of flying, and also the flight speed. In order to achieve both, it's usually important to decrease or to reduce the drag, which usually claims for lift reduction, therefore generating a reduction in the, or penalizing our payload capability. On the other hand, whenever we want to increase the payload capability, we need more lift, which in turn generate more drag, reducing endurance and flight speed, and decreasing, therefore, the number of laps. So this is actually a very coupled problem, and not only that, but a multidisciplinary one, because we need, at the very least, three different disciplines to analyze it, aerodynamics, weights, in mission or flight performance. And that's exactly where MDO helps us. It helps us finding optimal design, meaning here, maximized score designs, taking into account all the trade-offs, the disciplines, and the interaction between the disciplines. So basically, that's what we did. We implemented an MDO problem using NASA's framework for that, OpenMDAO. And our problem consists in an MDA block, a multidisciplinary analysis, of three different disciplines, weights, missions, and aerodynamics, for which we used open air struct. As optimizer, we opt for a Bayesian optimization approach or surrogate-based approach, because this kind of global optimization approach is capable of avoiding local minima while keeping a reasonable computational cost. So in summary, our optimization problem was trying to maximize the score by changing the wing design or the wing geometry, the payload and battery mass, and also constraining the flight endurance to the limited or to the limit imposed by the competition. So we applied this optimization pro problem to this to this vehicle concept, as we can see here. So 
It has no control surfaces nor servos, which means that it can be light and especially easy to manufacture. And of course, it should be more efficient in forward flight when compared to a single quadcopter. However, throughout the development of this paper, we had several problems with weight distribution and especially guidance and control authority, as again, you might have seen yesterday. So, having the concept and the optimization problem, we found our first design iteration. And with this vehicle, we shown a picture, we were able to fly indoor in even fully autonomous outdoor flights. And despite the interesting result, the main outcome of this design iteration was that it was actually consuming a lot of energy, especially in forward flight, which was not expected and, of course, highly undesirable. So, in order to maximize our chances here for the competition, we decided that it was needed to go for another design iteration. And in order to do that, it was important for us to refine, of course, our design capability. And for that, we asked ourselves three different questions. So, question one was, okay, can we find more suitable propellers for our vehicle and therefore improve our cruise efficiency? And in order to answer this question, we did several similar flights by changing only the propeller. And the answer for this question was, yes, we were actually able to improve our cruise performance, but not, but not, not too much. It was not sufficient to call and come here to show you. So then we moved to questions two and three. Uh, here we tried to understand if we were correctly predicting both lift and drag. And in order to do that, we performed wind tunnel tests at Inex Lab in a similar airspeed to the one that the vehicle should fly. However, I must uh, point it out that it was not, not uh, as windy as yesterday. <clears throat> so question two was, okay, could, be, could we be underestimating the drag generation? And we found out that uh, no, the drag prediction was actually very reasonable considering the amount of data that we had beforehand for the optimization. So at cruise angle of attack, drag was not the problem. However, the lift was, yes, indeed a very big problem. We realized that we were overestimating our lift capability by more than 60% uh, of the correct value. And this was generating this very weird behavior that we can observe with the pitch angle during several flights. So, as the wing was not actually capable of generating enough lift to counterbalance the weight, the flight controller was not using the wing and was therefore using the motors, forcing a very high pitch angle. And at such condition, of course, the wing was not helping and was actually stalled, generating even more drag, which was of course penalizing a lot our efficiency in flight. So in order to improve our design and again refine our technique, we added a leaf margin for the prediction. We also uh, refined, of course, our drag and weight prediction based on our first design experience. And as described in the paper, we added a new propulsion module using CC blade and new, two new constraints for hover and turn. With that, we obtained our second design iteration, the one that we saw fly yesterday. And this wing is higher, is, it has a higher wing area than the second design, the, than the first iteration, sorry, and more reasonable values for both lift and drag. So during the test flights with the second design iteration, we were able to fly for about 14 minutes with a 720 grams of maximum takeoff weight, weight so our payload was 200 grams. And by looking at the, the power consumption, the energy consumption, and especially the pitch angle during flight, we were able to realize that, okay, for this design iteration, now we do have wings, they are working as expected, and the vehicle is efficient, is, is efficient as is, it is supposed to be. So throughout the development of this paper, the most important outcome for us 
uh, was that, okay, we should not concentrate ourselves on full cycles of design and optimization without any kind of validation. So testing should be enforced whenever and always possible. So for us, it was really important to exercise and improve, of course, our manufacturing capabilities, run wind tunnel, of course, when possible, to validate the aerodynamic uh, estimation, and most importantly, fly. So, uh, for us, the most important, again, was, okay, we need to feedback our MDO or any design, and any design uh, process with real-life constraints. So, uh, wrapping up, I presented you the application of MDO to the design of a vehicle for the IMAV uh, Far and Fast competition. I showed you two design iterations, wind tunnel and also flight tests to validate our results. And before calling off for the day, let me just share with you that yesterday, after solving several problems with the guidance and the autonomous flight, in the autonomous module, sorry, we were able to fly for around 13 minutes. And well, at that point, we did not have enough mission time nor battery anymore. So the question still remains, could he do more? So yes, we think that we should fly with this configuration for about 17 minutes, but maybe I'll show you on the next IMAF. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis, for this very interesting presentation. I'm sure someone will have uh, a lot of questions for you. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, after your experience, how translatable do you think MDO is to real life? And what are the challenges in MDO? Is it the, do you think the algorithms are the bottleneck, the problem definition? or the computation, what are the main challenges to make it more translatable from simulation to real life? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. Uh, there are several challenges and, of course, the MDO community is a very well-established community in general, uh, general aviation aircraft design, let's put it this way. And working with design and optimization of drones helps, helps me kind of bridging this gap of using my designs and the result of the optimization to the flight. But, well, as you might have seen, the, actually, we cannot consider all of the practical aspects during the optimization. So we are still using several assumptions that we cannot, that, that we cannot yet model properly. So the most uh, troublesome, troublesome part for me is that when we go for real life, we have to deal with another, with a lot of unexpected things and problems with the, 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 the building part. And I think that in terms of simulation, especially this kind of aerodynamic, this kind of stuff, we are not there yet in terms of having everything we need to model or even simulate, dynamically speaking, the, uh, all the vehicles in order to really replicate our uh, our vehicle before building and going to fly. Thank you. Okay. I uh, thank you very much for your t talk and for your really fantastic system you've built in a very short time. Uh, just one question about the optimizing, optimization approach you're using. So you said, so avoid local minima, find the global ones. But how does your optimizer is doing this? Can you summarize on this, I, please? I'm not sure if I had these slides anymore to support, but if it's, okay, okay. Yes, I can, of course. So basically, uh, thank you very much for your question. Sorry. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, so basically what we have is uh, an optimizer changing it's, it's not a problem. An optimizer changing the wing geometry as a whole. Okay. So what are we changing here? We, we change the wing geometry, which is, so I assume that I'm changing the taper of the wing, the tapering, so I have the root and tip short, 
I am actually um, varying this pun as well, the, the angle of attack during cruise, and of course the weights, but... So when I generate this wing geometry, which uh, with your question is very simplified because I only have root tip chord and spin, I have an aerodynamic module, open aerostruct here by Michigan University, that is capable of using this value with the cruise speed to calculate both uh, lift and drag, and then feed the mission and weight model, but this is all conducted in an iterative fashion, meaning that the output of the mission module is the cruise velocity, which is also the input for the aerodynamic module. So when I talk about global optimization, I'm talking about an optimizer that can really connect all the three disciplines here in a sequential way, or the correct name would be multidisciplinary feasible way, to really generate out of that very simple uh, geometric problem to really extract CLs, CD, fight endurance, fight range, and all this kind of stuff. Thank you. Thanks again, Luis, for this presentation. I think we hope to see you next year at IMAP 2023 with your new design. Now let's uh, welcome Hugo Rodriguez Cortez from Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla in Mexico. Well, good afternoon. Seems we are having some technical issues. Sorry about the delay. Uh, well, uh, I'm not uh, Hugo Rodriguez Cortez. He couldn't come. Uh, neither Maria Beatriz could come, so they gently asked me to uh, give uh, the talk. So the the paper is called "Seawing Geometric Redesign Based on Aircraft Flying Quadris," written by uh, Maria Beatriz Bernabe Loranca and Hugo Rodriguez Cortez. Uh, during this talk, I will give a quick introduction 
I'll explain a little about the multi-objective multi -objective optimization. Then I'll detail the, the case of study, the optimization problem, the results that were obtained, and then I'll give the conclusions. Okay. Well, uh, the advances in various technological areas are constant, so it is necessary to search for solutions for new solutions for the problems or to improve the old ones and uh, in aeronautical engineering the aircraft design is a uh, multi-objective multidisciplinary and in most of the cases you can't improve one thing when um, objective performance without uh, worsening another so it's kind of hard actually to uh, design or design an aircraft part, not the whole aircraft even, just a part, it's hard. Uh, UAP, UAVs are, uh, are uh, well, have proven to be very effective, as you have seen uh, along these competitions, along the three challenges, and well, that is what it makes uh, the decision making progress a little complicated when it comes not to not just to uh, fixed wing aircraft but also quad rotors so uh, the multi objective optimization techniques are preferred because they don't give us just one solution they can give us uh, well various solutions where you can take the one that fits more to your uh, necessities. If you need, I don't know, velocity or endurance, you can take the design that it's better for your necessities. Uh, this paper in specific, it's addressed for the conceptual redesign of a sea wing tip geometry aircraft. Uh, and it's, it uses a multi-objective optimization methodology. The design explores the relationship between the sea wing and the aircraft dynamics. This is because uh, if we can make the aircraft dynamics better, expressed as flying qualities, then we can design a controller for, well, a better controller for the aircraft. So, basically a multi-objective function, it's uh, defined that this equation as the equation number one and of course it has some constraints uh, this is because maybe the mathematical optimum value is to have I don't know a large wing but in terms of cost it's not that optimum so you have to uh, have some constraints well uh, a multi-objective problem determines from a set of possible solutions, let's call that set uh, EF. Uh, those, corresponding optima, those, to, uh, blah, blah, blah. those corresponding to optimal values for all k ob objectives function simultaneously, that means that uh, uh, if you solve your, uh, op uh, wait, your multi-objective problem, and you get all your objectives right, then that's a feasible solution. However, that doesn't mean that is the best solution. Uh, well, that's why we need the Pareto dominance uh, definition. Basically, a Pareto dominance is uh, it's based on the dom domination concept. Well, a solution dominates another as long as it's better than the other solution, but uh, well, it's not worse in in any other of the objectives. So it's completely better than other solution. And well, then we have the Pareto optimum. Uh, well, that is a solution that improves some uh, aspects, but it's worse in other aspects. So they created a whole set of uh, solutions uh, based on the Pareto optimum. And from those optimum solutions, they only took the 
non-dominant, uh, no, non-dominated solutions, basically that, that the ones that are uh, better in some aspects and are not worse in the others. So the specific case of study is this uh, C wing tip uh, fly, flying wing. Uh, the problem with this uh, flying wing is that the is not using well they, when it was designed it was well they weren't used the uh, reflex airfoils so it's very unstable even for a for a pilot. Basically, these are the values they use for its design. So, as I mentioned, it's very unstable because they didn't use the reflex airfoil. Uh, also, the dimensioning problem has been addressed in the literature. They tried to reduce the aerodynamic drag. And well, the sewing tip may help to change the slope of the pitching moment, making it more stable. And well, in this work, they uh, redesigned the sewing geometric dimensions in terms of the longitudinal aircraft flying qualities. Basically, the longitudinal dynamic for the aircraft is given by all these equations. Uh, they consider, consider that the structure of the drag lift and pitching moment coefficients have that uh, particular structure. And they define the equilibrium point uh, by the velocity, angle of attack, uh, pitch angle, pitch, and pitch angle at velocity, the thrust, and the elevator deflection in a way that they have uh, the four equations in this, in six. They define it, uh, the x vector and the u vector, the control vector, in that way. So they have basically this linearized model. Uh, the aircraft models of motion determined by the eigenvalues of the matrix A have, uh, have the following form. Well, the form that is not numbered. It's a very known form. You don't want that. You don't want the poles to be two on the left side because it's gonna be hard to move the aircraft from, from its stability point. So there is a, some tuning that is required. Well, the frequencies and damping coefficients are given by the eighth equation. Okay. And basically the optimization problem was taken as this. Uh, they have the height of the wingtip, the sweep of the wingtip, the uh, angle of incidence, the wingspan, and the sweep of the flying wing. Uh, they constrain them to the values showing 10. And basically, the vector of decision variables were, are, well, the one that is in nine where zeta is the damping coefficient for the long period oscillation mode, and uh, the t value uh, characterizes the time that it would take to double the, the oscillation after being disturbed for an unstable aircraft, or to have the oscillations for an unstable aircraft. Uh, they used uh, <laughs> an evolutionary algorithm called, uh, I don't know how to say it, it's a function. Well, uh, that algorithm is, uh, uses a metaheuristic uh, uh, method called differential, evol differential evolution. Uh, they first started with, with uh, they first started with 50 individuals. Then uh, they uses use the algorithms to create a lot of another aircrafts. Well, the aircraft designs until they obtained 1,000. When they obtained that 1,000 of aircraft designs, uh, they processed it and took the non-dominated uh, designs. Basically, that's the workflow. Started with 50 aircraft. They ensured the 10 variables designs. And 
run the uh, well, they made several runs to create all the the thousand air, uh, aircrafts. Basically, this is what they obtained. Uh, a, B, C, D, and E are the non-dominated aircrafts. As you can see, <laughs> if you have a, a, I don't remember how it's called, an omega uh, low value, no, you, you'll have a really high uh, T value. And if you have a low T value, you have a really high, well, not that really, but high omega value. Basically, this is the values for each design, non-dominated design. Some of them are very similar, but others are not so similar. Well, in conclusion, it was observed that the solution with the lowest value of the short period have more extended long period. Uh, the multi-objective analysis allow designers to identify solutions and to know for each of them the objective function values. Well, from the solution set, the control system designer, okay, yeah, will decide which would be the best choice according to the uh, items that they count on. And uh, all the aircrafts are stable. All the non-dominated aircraft designs are stable. So it's possible that a control system designer will prefer the C design. Uh, yeah. Uh, than other aircraft. It's, uh, and probably a human pilot would prefer the uh, A design. Okay, and since it's difficult to identify trends in the design variables, uh, it is proposed as future work to develop a factory and statistic experiment designed to calibrate the design variables. And as a consequence, the design of experiments will be provide information to establish the most precise optimization area through response surfaces. Basically, they are, they are waiting for experimental validation. And, well, even if, he, if this work is focused on the wing CD tip redesign, uh, this methodology could be used not for not just for a wing tip, could be used for any almost any other part of an aircraft. Uh, an important point that I didn't mention is that all the uh, Aerodynamic coefficient determination was using the uh, CMARC software. It uses a low panel method. If the mesh is uh, big enough, the solutions are very uh, precise. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, Hugo, for your presentation. We are running a bit late on time, so if there is anyone with a very quick question, we can take that. So if no one, I will just ask you, do you have any plans to actually test this design uh, in the field, in a, build an actual prototype of those? Yeah, they're, uh, they're aiming to validate its method with ex experimental tests. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And uh, let's uh, call to the stage now the last presenter for this session, Gauthier Attenberger. Gauthier is from the ENAC and the Université de Toulouse in France, and is going to present a talk on micro-drone autopilot architecture for efficient static scheduling.
Okay, I think we are ready to go. So let's uh, welcome our next speaker. Okay, thank you. So let's change a bit from the, <coughs> uh, from the uh, aircraft design and let's go a bit to the uh, software design. Uh, today, uh, so well, first this work is uh, from uh, INAC, but also from uh, colleagues from the LIAS uh, uh, Computer Science Laboratory from ISAI and SMA in uh, Poitiers. So now it's very uh, easy to find uh, autopilots uh, that can be either uh, commercial autopilots like DJI, Parrots, and uh, so on, or uh, many open source, uh, and I only have here a few examples that you all know, like PIX4, RDPilot, Betaflight, or even Paparazzi. Uh, most of those autopilots, they are seen as black box by the user at least, uh, and they are used uh, by other applications as a configurable uh, box. So you just run the firmware provided by the, uh, the main developers and then you just uh, select the part that you want to use. And this can be seen as opposed to a modifiable approach, something that where you customize exactly what's inside your firmware. <coughs> and uh, actually this is what Paparazzi is doing. Uh, uh, so the question is, can we make the uh, autopilot architecture with high configurability so that you can exactly choose what you are going to use and adapt to your needs with reasonable efforts and still keep a correct execution uh, properties because uh, there is no way that you can test in advance uh, really your, um, the, the firmware that you are going to use. It will be your firmware and you will be the only one to use it somehow. <coughs> so this, this problem is uh, referred as the uh, uh, it is a scheduling problem, and the goal is to uh, organize the uh, organize the execution of uh, several tasks uh, within a complex system. So going from the inputs to the outputs, and uh, in a perfect world, the um, the time would be continuous. There would be no delay. But the fact is, uh, everything is working in a discrete time. And uh, we have like different uh, frequencies uh, depending if you are looking at the uh, navigation guidance uh, uh, attitude control. Uh, you also have some uh, oops sorry some uh, sporadic events uh, coming from uh, sensors or com coming from the remote control, for instance, uh, mode changing. Uh, you also have a, a set of sensors with uh, more or less complex uh, transaction protocols that can take times. And uh, in the end, you still have a few uh, deadlines to, uh, uh, to respect and you want to con your control in particular and the actuators to run at a, a fixed uh, pre frequency to get a, a correct behavior. Um, so you, th the system is inherently uh, complex and complicated and it's not a good idea usually to reduce it. You, you cannot really reduce a complex system to something simple, but you can organize it in a way that uh, the user first can check that all the components that he needs will be present. Uh, second, that the execution of task is predictable. <laughs> and, and that the, the state of the system is not modified uh, asynchronously. So I will come back with an example later at this point. And finally, uh, if possible, you can um, uh, distribute the load, the CPU load in time. So you don't spend one loop to do everything and the rest to do nothing. And if possible, uh, you, you also need to uh, guarantee that all deadlines are uh, respected. There is no uh, uh, exceeding uh, time for execution. Uh, so after this uh, introduction, <coughs> let's talk a little bit about the, uh, our approach for uh, the architecture and the scheduling and then uh, some performance evaluation. Of course, the, the case study here is the Paparazzi system. Uh, this is an open source UAV system initiated uh, by uh, INAC in 2003. So it's probably the oldest open source autopilot still alive. <laughs> um, from the beginning, it was made to be modular and flexible and the general architecture, which is very uh, common in all uh, UAV system, is that uh, first you need to connect together a perception, decision and action loop uh, which is composed by uh, sensors here, uh, providing information to the estimation, providing uh, states. Uh, then you have a decision that goes through the flight plan, navigation, guidance, up to the actuation with the uh, uh, low level control and the actuation. So in order to connect all these elements, 
uh, we provide a certain number of com core components. So for instance, the uh, sensor, they are uh, communicating with the estimation through uh, communication bus. Uh, then you can push the results of the state estimation into this kind of blackboard and so on, and you have some communication uh, uh, tools for the system. Uh, the next thing is that, okay, you are not usually flying only for flying, so uh, you can uh, have, uh, you, you would like to have some access to payloads, <coughs> and that can come somewhere in the, in the system. And finally, uh, as I said, I, we, we want to make it as configurable as possible. And uh, you can see very well important uh, elements, like the airframe, which is describing uh, all the uh, the boxes here, which one are you going to choose? Uh, the flight plan, which is obviously describing the mission, and a few other elements. Uh, you can see some important ones that we will uh, discuss later, which is the uh, static dispatching of the task here. And here you have the, uh, the, the modules, uh, the XML file, which are used to uh, uh, describe all these boxes. So all the boxes here are, are one or more modules, and this is uh, uh, what the user actually uh, selects to build his, uh, his uh, firmware. So in those files, you will find a uh, certain number of information, like uh, what should be the functions to call during the initialization phase, what should be the function to call at a given frequency, uh, what should be the function to call for checking for new events or new message. Uh, you also have some instructions to build, uh, actually build the, the, C, uh, the, the, the program. Uh, and some extra things like the name and the task group, so in which group it belongs, and dependencies. So for the, um, the static dispatching uh, problem, uh, the, the key elements are the group, uh, the periodic functions, and the uh, dependencies. So uh, the, the, the approach that we have, again, it's a static scheduling. So uh, during the generation of the, the program, we are uh, generating a few C files that will be compiled. And to, to reach to this uh, C file, we have three steps. So the first one is to resolve the dependency graph from all the modules that, that have been selected by the user. Then we will generate uh, function calls group by group. <coughs> and all those groups have to respect the uh, general architecture of the system that we have seen before. And uh, finally, in each group, we still have to schedule a certain number of tasks because uh, the periodic functions in each group are not necessarily called at every loop. It depends on the, uh, the, the frequency or the period uh, selected for those functions. And we want that to be uh, uh, distributed in time in terms of execution. So looking at the first point, uh, a, dependen a dependency uh, node in the description is uh, like it can be a module, an explicit module, like I want the uh, GPS U blocks module. It can be also a functionality. I want to uh, have some modules providing the GPS functionality, I don't care which one. And it can even be some uh, Boolean operations, like it can be uh, sensor one or sensor two, I don't care, but uh, at least one of them. Uh, since we have functionalities, we also have to, uh, each module has to tell which functionality it is providing. And you can also add some uh, conflicting or on modules or functionality, like uh, one sensor cannot work with another sensor or another module or functionality, whatever. So uh, based on that, uh, we are using a topological sorting algorithm, which I'm not going to describe, but uh, it's a very basic thing using uh, DevSer the first search, and it's described in the paper. But the important thing is that we have to run it two times, because during the first run, we still have some uh, Boolean operations and functionalities. So we only have a partial order and a list of functionalities to, to check. So after uh, th this first pass and this first list of modules, we check that we have no conflicts, that all the functionalities has been uh, uh, well, provided to the system. And finally, we uh, substitute all the functionalities and the Boolean operations by the actual modules providing them. And finally, we sort the list again. And then this time, we know for sure that there is no conflicts. And uh, of course, all the functionalities are already uh, respected. So why do we do all of this? Uh, in the Paparazzi system, we already have like more than uh, 450 modules. 
So that's a lot. And in a typical firmware, you have between 40 to 50 modules, but the user only needs to uh, provide 15 to 20 modules, and that corresponds to actually what you are really using and what you really want to do. So, uh, this dependency system, first, it makes the uh, configuration easier for the user, but also safer because you know that you are not going to miss any functionalities or not creating conflict between modules, well, as long as the dependencies are correctly written, of course. For the second point, <coughs> uh, so the, the, the temporal execution of the autopilot should respect the general architecture again, which is perception, decision, and action. And we have a few constraints in the middle, like we, uh, the, for instance, the, the IMU sensors, they are providing uh, information that are used to propagate the uh, state estimation filters. And uh, it's better to get first the sensor and then run the estimation and control uh, while keeping the control at a fixed frequency. We also don't want to have events checking to affect the states at the wrong time. So if you start doing some navigation computation, in the middle you have uh, like a mode change and you go to uh, attitude control, you don't want the rest of your control to be computed from a different same point than the one that was used at the beginning of the loop. <coughs> uh, and finally, you want to have an execution order which is uh, predictable and uh, well-defined. So here is the results. Uh, I'm not going back, but uh, the, the colors here are matching the uh, architecture diagram at the beginning. So, well, basically, first you do uh, you, the, the request to the sensors to get new data. Then you just wait long enough to have the, the data. Uh, the long enough, in our case, by default, is half of the main loop period, which is a reasonable choice. <coughs> uh, and then you can run all the rest of the, uh, uh, the autopilot, more or less, uh, which are the uh, state estimation, navigation and control, a bit of payload probably, and finally, the actuators to actually act on the system. And uh, you can squeeze a few other things like data link and uh, checking of the health of the system whenever there is some space. And when, the, uh, when all of this is finished, so there is no interruption during this uh, loop, uh, you can spend the rest of the time by checking new events. <coughs> and you are sure that uh, these new events, like mode change, will not occur in the middle of something. Uh, okay, so here, each of these blocks, it corresponds to a group. And uh, we do have functions that are called at every loop, like estimation. Uh, but sometimes the uh, frequency of, the, uh, of execution inside is much lower. and uh, well, you, you have to choose, well, we can choose, you, you have some uh, degrees of freedom to choose when to call them. And the idea is that you want to reduce the CPU load to, uh, uh, and avoid missing deadlines. Uh, so th this problem, uh, it can be very difficult, it's an NPR problem. Uh, and the, the way we are currently uh, solving this, or well, it's not solving, but uh, providing some more efficient uh, solution, is to, um, by shifting, so adding an offset, uh, shifting the, the beginning of the task by a certain fraction of its period. So to give you an example, if you have three tasks, uh, so task one has a period of uh, three uh, time, units, time units, the second has two, and the uh, last one, third, has uh, six uh, time units for period. So the hyper period, uh, so the, the, the period at which the whole system is repeating itself is six. Uh, if you don't do anything, you can see here that the, all the three tasks will be called at the same time, I mean, not at the same time, but in the same loop. So that would be task one, two, and three in the same loop, and then wait for something, uh, but they, they would have time to do something else. <coughs> but here, uh, the same loop will take more time, and once every uh, hyper period. But if you shift, shift them a little bit, so for instance, task two is shifted by 10% of the period of task uh, two, uh, the task three is shifted by 20% of the period. Uh, if there were a task four, it would be 40% uh, of the period, etc. And just by this uh, simple algorithm, uh, we, we do shift the, um, the execution. And in this case, there is no conflict anymore. But of course, 
it's simple, but it offers no guarantee and it's not even considering the execution time of each function. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can do some measurements and see if in, if in practice it works. <coughs> uh, here we are using uh, for this uh, test case uh, Rotorcraft firmware. Uh, so a basic multicopter, it's, uh, the underlying real-time system is uh, ShibiOS and the board is the Tawaki board that we have been using during the IMAF competition and that you have seen flying. The main frequency is set to uh, 500 Hz and uh, just for technical reasons, I'm only recording bins of 1000 uh, calls, uh, recording the minimum, the maximum and the average time of execution of each group. So the, the flight will show that, uh, a kill mode at the beginning, so doing nothing, then attitude control with uh, two short flights, and finally autonomous navigation during indoor flight. And the, well, the first thing that you can check is that the uh, actual frequency of each group is very, sorry, is very close to uh, what was requested, uh, except for radio for uh, historical reasons. Uh, and that the event checking is performed at uh, 10 kilohertz. So looking at the, the results for the events, <coughs> uh, so this graph, the, uh, the, the dark blue uh, is uh, showing the average of execution time and the light blue at the back is showing the range between the minimum and the maximum. So the first, first thing that we can see is that the average is very close to the minimum, which means that uh, this event function is uh, mostly doing nothing, but from time to time it's looking, at, it's processing some events. Uh, here you have some, uh, some things because the, the data link is uh, increasing. Uh, also, uh, because the, this loop is called at 10 kilohertz, we should not exceed 100 microseconds of time uh, execution time, and we can see that we are staying uh, below uh, 60, so it's all fine. Now, a bit more interesting, we can look at the GNC loop, so that's the guidance part. At the beginning, we have, well, barely nothing, that's the uh, kill mode, so just the raw system. Then we switch to uh, attitude mode, uh, so the, the, the loops is running at idle position, then during the flight, it's increasing. Uh, this increase is rather important because we are using the IINDI controller with the uh, weighted least square algorithm for optimization. So it, if it had been a PID loop, it would be a very uh, short incre uh, increment of uh, CPU uh, uh, load. And uh, for the navigation, so you have attitude control plus the guidance. So the difference between here and here is more or less the guidance and navigation, also in INDI, but without the optimization part. And uh, as an overall, it all stays uh, like below 100 microseconds, uh, where the, uh, so like it could run at 10 kilohertz, but uh, the, this function is only called at uh, 500. So there is a lot of margins here. For all the over secondary tasks, uh, we all have the same kind of behaviors, like the average is very low compared to the minimum uh, and the maximum. So. Most of the time it just do nothing and uh, the execution time is very low for the, uh, I don't know which one is it, sensors for instance, so requesting. Uh, the telemetry is a bit more for other reasons. And uh, well, as a conclusion, the, uh, the, the architecture of Paparazzi, it offers a modular and flexible autopilot uh, that uh, allows the user to customize his firmware we have this dependency mechanism that is uh, flexible and that uh, guarantees that you have all the functionalities that you uh, need. Uh, and finally, we have uh, kind of clean out the execution order to clarify and to be more uh, predictable. Uh, as a future work, uh, of course, because we don't have any uh, guarantees at the moment, uh, we would like to integrate some online monitoring to be sure that we are not exceeding the execution time at some, uh, during some iterations and also uh, to optimize the offsets uh, by taking into account the, uh, the execution time uh, and the worst case execution time in particular. So, thank you. Very good, thank you. Is there anyone eh, with, uh, with a question? Okay, we do have a short time for that. 
Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering if there are any costs to making uh, an autopilot more modular and flexible and more of a white box rather than a black box. What kind of costs do you face? So what would be the efforts to make it more flexible? So costs in terms of performance, I mean, like, it, because I can imagine there must be more abstraction, more modules, more layers for management of the tasks. So, um, so I forgot to, to write it down here, but uh, the, the actual total execution load is only 10 to 11%. So even in, in this small uh, microcontroller, you have a lot of uh, spare time to, to do some payload management and uh, uh, even more complex computations. So basically, with this time of uh, CPU or MCU, uh, except like uh, complex uh, planning algorithm and uh, vision processing, you can do many, many things. So ba basically all of your uh, flight controllers, they are barely doing nothing, more or less. So you still have some uh, extra space for uh, doing things and add things also. And that's why Paparazzi is focusing on uh, customization, because you, you may want to add things directly to the microcontroller and not in a big box outside. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you, Gauthier. Thank you, Elia. So we're now uh, roughly a quarter to four. So yeah, unfortunately, let's shorten a little bit the break so that we really start at four because there's people that need to catch flights later on and things like that. So uh, let's take a break. Uh, it's the last break of the day before the final session and then the award ceremony. And uh, we'll be back here at four. And for the presenters of the next session, uh, yeah, let's try to stick to the like roughly 12 minutes for the talk uh, so that we're on time. Thank you.
Wat is er? Ja.
Hello. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, shall I start? Okay. Uh, today, today. Okay. Uh, today, I want to talk about how a controller design. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're now uh, entering the final session. Um, and when this ends, I think we've got awards and then people have things to get away to. So I'm going to be uh, quite strict on the timing. If you can keep to 12 to 13 minutes, then there'll be time for some questions within, the, um, within that slot. Uh, so the first speaker, without further ado, on the, um, on the design and control uh, session, um, is Abel Gassam, who's um, f dialing in from Amir Kabir. Okay, away you go. Shall I start? Okay. Uh, thanks for inviting me to present this paper, uh, how our controller design and implement and implementation uh, for a dragonfly-like flapping wing MAV. This work is done by my PhD student, uh, Mohammad Lashkari, and me, Abul Ghassan Nakash. We are from uh, Amir Kabir University of Technology in Tehran, Iran. Uh, here is the outline. I'll go to the introduction why uh, a dragonfly is important. And uh, second, we go to the modeling, how to model the system equation of motion and uh, other stuff that are, uh, are relevant to the problem. And then we go to the third section, linearization uh, of the equations of the system. Then at section four, we uh, go to the details of the hardware that we used for this project. And then uh, at section five, we do the controller design and the implementation. And finally, uh, in section six, we review the conclusions. And finally, we introduce the references. Uh, uh, what is special about dragonfly? 
the dragonfly is an insect which is uh, very agile and it has four wings. Uh, you know, almost all the insects uh, have two wings instead of four wings. The nice thing about dragonfly is that it can hover very easily and it has an abdomen which is uh, active uh, in the flight. Uh, there are some MAVs uh, uh, that are inspired by uh, dragonfly. The first one you see on the right, uh, on the top right, you see uh, a dragonfly uh, MAV built by Festo company. Uh, it has 13 degrees of freedom. Uh, there is a demo of its flights on the internet. You can find and enjoy the flight of the Festo dragonfly. Uh, but there is no technical uh, details. There is no specification. You just see the demo. Uh, also, uh, there is a Dragonfly-like MAV built by TechJet company. Uh, it is uh, built for US Army. It has no abdomen. It has just four wings. And there is no technical information about that. Uh, the modeling. Uh, for the modeling, uh, to create a lift, uh, we use clap and fling mechanism. It is taken from Dell Fly 2. And as you see on the right, uh, there is a gearbox mechanism. Actually, it's a four bar, uh, four link mechanism that creates uh, the flapping. And uh, two of the right uh, mechanisms uh, can be used to create the left side of the figure. Uh, you see the leading edge, which is uh, made of carbon bar. And uh, on the back, you have a free boundary yeah, and uh, the Thin plastic piece is between the leading edge and the trailing edge. And uh, that's how you can create a lift with this mechanism. The more details of this mechanism is given in the, some references uh, at the end. But we do not go further uh, to further details. Uh, here, uh, we have free body diagrams. Uh, on the left, you see the head and the thorax and an abdomen of a, a dragonfly. Uh, actually, the head is assumed to be attached to the thorax. So uh, in this figure, actually, we can assume there are two pieces. One is abdomen and the other one is thorax plus head. Uh, you see here we defined an inertial frame, uh, a frame attached to the abdomen, which is noted by T1 and T3, and a frame attached to the uh, thorax, uh, which is noted by B1 and B3. The angle theta indicates that thorax uh, angle with the horizontal and the abdomen angle, uh, which is uh, uh, minus theta A. And there is a hinge edge between abdomen and thorax. On the right, you see uh, the MAV that we built. Uh, actually, it does not fly. It has a suspension point, so uh, it, it won't fly. It would be on the ground, and there is a suspension point. So around the suspension point, it can uh, rotate. And you have uh, wings, front wings, and back wings, and lift and drag forces you see. And you also see the abdomen angle minus theta A. 
Uh, and there is a structure for that. Okay. Uh, here is the actual uh, picture we got from the uh, MAV we built. You see the autopilot on the left, on the left figure I am explaining. You see the autopilot, you see the gearbox mechanism, you see front wings, back wings, and we put a servo motor uh, on the abdomen, and there's a suspension point and the solid bars uh, that uh, are part of wings. And you see the top view on the left and the side view on the right. Okay. Okay, we use the equations for longitudinal motion. So we are in vertical plane. We do not do the six degrees of freedom in space. We just uh, confine ourselves to longitudinal plane and vertical plane. So the equations are mv dot plus non-gravitational force plus gravitational force plus external force equals zero. And you have mass matrix, the element of mass matrix are given on the right. And here the angle theta A of the abdomen is not a degree of freedom. It is uh, an input to the system. So uh, you have U dot, W dot, and Q dot. Uh, so you have three degrees of freedom. Uh, here you see again the gearbox mechanism with more details. You see the input angle, I'm talking about the right figure, the gearbox and the four link mechanism. The input angle uh, to the gearbox mechanism is theta i and the output angle is zeta, which is the angle of the wing. So each wing, you see on the left would move uh, in the amount of zeta. So you see uh, four wings here. Wing one and wing four are attached to each other and they do not have relative motion. Wings, wing three and wing two are attached to each other and uh, they do not have any relative motion and uh, the diagram below shows the zeta dot versus the uh, time. So the derivative of wing flap angle zeta dot versus time. The exact relationship between zeta dot, uh, the rate that the wings are moving with theta dot as input, theta dot i as input to the the system is given on the right. Okay, the lift and drag uh, forces can be computed. Uh, it has very lengthy relationships. Uh, you should take a blade element as shown in red and do some integration. And it has very complicated uh, uh, relationship which we do not go through, but uh, in the references, actually the, all the uh, equations are given. We just use them, not uh, drive them. On the right, you see the lift and drag uh, forces. Uh, it is for two cycles, I mean, two flapping cycles. Uh, so you see how lift and drag are generated. You see lift in most cases are positive above zero, but in some parts of the motion, it goes to minus 0.05. And uh, that's true for drag also. Drag is mainly negative, but in some parts it's positive also. Okay. We do the linearization for the linearization because it is fixed 
at one point, so at, at the mass center of the system, so the component of the velocity u and w uh, in the direction of x and z direction of the body are zero. And we use a nominal theta to do the linearization. So if uh, we do the linearization for the system, for the confined system, uh, we get the following equations as mentioned, it's written in space, state space. And uh, we do linearization around 80 degrees, theta equals 80 degrees. And also we do the linearization around six degrees of theta. So two uh, equations can be seen here. So the uh, input to the system uh, is the abdomen angle and the abdomen uh, angular uh, acceleration and differential lift. Differential lift means the difference between the front lift and back lift. Uh, here we compare the linear and nonlinear models, the open loop system to see if the linearization is okay. And we see good agreement between linear and nonlinear responses. Uh, so uh, in this way, the linearization is verified. So the comparison of body pitch angle in two cases uh, is given. And on the right, you see the derivative of that angle, uh, which is pitch rate, actually. Here we explain the hardware, the hardware that we used. Uh, we used uh, an SP, a speed control uh, system and a micro brush motor and the battery and the slip ring and the servo motor and the converter. And we used Apogee autopilot board. And also we used a paparazzi software. And uh, you see the whole system here in the figure. For the controller design, uh, we used the uh, LQR method. So there are two gains, uh, the K uh, matrices for around 80 degrees linearization and model and for theta equals six degrees uh, linearization, so you, you get two Ks, one for 80 degrees and the other one for six degrees. And uh, for the six degrees, we did the hardware in the loop and we did the nonlinear simulation and linear simulation. And you see that uh, they have a good agreement. The blue one, uh, is hardware in the loop. The red is nonlinear simulation and the green one is the linear simulation. Uh, I guess uh, my time is up, so I should be very fast. A uh, new structure for dragonfly like MAV is given. The abdomen role here was formulated and we used an uh, LQR control, and we saw a good agreement between the model and the hardware. These are the references we used, and there is a two uh, clip here, one with fixed abdomen around six degrees, and the other one is the moving abdomen around theta equals six degrees. Actually, the right one uh, was not explained uh, in the presentation, how to put a servo and do the control, but the left one is the one that we explain everything for that.
Okay, thank you very much. I think we're out of time there. So a big round of applause, please. And if, um, if the next speaker, Sean, is ready to set up, then I think what we could do is uh, take a question just while we're changing over the uh, AV. So is there any questions? No? Okay. Well, I have a question, um, which was, uh, uh, as it might be expected, is about the resemblance um, to a dragonfly. And uh, there are obviously some uh, similarities there and also some differences. So it's a, it's a difficult question, really. But the question is, um, how close fidelity is enough? Which features are you trying to capture and what are you missing out on? Actually, I could not. Uh, okay, sorry. It might be because I'm a bit around the corner. Um, it was regarding the um, f fidelity to dragonflies. Um, although I think we probably have to move on with the session now. Um, so maybe we can pick that up. Ah. Uh. So we can't hear a thing. Yeah, okay, if you can send a message via the uh, chat, that'd be great. Okay, so um, I'm afraid we're a little bit <laughs> further behind than I wanted to be. Um, so we move on to uh, the next talk about design and joint control, conjoined biplane and quadrotor. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Actually, uh, so my name is uh, Eva Smur. I'm representing uh, Sean here. Uh, Sean uh, was a master student at the MAV lab, and what he worked on was um, design and joint control of a conjoined biplane and quadrotor. And yeah, I know it's uh, Friday afternoon, uh, it's the end of the conference, so uh, the presentation that I'm about to give is. Uh, uh, I'll keep it relatively uh, lightweight, <laughs> so no many, not many um, uh, equations. Uh, but I, what I want to share with you is uh, more of an idea. Uh, and that's what if you are, um, w w you want to do some mission, uh, maybe you want to expect, inspect a building, uh, maybe even from the inside. But it's at a long range, so at a long distance. Uh, so flying a quadrotor all the way there uh, is not really an option. So alternatively, what you could do is use a fixed wing, but then inspecting the building from the inside uh, will be very challenging. What you could also use is a hybrid UAV, um, but those are also quite large, and, um, and they're susceptible to wind gusts, so if you would want to uh, enter the building, that might be also, again, challenging. One other idea could be to uh, take a fixed wing and transport the quadcopter all the way over to the building, drop the quadcopter, and then and fly inside. Um, that makes sense, but then uh, you have to carry the quadcopter as that weight, while also this quadcopter it does have propellers, it has a battery, and it's capable of flight, so uh, can it maybe also help um, have the vehicle fly all the way to the building? And that's uh, why Sean developed uh, this um, um, well, combination of a hybrid air aircraft, so that's the green vehicle there, uh, with a quadcopter. And the special feature of this vehicle is that actually the quadcopter can detach from uh, the hybrid and um, yeah, sustain flight by itself. And it, this can be done uh, mid-air. So the idea is that um, well, this vehicle would fly and maybe um, 20 kilometers to a building, um, then the quadcopter could detach, it could inspect there the building from the inside, um, and um, the biplane could fly back to the operator. Um, and, well, <laughs> to give ourselves a challenge, we thought, okay, let's keep those 
two vehicles completely electrically and wirelessly separate. Um, so then the question for the control is, how do we uh, control this combination uh, without communication? And I was just thinking, uh, <laughs> is there some kind of analogy that they can think of uh, to explain this? So what if you have two people on a bike? We're in the Netherlands, so yeah, let's talk about bikes here. Um, and there's this tandem kind of bike. Um, and normally only the, the front person uh, has a steering wheel. And what if the second person can also steer? And then they have to coordinate, uh, of course, uh, which direction they steer. Uh, but without communication, that's, that's very hard to do. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the central team here. Uh, so we were thinking about control strategies. Yeah? What, what can the two vehicles do? Um, and one thing to realize is that uh, the biplane is well, the, the dominant vehicle here. If we go back to the uh, image here, or let's take this one. And the biplane has uh, rotors that are farther away from the CG. It has control surfaces, which are useful in the, in the forward flight. So we envisioned the quadcopter to be, to be kind of supporting um, the biplane. Um, and what we want to avoid is to have fighting integrators. Uh, so if there is some kind of measurement mismatch, um, we do not want uh, maybe the quadcopter to steer left while the biplane is steering right. So um, had the biplane is kind of the leading um, vehicle here and it's always controlled with an INDI &E controller. We chose INDI &E because it's very resilient against uh, disturbances, uh, which we may expect uh, because we have this being a big uh, wing surface. So what can the quad rotor still do to support uh, this vehicle? And maybe not in terms of uh, feed forward control, but in terms of stability. So the baseline to which we compare these uh, strategies is just to have one vehicle, so that's kind of cheating uh, with communication. Uh, so the first strategy would be to have no feedback uh, for the quad router. So it would just be gi giving a constant thrust, so that we call the constant thrust strategy. The second one is to have an angular rate damper for the quad router. And the third one is an angular acceleration damper. All right, so what we see here on the bottom is an INDI control scheme. Um, I want you to not really pay attention to the bottom part. Uh, but at the top, you see the three strategies. So on the left, you see the constant thrust, which is basically um, yeah, not uh, active control. Um, in the middle, uh, you see the rate damper. So that's just rate feedback. And we added a filter there to remove noise. And on the right, you see the angular acceleration damper strategy. And we evaluated this for only the roll axis, assuming that it will be uh, similar for the other axes. So analyzing the previous control diagram, we can, for instance, look at the uh, linear stability margins. Uh, so here's a Nichols plot. And we can already make one interesting observation. Um, you see here the, the three strategies and the control group, which is where you have just one vehicle, basically. And actually, the angular rate damper performs better in terms of stability margins than the control group, <laughs> which may be something that you would not expect. It's also a little bit of, um, well, cheating because we're kind of dividing the system into two systems. So also uncertainties only affect half of the system, uh, which is the reason that we have, let's say, better margins here, uh, which you would see by the distance from the, the cross in the middle there. So, then the release procedure. Actually, the quad rotor uh, controls the, the release uh, moment. So the quad rotor has control over the uh, servos. And the reason for that is that, um, and normally it would be giving, for instance, constant thrust or just being a rate damper, uh, but it has to know when to activate its stability algorithm. Uh, so that's why it's important that the quad rotor controls the moment of release. 
uh, the, the method that we, or the, the way that we do that, is just by giving 70% for uh, thrust for half a second without any attitude control. Um, yeah. The reason that this is important is that otherwise, if, you, if it will be giving uh, a moment during the uh, release, it might uh, give friction and impede the release. We just tested it um, up to pitch angles of 18 degrees. Yeah. And we did multiple tests. Um, this is multiple times indoors as well as uh, outdoors. Let's first look at this test indoors. This is Sean, by the way. Fortunately, he could not be here today because um, he works for the Navy and actually is in Lisbon for an exercise at the moment. Here we see the quad rotor connected to the biplane. And let's give it a thrust, 70% thrust. And that's the release. And so this was the, the test that we did uh, indoor and to kind of simulate um, what this would look like in, uh, in flight. All right, so to evaluate um, had the three strategies that we came up with for the control, uh, we did two type of tests. We did a step response test of 18 degrees roll to evaluate control performance. And we did a disturbance um, rejection test by dropping a weight from uh, the wingtip. So each wingtip had a weight of 672 grams, and by dropping it on one side, you get a, a CG imbalance, and uh, yeah, that's kind of a, like a step uh, input as a disturbance. Um, one other thing to note um, is the uh, average thrust. So you can see that um, if the uh, for the case of the control group, the average thrust is 60% while hovering. Um, so when the quad rotor is providing 70% thrust, it's doing, let's say, more than its share. The reason for that is that then uh, the biplane has um, a more um, uh, margin and for going up and down to control the vehicle. Here are a few uh, pictures of the uh, in-air separation test that we did, and I will end with uh, with the video of this uh, experiment. But onto the uh, evaluation of these three uh, strategies. Um, so we see the control group in green, um, the angle acceleration damper in in yellow, in uh, red the constant thrust, and in blue the angle acceleration damper strategy. On the left here is the step response test, and on the right, the uh, disturbance rejection test. And well, what you can see is that they kind of perform quite similar. I put on the top right a table with um, yeah, a few metrics. And that's the settling time for the uh, step response, uh, the maximum input command, and the energy required. And it's measured in, in terms of a percentage of command uh, times the, the time of the command. And what we can see is that um, and the best performing there are uh, the angular rate damper and the constant thrust strategy. Um, they're very close in terms of settling time um, and the angular rate damper provide, uh, performs slightly better for the other two uh, metrics. Sorry, I said something wrong. Uh, so this is both for the um, um, step inputs on the roll axis. Uh, next, we'll go to the um, sermon rejection test. Yeah. Uh, so here you see uh, yeah, the roll angle and uh, the command. Uh, so at this moment, uh, the weight was dropped. And so and that's how we synchronized um, at these different experiments. Um, Again, the same uh, colors for the same uh, experiments. And um, you can see that the control group performs best, uh, which is kind of what you would expect. Um, the angular uh, rate damper is then kind of has the second 
uh, lowest deviation on the roll angle. Um, and also in terms of the uh, roll command, it performs uh, quite well. And so whenever you cannot have this uh, communication and kind of control the vehicle as one, um, and the angular rate damper would be the best for a disturbance rejection and also quite good for the um, um, yeah, step response. So this is the test that we did uh, outdoors. Here you see the vehicle flying in hover, and soon it will uh, do this in-flight separation, after which the vehicles will continue flying by themselves. Unfortunately, we were not able to uh, get so far in the project that we could also uh, do forward flight with the two vehicles uh, attached. Um, and in this case, both vehicles were still uh, piloted remotely. So each vehicle had a pilot. Um, eventually, that uh, they should become autonomous. Uh, but concluding, uh, we showed collaborative flight with uh, in-air separation. Um, and given the, the fact that you uh, don't have communication, the rate damper strategy um, had the best performance in terms of disturbance rejection. Um, it had better control margins actually than the control group. Um, a smaller energy cost and a marginal difference only in performance with uh, the constant thrust strategy. Uh, the angular acceleration damper uh, performs worse in actually all uh, metrics, so uh, that one was the worst of the strategies. Uh, well, recommendations would be to test this actually in forward flight. Um, and actually, <laughs> um, I've been talking about doing this without communication. Um, it does appear to us that this is actually not the best idea. Uh, <laughs> so I would recommend actually using um, uh, communication in some way. Um, it would lead to better performance, make a simpler controller structure, and give um, increased control authority in case of saturation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, can we have the next speaker and a question for, during the changeover, please? Who, would, who has a question? Yep, I will come rushing over. Is the next speaker ready to come down while we do this? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, do you plan to at some point also go for rejoining both uh, aircraft? Ouch. That is a very good question. Uh, we're working on rejoining vehicles, uh, actually in a different, slightly different context. Um, but yeah, so we are working on this, um, but it, that is like, I think, a few years uh, further where um, we'll be talking about this, actually. <laughs> Other questions? No, 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 questions? no time for any more questions, but thank you very much. Another round of applause. <laughs> if you see me appearing near the bush, that means you've got to wrap up, okay? Uh, so um, next up, uh, we have Woon Taek O. Oh, he's going to uh, talk about the title on there in the, uh, in the for speed. Hey. Thank you. My name is Woon Taek O oh from Chungnam National University in Republic of Korea. Uh, my presentation at this time is about total energy control system design for longitudinal dynamics of complex articulated bony software. The introduction part consists of research background and objectives and the simulation configuration for controller design and analysis of simulation results are in the research activities part. Then at the end, I will close the presentation with the conclusion part. As electronic equipment are miniaturized, the researches on small UAVs are being actively conducted. Among these small UAVs, the Ornithopter is an aircraft that flies by flapping its wings. 
complex articulated oryncephta has longer wing than a single articulated one. So it requires low frequency of flapping and it improves the energy efficiency. Based on this background, Chungnam National University designed and fabricated complex articulated oryncephta named US Girl Mini and is currently researching it. Boeing Commercial Airplane Company introduced the basic concept of the TCS, the Total Energy Control System, in reference number one. And Korea Aerospace Research Institute introduced the PX4 as an open platform that supports various kinds of aircraft and payloads in reference number two. PX4 controls the airspeed and altitude of the fixed wing type aircrafts using TCS. So if the ornithopter can be controlled by TCS, it can be operated on the PX4 and it can also improve the accessibility to development of ornithopter. For this reason, this research is conducted. Here is the research activities. Aerodynamic analysis is performed by XFLR5. XFLR5 has a limitation that it isn't performed well if the airfoil designed by itself is applied. So in this case, clockwise airfoil is applied to the analysis. The 12 shapes in which angle increase and decreases of inner and outer wings occurs according to the airframe design are analyzed. And Aerodynamic coefficients between each shape are obtained by cockpitting. Analysis about the 3D aircraft model of the great angle greater than the stall angle diverges in XFLR5. So the lift coefficient of that angle range is calculated using the flat plate lift coefficient formula. This is an example. The lift coefficient changes linearly in the angle range before the stall angle, and it follows the flat plate lift coefficient after the stall angle. These graphs represent the result of aerodynamic analysis and moment of inertia change for two periods of flapping motion. Then aerodynamic, aerodynamic coefficients related to the tail wing not shown here, remain constant value. The figure shows lift and drag geometry during upstroke and downstroke. Flapping motion generates an airspeed along the jet axis of the aircraft, so it changes the angle of attack of the wings. Then as a result, it causes the changes in directions of lift, or lift and drag of the wings. And the equations of motion are designed based on the fixed wing aircraft's equations of motion. The thrust effects in the airspeed and angle of vertex states are replaced by the x-axis of the lift and drag of the wings. And inner wings and outer wings effects are calculated separately. Then term is added on, added on the pitch rate state for the effect of the moment of inertial change. The flapping motion causes structural torsion on the wings. To reflect this torsion angle in the simulation, the motion capture test is performed. As you can see in the figure on the left, the red circles indicate the location of the marker. The inner wing is divided into two sections labeled A and B, and outer wing is divided into four sections labeled C2 app. And pitch angle is measured for compensate for the measurement error caused by vibration of aircraft. Here is the motion capture test result. All the graph, uh, uh, the graph on the left is about the uh, torsion angle of the left wing and graph on the right is about the right wing. All the graphs is all the graphs show the one theory of the flapping flapping 
and the vertical red line is the transition point from downstroke to upstroke. Through the graphs, it can be seen that the torsion of the angle increases and stroke ratio decreases as the flapping frequency increases. The figure on the left is an example that reflects the wing torsion. And it is about calculating the lift. And the figure on the right is about the stroke ratio description. Referencing the motion capture test results, each wing's lift is calculated by section. And the stroke ratio change according to the flapping frequency change is tabulated and reflected in the simulation. Control input candidates are selected for the controller design. In reference number one, flipping frequency and stroke ratio effects on single articulated orange softer were analyzed. In this reference, the, as flipping frequency increases and stroke ratio decreases, causes the increases of generation of the uh, lift generation of the wing. And in the reference number two, the complex articulated orange softer with active wing twist mechanism was introduced. These three components are selected as control input candidates. To analyze the effect of the candidates, simulation, longitudinal simulation configuration. Desired altitude is 30 meters and there is no desired, uh, there is no airspeed controller. And pitch angle command has limitation of plus minus 20 degree and the total simulation time is five minutes. This is an example of simulation result. The condition at this time is that the flapping frequency is four hertz, stroke ratio is 0 0.7, and active wing twist angle is zero. And <clears throat> through the graph at the bottom of the left, the aircraft can track the aircraft can track the desired altitude. And the lift and the thrust and moment generated by the flapping motion are calculated and it is represent, represent at the right, as you can see. The following graphs show the results for the two periods of flapping motion. The aerodynamic forces and moment generating tendencies show a shape of a periodic wave. The control input effects are analyzed by averaging this effect. These grips show the aerodynamic forces change according to the change of the selected candidate. Increase in flapping frequency causes increase in the thrust and decrease in the lift. And decrease in the stroke ratio causes increase in the thrust and lift impact. And decrease in the active wing twist angle causes decrease in the thrust impact and increase in the lift impact. As you can see in the figure, uh, the flapping frequency has the greatest impact on it. TCS is designed based on the control input analysis result. The total energy control loop controls the flapping frequency and active wing twist angle to track the desired total energy. And total energy balance control loop controls the pitch angle to balance the potential and kinetic energy. Then stroke ratio is fixed to, uh, fixed to an optimal value because it is not feasible to control flipping frequency and stroke ratio with one motor. This figure explains in detail the part that control flipping frequency and active twist angle of total energy control loop. For example, when the total energy is lower than the desired total energy, flapping frequency increases to generate the thrust, and active wing twist angle decreases to compensate for the loss of the lift caused by the flapping frequency increases. The 
The simulation results with the TCS are as follows. The airspeed and altitude graph at the left side show, the, show that the TCS make aircraft track the desired airspeed and desired altitude. In climb flight state, the desired altitude is always higher than the aircraft's altitude, so the flipping frequency is high to track the desired total energy. But in cruise flight state, it converges to a lower frequency. And active wing twist angle is always the minimum value for generate of the rift, and the elevator controls properly to track the desired pitch angle. To verify this research result, US Girl Mini version 2 designed and fabricated. Mm -hmm. And now the flight test is in progress. Finally, I'll give a conclusion and close the presentation. This research is about the airspeed and altitude control using uh, altitude control of the complex articulated onisotopter with TCS. In the future, the flight test will be conducted to verify this uh, simulation results. Thank you. Thank you very much. What beautiful timing and a beautiful talk to go with it. Thank you very much. Uh, I will still press on with the next speaker coming up, if they would. Um, and while we do that, uh, any questions? Yes, I saw your hand first. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. Ah. What is the maximum velocity do, do you expect it? And the second question yes. is, I want to know if, if the vehicle is able to glide. Uh, about first question, uh, in this simulation, this only software has maximum velocity of seven meters per sec. And uh, I missed the second question. Mm. Uh, now, in this simulation, uh, didn't consider the glide state. So, that glide, glide flight, maybe in, is my future work. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? We've got time for one quick one. But only if there's one on somebody's lips. There we go. Okay. Um. Hi, thank you for your presentation. How accurate did you find XFLR5 for calculations? I'm sorry? How accurate was XFLR5 for aerodynamic calculations? Aerodynamic calculations. Uh, Are you satisfied with the accuracy, accuracy? Of, the uh, of the calculations, of the software? This is just a simulation, so uh, it's not a real play test result. So. I know the model uh, exactly, so just calculate in the model uh, simulation based on the model equations. So in this case, the flipping motion effects are very accurately, I think. <laughs> but in the real world, I don't, uh, the test will be uh, performed for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another big round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, last talk of the day, we'll move on to uh, Thomas from Strasbourg. Where are you going? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Thomas Pavot, and I am a PhD student from Strasbourg University. My topic is a frequency based strategy for hybrid powered uh, UAV. So, I will begin this uh, presentation with the Stork drone uh, and the Elcot project. After that, I will continue with the hybridization, passive and active architecture for the fuel cell. And to conclude, I will speak about the frequency energy management strategy. So Elcod means uh, endurance low-cost drone. It was an interreg project. We built uh, the first prototype, the Stork. The first flight was in 2019. 
and the first application was the measurement of pollutant. pollutant. The objective uh, when we designed this uh, store QAV was to carry a fuel cell and batteries as a power supply with an endurance of five hours in automatic flight. There is uh, some specifications of the stork drone. Uh, it's a twin boom tail um, with a wingspan of five meters. And uh, the structure uh, is in carbon fiber and fiberglass. Now I will talk about the, the, the hybrid system. First, the fuselage was designed around the fuel cell and its tank. Our uh, fuel cell was a 1,000 watt uh, proton exchange membrane fuel cell. We have uh, six, lit li six liters tank at 300 bars of hydrogen, and we have also lipo batteries. So for the passive hybrid architecture here, we have the fuel cell, batteries, and what, uh, why, um, does it, uh, why it's a passive hybrid architecture? It's because we do not have DC-DC converter between fuel cell and motors or LiPo and motors. We tested this system during the Elcode project and we have uh, one issue. Uh, every 10 seconds, uh, we have a purge on the fuel cell. Uh, the purge uh, as a small time uh, of uh, uh, 100 milliseconds, and during this uh, moment, we don't have uh, power to the motors. So, battery takes the relay, but during this short uh, event, we uh, have a drop of voltage, and this drop of voltage uh, sometimes uh, provoke um, a desynchronization of the motor, the brushless motors. Uh, of course, uh, we don't want that. So, the improvement was to uh, work on the hybridization. I would like to add a super capacitor. Here you are the, the Ragon plot. The Ragon plot uh, allows to classify each uh, energy sources in function of energy density and power density. So here you have you are the you have the the fuel cell. Uh, fuel cell have a good energy density and a bad power density. And at the opposite corner you have the supercapacitor with a good power density but a bad uh, energy density. And what we do uh, we want it's to uh, have uh, good hybrid sources. Uh, it's a mix between fuel cell and supercapacitor to have the best of each sources. So the, architect the new architecture, it's an active hybrid architecture, active because we have two DC-DC converter, one for the fuel cell and one for the supercapacitor. Battery are in direct drive uh, of the motors, uh, in case of failure, we have uh, 30 minutes of autonomy. And to control uh, the active hybrid uh, architecture, we need uh, an energy management strategy algorithm. And I will talk about it. So for the energy management strategy, I choose to begin with the uh, frequency strategy. It's really simple. Uh, we have three inputs. The high load is the current from the motors. We have the state of charge of the supercapacitor and the state of charge of the battery. In input, uh, we have the current um, that we send to the DC-DC converter for the supercapacitor and the fuel cell. Between, we have the, the simple low-pass filter uh, the low-pass filter sends the low-frequency command to the fuel cell, and the high-frequency are sent to the supercapacitor. We have also two small 
loop of regulation uh, in order to maintain the state of charge of the supercapacitor at 50 uh, percent and the same for the battery this time it it's for 90 percent in case of failure to um, sorry to to test my uh, frequency strategy, I need to have a reference cycle. So, my reference cycle, uh, I took uh, one flight uh, with the stock drone during the ILCOT project. This time, uh, we have a flight time of 24 minutes, and uh, the drone uh, follow three levels of altitude, one at 200 meters, 250 meters, and the last at uh, 300 meters. Here you have uh, you are uh, sorry you have the current consumption of the UAV. We can find three peaks. Uh, it's the climbing phase, and between the peaks you have the cruise speed, uh, the cruise uh, mode. Sorry. So for the uh, next. The next, sorry. Um, I will use the extract of 120 seconds, which includes the takeoff and the cruising phase. So now I will uh, compare my Simulink model to, the, uh, to my test bench. So here we find the, uh, the cycle. It's a current required by the load. Uh, now, here we have the current supplied by the fuel cell at the output of the DC-DC converter, the current supplied by the battery, and the current supplied by the supercapacitor at the output of the DC-DC converter. We can see the low, uh, low frequency response for the fuel cell and the uh, high frequency response for the supercapacitor. Uh, super Bat batteries are not used uh, in this case. Now I will add, uh, this one is the simulation, I will add the result of my uh, experimental test bench. So uh, between experimental and simulation, it's uh, matching. So I validate my model. And uh, I wanted to go even further and explore uh, the possibility of using a variable cutoff frequency these times. So it's the same uh, as before, but the difference is just uh, with the low pass filter, I, I uh, use an adaptive uh, cutoff frequency in function of the state of charge of the supercapacitor. Alors, so the goal was to use the full amplitude of the state of charge of the supercapacitors. And why? It's to protect the uh, supercapacitor from a complete overload or discharge, increase the usage of the supercapacitor when the state of charge is uh, around 50%, and decrease the current variation on the fuel cell. Now I will present you my result of the simulation. We have three different fixed frequencies which depend of my system. The useful frequency range in our case goes from 0.1 Hz to 1 Hz. 0.1 uh, is the low limit of the equation. Uh, 0.1 is in uh, red. Uh, um, is the low limit of the equation, which is not ideal because uh, with this one we have a full discharge during the takeoff and we don't want that to avoid to destroy the DC DC converter. However, we have the best dynamic response possible for the supercapacitor. With 0.2 Hz, um, we do not have the problem that is the ideal uh, fixed frequency to avoid damaging the DC-DC converter of the, US, the supercapacitor. My idea was to combine the advantages of both by using a, a variable cutoff frequency. So, 
the variable fre uh, cutoff frequency is in blue. And uh, we can see uh, after the takeoff, uh, the variable frequency returns quicker to 50% of the SOC state of charge. And we have a greater dynamics when the, stake, uh, the supercapacitor stake, uh, state of charge is close to 50%, for example, in this time. And we can see the uh, f frequency here. It's better compared to the ideal uh, cutoff frequency of 0 0.2 Hz. So I hope with uh, this, um, uh, this uh, energy management system with a frequency, uh, extend the life of the sources uh, for the fuel cell and the batteries, and to protect the supercapacitor from overload and full discharge. So my perspective uh, with this work, uh, first, I would like to miniaturize DC-DC converter uh, in order to integrate in the stock drone. And uh, I would like to test new energy management system uh, as the uh, energy consumption minimization strategy or others uh, like uh, predictive command or uh, robust command. And why not uh, work on hybridization for micro drone? I think uh, with uh, Futuna, Wally, and uh, SpaceX is uh, our drone uh, during the competition, uh, the outdoor competition. So why not? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, also very interesting and, and, and great timing as well. Does anybody have any questions? Our energy level's a bit low. You'll all be discharged I soon. I am the last. Come on. It's no more. <laughs> have we reached capacity? I've got lots of these. Right, okay. Thank you. Stop me making puns. Thank you for your interesting presentation and the interesting work that you've done. Uh, I missed one thing, uh, and that is the you, in the DC DC converter between the uh, supercapacitor and say the uh, the, the voltage the output motors. voltage. Yes. Uh, is that DC DC converter bidirectional? No, uh, bidirectional. For the supercapacitor, it's bidirectional. We need to uh, discharge or charge the supercapacitor. Yes. yes. So it is, yes. Thank you. And um, that concludes this session. Um, big thanks here and uh, again for all the speakers. Thank you. My thanks again to the conference organizers and the sponsors and the participants of the competition. It's been a great week. I'll hand over to the awards. Thank you. Okay. I think this is, do you have also my slides? Uh, Basically the same with a smaller logo, <laughs> that's very important. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, yeah, so we're at the closing and award ceremony. So uh, it went uh, really uh, quickly uh, this week, at least for me. Um, so uh, yeah, first a uh, little bit of uh, participant statistics. Uh, this is what you've all come here for, right? So uh, we had 152 conference and competition participants, so that's quite a big number. You may imagine that last year, December, uh, when we said yes to organizing this, we were a bit uncertain, you know, with uh, COVID, a uh, post-COVID year, but we're very happy to see so many people from so many countries, like 13 countries, and we even had 129 
uh, day visitors. It's a huge number and uh, was mostly during uh, the greenhouse competition uh, where we really had uh, many companies as well exhibiting, but also uh, companies from the greenhouse sector that are very interested in drones and innovation coming by. So we were really happy with that day to see uh, really this uh, cross-pollination. And 21 teams that uh, finally uh, made it here, so I think that's very nice. So, now the award ceremony. Uh, we start with the greenhouse challenge, which we actually already did on Wednesday. <laughs> but, uh, so we want to show you a little video that we made of the event for those that uh, were not able to attend it. Ooh, uh, Sven, I need to switch on my sound here, I think. But if I do escape, then they see the results. So could you yeah, take another screen for a second? Yeah, perfect. So let me switch on my sound. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm back. We could have it back then. Do you still have it? Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. That's uh, strange, but okay. So I replug it. Do you have it again? Yeah, okay. So then we go to the video. Okay, so thanks uh, very much. So uh, yeah, we had already this uh, ceremony uh, with Corvus Drones first, Self second, and then Siba third, and the Pulp team that got a special achievement award for flying a fully autonomous nanocopter in a greenhouse while their deep net was trained for a completely different environment. So that was the shortest title for the <laughs> awards. Um, we do have, you, you got already uh, these uh, physical uh, awards that you see there, but we also printed out uh, some uh, paper awards. So, um, yeah, we, I think the ones for the greenhouse we can give you later for the teams that are there. Um, so then you get also a little paper to remember it. Okay, and now to the new results. Uh, so that's a little bit more exciting, perhaps. Uh, the Nano Nanocopter AI Challenge, sponsored by Bitcraze. Uh, also here we first have a video though, so for those that uh, didn't see so much, 
Here we go. Also a very nice video made by our PhD students. Uh, I think they did a great job. Okay, so shall we start with one or three? Three, right? So uh, here we go. Number three is a keeper Skyrats, Va Brazil! A keep Skyrats, can you come forward? You can bring the entire team. <laughs> come on, the entire team. <laughs> So the nanocopter challenge has the silver or metallic uh, color reward. Where's the team captain? You can bring the rest of the team. Come on, it's a photo moment for you. First <laughs> comment, what are your thoughts? Um, it was an incredible experience to come here anyway. Uh, just having the pleasure of being here is, uh, is amazing and walking away with uh, uh, being on the podium is uh, incredible. So thank you. Great, you brought the entire team. <laughs> and did you expect it? Did you hope for it? Well, we can certainly ho hope for it, but uh, I don't think we ever expected to get this far. So, yeah. Where do I leave this? Okay, and then if we can go back to the white slide again. Okay, so we have number three, Sky Rats. Number two, Black B Drones! <laughs> Black Bees, come forward, please. <laughs> Team Black Bees from Brazil. Second place Congrats. in the nanocopter competition. Congrats. So, <laughs> first reaction? Oh, guys, it's incredible to be here. You know, uh, we have a lot of difficult for us to come and participate. We lost our baggage. We're trying to recover these. And uh, is, I have no words for this. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure to be here with all you guys. Thank you. We, we want to thank you for uh, willing, 
We want to thank you for uh, part willingness to participate in all three challenges. That's worth another applause. And thanks to that, at least one made it. So go for it. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Congrats. Okay. So um, I don't know if it's going to be a huge surprise. There was one team that I saw flying for a very, very long time without uh, collisions. And it is... The Pulp Team! <laughs> Italy! Please come forward. I have a double certificate because you also uh, already had the... The, oh. the, <laughs> the special award, the, the special achievement. The special <laughs> achievement which was already handed out. Uh, in the, and the first prize of the IMF 2022 Nanocopter Challenge! <laughs> so, first reaction? <laughs> no, um, um, <laughs> no, it was really challenging. Like, I was not expecting to be so hard, but I think that the best part of the challenge was to see so many people participating in that, so uh, that drives uh, a lot of um, uh, our interest, you know. I hope this challenge will uh, uh, um, drive more people to get into these nano drones and these kind of challenges. So thank you for all the participants. You were all very, very uh, good. I know how much is hard to uh, uh, code on this kind of platform. So kudos to all of you. <laughs> And you, you, need, you, need to stay, you need to stay one second, because uh, actually if we can go to the slides again, uh, Sven, there's still one thing here. It's a bit of a special case, because Flapper Drones actually has a surprise prize for the Nanocopter Challenge. <laughs> Guess what it is? <laughs> So, yeah, uh, I said, uh, like, 10 years ago, I got a prize uh, at IMF, which was a drone. And I thought, well, now that we're producing drones, it would be nice that we also uh, sponsor the conference with a prize. So here it goes. Uh, it's actually a flapper drone. And, uh, yeah, like, uh, you guys uh, already mastered uh, quadcopters really well, uh, like, with vision and everything. So maybe this challenge was too easy for you, so this is the next challenge. Can you put vision and make this autonomous? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we can also send it afterwards. If, uh... You can fly it back. <laughs> yeah, so if there's a problem with that, we can... Yep. Okay, congratulations, guys. Oh, yeah, there's a special achievement award here. There was one team that flew through four gates. It was amazing. Where is the... A Spanish team, the UPM, uh, CVAR UPM team, that passed through four gates. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. It's a very, very nice uh, achievement. Congrats. <laughs> oh, yeah, and a comment, of course. Any comments? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, we try to really hard, and, and so this is, we are really thankful for this also award. <laughs> You deserved it. One more applause, please. Okay. That was the nanocopter challenge. But we still had uh, a third competition this year. Isn't that fun <laughs> to organize? Yes. And uh, it's the package delivery challenge. And also there we have a small uh, video. Although I, I heard that some parts are not suitable for a young audience, so... Uh So awesome on this few 
too, I think. I really thank my PhD students for putting that uh, part in. <laughs> okay. So also here, let's start with the third place in the package delivery challenge, and it is the team Mavericks. Please come forward. Please come forward. Congratulations. Congratulations, uh, team Maverick. Mavericks. We should have yeah. made one award with like a hybrid, but okay, you get a quadcopter <laughs> as well. And next time we'll think about uh, putting a hybrid on top. First reactions? <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. <laughs> we are kind of surprised. <laughs> it was a hard week for us, but uh, and eventually it worked. So we were very happy, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Congrats, guys. Well now, done. on to the next one. Who was second, is the question. Yeah, so let's look at that. It is Team Cigogne. Yeah. Team Cigogne. Yeah. Hello. Anybody up for a comment? Oh, we are tired. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for the organization of the conference. Uh, like every, every, every year, it's very, very good. And we are very tired. I think we have works, the students have works every night. And we are very surprised to be at the second place because we have prepared lots of things. And lots of things doesn't work, but <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> Thanks again. Congratulations. You earned it. We know you had a. I know you had a hard time with the, the package uh, dropping mechanisms, and they started burning. You had two servos, and then one servo burned to the other, and then <laughs> you had nothing left. But nevertheless, you uh, still reassigned some tasks to others and managed to deliver uh, nice packages. Well done! Congratulations. So. Uh, Yes. Who, so who was first? Uh, and is it the team? I, th I think it's a team that never won anything uh, during IMF. I think. Uh, yeah. So, Enoch. <laughs> École <laughs> Nationale. Team Enoch. Please team come Enoch. forward. Team. They won many times, uh, but they they make beautiful solutions, and it works very well. The first place in the package delivery competition. Who wants this one? So I have been participating to IMAF since uh, many years already. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come, of course. It's also a pleasure to win, by the way. <laughs> and uh, but this is a teamwork, and uh, so thank you to all my team, especially to all the PhD students because that's their first IMAF. And uh, back to the team in uh, in Toulouse also. 
And, uh, and again, uh, thank you for uh, the organization uh, and uh, Guido and all the MEV lab of TU Delft for this yeah. clear and neat <laughs> organization. Even after 14 years, it's still exciting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, very, very well done. Uh, the, the team had uh, so many drones flying at the same time that it made it very hard for the jury to follow. Five, and uh, they're going this way, that way. Only one ground station, and uh, the weight was uh, sometimes only 390 grams for your vehicle. So this is uh, what we that yeah what we like to stimulate. And thanks for uh, yeah, motivating us to do it even smaller and faster next time. Congrats. And then, so, um, so Kido, that was it, right? We, we do have also outdoors. So normally during IMAF, uh, we have a number of special achievement awards and they're really unplanned. So we really look at what we think is really cool. And sometimes it can be multiple for one uh, competition or for other things. But this time we also some, saw something really cool outdoors, right, uh, Christoph? Yes, there are some prizes left. So what shall we do with this? A special achievement award for Akamov for making an extremely high resolution map of the search area during the run. And uh, we even have it here on the laptop. Akamov. <laughs> so this is this is the entire area. Look oh, at no. you. Oh, we need we need still one second. The yeah. This is the entire area, <laughs> and this is a little zoom on this huge map. And now you, you can put the, the blue one if you want, but it's very cool. <laughs> do you see the guys that were waiting? Uh, I don't know, do you see the guys that were waiting there? And uh, never? <laughs> okay, very nice. Uh, I have nothing to say uh, other than I think it's really nice that students are participating here. I think it was uh, the most crucial part during Corona for them because they couldn't enter their workshop and. Uh, to stick together in this time and through the, all the years, I think that's very nice that we have so many people here today, and uh, I think that's special, and I'm just a small part here. <laughs> Thank you for the organization. So. Thank you for thank you for participating. You brought some very nice drones, and you had uh, uh, the only drone that flew perfectly. The entire uh, competition was the only pet drone that could not deliver a package, so that's why they made this beautiful map, but uh, scored a little less on the delivery part. Because, <laughs> but we want to stimulate you to con keep going, and uh, thank you for coming anyway. Okay, and those are the competitions, but there, there are still two prizes on the table, uh, Christoph. Uh, this could be a children's show, right? <laughs> 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 no, it's a best paper award <laughs> that we're now going to talk about. And it's very exciting because uh, we had, yeah, around, uh, we have 25 accepted papers, I think, or 28. And uh, there were many, many very good papers. Five of them were nominated for the best paper award. And it's these five. So uh, this is already, I think, very nice to be nominated. Seeing with sound, surface detection, and avoidance. This in a random order, by the way. So this is not the uh, outcome. Uh, so seeing with sound by Simon Wils Wilson et al. Deep learning-based flight speed estimation using thermal anemometers by Zhe Wang et al. We saw the presentation today. Evaluation of drag coefficient for a quad rotor model by Gauthier Attenberger et al. Eye in the eye control for the oblique wing quad plane drone, Dennis van Wijngaarden and Bart Remes. Also that we saw today. And using trajectory oscillation timing improves in-flight odometry based solely on optic flows by Lucia Bergantin et al. And uh, so these were the nominated ones. But uh, obviously uh, there can be uh, only one, of course, that is uh, the ultimate best paper. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, we had an extremely hard time with the committee to uh, decide, and in the end, it went to using trajectory oscillation timing <laughs> improves in-flight odometry based solely on optic flows by Lucia Bergantin. There, Lucia, the best paper award and and the corresponding certificate. <laughs> 
So um, for those that missed the presentation, uh, some insects like butterflies, when they fly and they, uh, they oscillate, oh, first the uh, picture. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, before asking your reaction, yeah, so uh, yeah, you uh, you did a great uh, job. The committee thought, and um, yeah, so it's about insects that uh, by oscillating while they are flying, they can better estimate uh, the height at which they fly and the distance that they cover. And uh, we thought that uh, what was beautiful about it is that it's an idea that can work nicely on robots with little processing, but also explain uh, novel aspects of uh, insect behavior. So. Yeah, congratulations again, and yeah, what is your reaction? <laughs> oh, well, wow, it's it's amazing, actually. So thank you all very much, and uh, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, my IMAV is my first, uh, IMAV, my first also, my first conference, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I want to say, well, thank you for uh, recognizing this aspect of bioinspiration because, uh, well, for for us as a, as a team in Exmarsa, it's very important. So, uh, hope it's the future. I think so. <laughs> it's we part also, of it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Thank you very much. Congratulations, also to your co-authors. So the last prize, is it uh, for the most funny commentator, Hido? <laughs> I wouldn't dare give myself on. Uh... <laughs> oh, it was you. <laughs> okay, sorry, that was not funny. Um, okay, so we do have one prize left, and that is a special achievement. It's the INDI control for the oblique wing quad plane drone by Dennis and Bart for a really novel hybrid design accompanied by a solution for the difficult control. So this is your award. I just uh, want to credit, give credits to this. So that was really a very special one because it's exactly reflecting what uh, IMAF is about, to do something almost crazy, but make it that it works. So the oblique wing is something very uh, unique and also the way it was tested. So this is something great, great achievement. Uh, what you did, that's why you deserve this award very much. Thank you for okay. doing this job. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to do... You get pictures, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to uh, also thank other members of, of mainly also the NATO drone team that helped me repairing the drone when, uh, when it got broken in the wind tunnel. Uh, yeah. Oh, costed now we take it away again. Yeah, he crashed it. <laughs> no, it, it costed a lot of time to actually tune it, and then in the end it worked out. But uh, yeah, I w would also like to thank the others that helped in the construction, thinking out about how the drone should look like, and so on. So uh, yeah, and thank you for the special prize. Congrats. Who wants an IMAF in 2023? No one? <laughs> okay, that's exactly the reaction we were hoping for. Go, go, go! Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was actually a little bit tough because, uh, because of COVID, we had a bit of a mess up of our normal procedures. So, yeah, we knew very late last year that we were going to organize this one. And we did find somebody crazy enough to organize it uh, next year. In a positive sense. In a very, yeah, in a very positive sense, obviously. Uh, and uh, he is here with us today. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm now going to give the word to uh, somebody. Of course, it's going to give away a bit where it will be, but... Uh. Can we first see the next slide, please? Ah, you do it. <laughs> yeah, that is something, uh, I think it comes from the whole group that uh, Theo Delft Math Lab did a wonderful job in organizing it. So some people are still here from the organizer, not all of them. I hope there are not too many missing still in the field from yesterday's outdoor event. But that was a huge effort. So learning about doing it, saying yes, we do it in, what was it, December? In, in December, and then make it really happen in a way. Three challenges, 
inviting all people and getting all that done. So thank you very much from someone who did not do work on this. So great, great job you and your team have done. Thank you very much for that. And since IMF is, is so important uh, for the community, that's uh, why Aachen University, so my university, volunteered to uh, host IMF next year. And so the group date, it's still not absolutely fixed, but it will be about the same week. We have it uh, today right now, so it's still to be confirmed, little in there, so we will hopefully found, find out within the next weeks. So it's Aachen, Germany, and we are already looking forward to welcome you there and for your contributions in the various fields. We've seen the awards, so we want to see more of you next year. Looking forward to see you there. Thank you very much. Yay! Yeah. Yeah, Woohoo! Thank, thank you so much. So uh, before we uh, uh, really close, I would like to thank a number of uh, persons. Uh, to start with, all teams and participants. I think uh, it was really nice to see you all physically again, to see uh, people from all over the world, to see many undergrad st uh, students that did a fantastic job at traveling here from far having all kinds of obstacles they need to overcome, but uh, never losing hope and always uh, keeping going. So an applause for all the participants and teams. Uh. There, is, there is one team we want to mention especially. There's a team that has been participating multiple years and they had uh, some uh, you know, setbacks this year, uh, which is a bit post-COVID because Schiphol is uh, losing uh, luggage sometimes, and they lost exactly their luggage with the drones, and they have been building a drone uh, in our lab, and they almost made it to make it fly, so we really want to mention them, and we want to help them a little bit because uh, we got some pictures, uh, and uh, yeah, here are some uh, suitcases, so if you see your suitcase here, <laughs> But it could be, yeah, if you see it there, then, then let us know. But it could, could be here as is well. It, is it the blue one? <laughs> or here? Did you have a baby with you? Or, or it's just one of these? Like, uh, <laughs> and so uh, we, we hope you get your luggage back. Yeah, but you did a, did a great job. Uh, we're really happy uh, yeah, that you were here. And it's great to see that you always uh, stayed strong. So thank you very much. Oh yeah, I, f I forgot about this, but they sent some pictures of their drones that they actually wanted to fly. So you see them here, they ha actually had many drones, uh, some of them have 3D printed. Uh, and here's also a flight video, I guess, uh, back home, of one of their drones. So yeah, it's uh, really a pity, but I would say uh, next year I'm sure that you, uh, you will put uh, drones in different suitcases. <laughs> <laughs> put them in the hand luggage. <laughs> Okay, I want to thank all the sponsors because uh, honestly we had a lot of support from sponsors from the US Army to uh, ONRG to Robocrops, uh, Gemeente Westland, Betcrace, TU Delft Institutes, Flapper Drones, Dronisos, Unmanned Valley and uh, they all made this event possible. They also made it possible that we could keep the costs as low as possible for the participants uh, which is one of the things that we strive to keep doing also for the next years. So f thanks for the sponsors, I think it's in order. <laughs> and then, then I would like to call up front uh, all the people that have been helping out. I know that not all of you are there, but uh, if you're wearing a blue t-shirt or you're from the Muff Lab, please come uh, to the front. And so I know Salah was not wearing a blue t-shirt, but you also... Oh no, you come later, you come later, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all the PhD students, all the postdocs, and you've been serving, you've been sitting in the field, sometimes we forgot about you when you were there. Uh, so yeah, so uh, please uh, come up front and uh, yeah, they've been doing so much. Uh, it's such a huge amount of work. Sven here has been doing the streaming. <laughs> it's it's yeah. been so horrible, but he did a marvelous job. And uh, so, yeah, please give them an, uh, a huge applause. Uh.
Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Sven, why is the slide not up yet? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry. That's how I normally am with them. Terrible, you know, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Ah, it's there. Okay. Hey, and, uh, and then the co-organizers. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, you know, we had uh, a, a big team this year to actually organize so many things. So Salwa and Ewout, can you please come up front? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks to Salwa, we had buses and uh, nice dinners and, uh, and uh, yeah, outdoor competitions. And uh, so, yeah, I think... Uh, it was really great uh, to work this time as a team. It, uh, yeah, it was really fantastic. So thanks a lot for uh, yeah, organizing. And, and Christophe, of course. <laughs> and Bart, uh, Bart unfortunately had to leave early. But the, uh, and of course, of course as well, Bart Remes, who has been doing also a lot of the things. Uh, and even, uh, yeah, so, so that was really great. Sorry, yeah. I, uh. Okay, uh, and then. That's it. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is the last slide. Beautiful, huh? <laughs> it's not an animation. Eh? It's really, uh, it's really flying to the flower. No, that's really it. So uh, thanks for coming this year. We really hope to see you next year. We will be attending slash participating, which is also fun, right, Christoph? Yeah, we still don't know which one is uh, more difficult, but. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yeah, what I propose now is, yeah, let's, uh, so for those of you that have uh, trips, so have a good trip, and we see each other next year. Thank you.